Before we can understand how to design large-scale distributed systems, we have to first understand how a computer is designed, at least at the high level. We'll be going over the main components of a computer, at least from a software perspective, and how they work together to execute the code that we write. Let's first start with our disk. At least that's one way to refer to it. You could also refer to it as the storage, or maybe the hard drive, or HDD, which stands for hard disk drive. Nowadays, it's more common that you would be using an SSD rather than an HDD just because they're generally faster. But the idea behind this component is that this is going to store all of our data and it's going to do so persistently. What that means is that even if our computer restarts or if our computer crashes while we're executing some code or while it's running some program, the stuff that we store inside of our disk is going to be persisted. That means, for example, if we store some file in our disk, but then our computer crashes, it's okay because the file was saved to the disk. Now, how much information can it store? Well, it's usually measured in terms of hundreds of gigabytes or more commonly in terms of terabytes. And just to quickly review, remember a byte is nothing more than eight bits and each bit can either store a zero or a one. And we can use these bits and these bytes to represent information. So this could, you know, for example, be the character A or the character B. And as we kind of combine all these bytes and bits together, we can end up with some very sophisticated software and programs that run like games and videos and things like that. So when we say that a disk might have, for example, one terabyte of storage, well, that T is actually 10 to the power of 12. So this could have a trillion bytes in side of it. So 10 to the power of 12, I think is a trillion. So that's quite a lot. One gigabyte is 10 to the power of nine. So that is actually also a lot of storage. This might be a USB drive, for example, that you're using for storage. Usually disks have a lot more than just a single gigabyte. Now we also have our memory, AKA our RAM, which stands for random access memory. And this is also used for storing information, though it's typically typically a lot smaller than our disk. So for example, our RAM might contain something like two gigabytes or maybe four or eight or 16 or even 32 gigabytes and it can go higher than that but typically it's a lot less than our disk storage and that's because RAM is typically more expensive in terms of money in terms of how much we have to pay for this resource but the benefit is that it's a lot cheaper in another way in terms of resources if we're going to be writing data to our RAM so for example if we wanted to write a megabyte of data to our RAM the amount of time it would take would be measured in terms of microseconds. So this is a Greek letter, which basically stands for micro. And micro basically means 10 to the power of negative six, which is one divided by 10 to the power of six. So a microsecond is a fraction of a second. It's one one millionth of a second or a second divided by a million. So in general, reading and writing from RAM is measured in terms of microseconds. We're not going to get super precise precise because you don't have to memorize exactly how quick it is. But what I'm trying to get across is that reading and writing from RAM is a lot faster than reading and writing from disk. So while we can't store as much information in RAM as we can in disk, because at least that's generally the case, the benefit is that RAM is quite a lot faster than disk. Reading and writing from disk is typically measured in terms of milliseconds. A millisecond is 10 to the power of negative three, AKA one divided by 10 to the power of three. So a millisecond is actually a lot bigger than a microsecond. So when we say RAM is a lot faster than disk, we're not talking 10% faster or 50% faster. We're talking at least 10 times faster or sometimes a hundred times faster or even a thousand times faster. It's an order of magnitude faster. Now, maybe if you're using a really, really good SSD, maybe that's not going to be the case, but this is generally what's true. You don't have to remember the exact decimal. As software engineers, this is just something that we generally believe to be true. RAM is a lot faster than disk, and it's usually the case. Now, how exactly do we write data to our disk or to our RAM, and how exactly do we read or retrieve data from our RAM or from our disk? What if we even want to communicate 
communicate between the RAM and the disk. These components can't directly talk with each other. That's why we have to introduce another component, which is our CPU. CPU stands for Central Processing Unit. It's essentially the brain of our computer. And what it's capable of doing can be quite complicated. So we're gonna simplify it. The main things that the CPU is capable of is writing information to RAM or writing information to disk. And when we talked about the time that it takes to write from RAM and to write to disk, this is what we meant, how much time it takes the CPU to perform these operations. The CPU can also read from RAM and can also read from the disk. Now, what exactly is the CPU gonna do with that data once it reads and writes it? Well, the CPU is going to execute code. So we can assume that the code that we wrote is written somewhere in memory. Now, of course, the code that we write with English characters is going to be compiled down into instructions that the CPU can actually interpret. We're not gonna go into the details. We know it can get quite complicated, especially when you're talking about zeros and ones, but we know that that's essentially how everything is represented in terms of zeros and ones, but it can have different abstractions around it. Like the code that we write is gonna be written in English text typically, but it's gonna get compiled down into instructions that the CPU can interpret. It's all represented in terms of zeros and ones, but it represents different information. So the CPU is going to be reading our code so that it can execute that code, but it's also gonna be reading and writing from RAM for a different reason. There's going to be some data stored in the RAM that's not our code itself. So we could have other data stored you know, somewhere in RAM. This isn't the most accurate depiction, but the main idea I'm getting across is you could have some code, have some you know, pseudocode over here that is declaring some variable and then maybe looping through that. Like maybe we declare an array and then we loop through that array. So those instructions are code and that's that's what is going to be stored over here. But the variables that we declare, so in that code, we declared some variable, right? Some array. So that's gonna be stored in the data portion of our RAM. So the CPU is not only reading the code that we may have written, but it's also could be writing to some data and manipulating that in some way. And the CPU does this actually just by reading, writing, and performing computations within the CPU. So all computations are done in the CPU. That's actually all a CPU really knows how to do, perform computation. I'm talking about arithmetic here, add, subtract, and those type of operations, because remember, everything is just zeros and ones, but we can use this to represent very complicated things. In our code, we might be programming some type of video game, and this can all be done through a CPU. Now, while the read and writes from RAM are pretty quick in terms of microseconds, what if we want to go even faster? Well, actually, CPU have another component called the cache. It's typically a lot smaller than disk and a lot smaller than RAM as well. It's typically measured in terms of megabytes. This is actually a component that's not separate from our CPU. It actually belongs to the CPU itself. And it's used to speed up read and write operations from RAM. And this is possible because reading and writing from the cache is actually on the scale of nanoseconds, which is 10 to the power of of negative nine, which is basically one billionth of a second. So it's a very small fraction of a time, even smaller than a microsecond. But of course, the downside is that it stores a lot less data in terms of megabytes, whereas RAM is typically in terms of gigabytes and disk is typically in terms of terabytes. And the cache is mainly used as a substitution for the RAM. So what the CPU will do is it'll take a subset of the RAM, some portion or maybe multiple multiple portions that can fit within our cache and we want to choose these portions intelligently, at least the computer does. So the CPU will typically choose portions of the RAM that we're writing to or reading from very frequently. Because we have a limited amount of space in our cache, if we find that we're reading this portion of RAM a lot, we can go ahead and throw it in our cache because we know we're gonna have to be doing this operation frequently. So why not have it in our cache so that we can perform 
you know, 10 or 100 times or maybe even a thousand times faster. This will speed up things a lot. So technically, it's not necessary that we need a cache, but practically, it can make things go a lot faster, even though caches are expensive in terms of money. So we can't have huge caches. Even a small cache like this will improve the performance of our entire system by a lot. So if the CPU wants to read some data from RAM, it can first check if that data is in our cache. If that data is not there, then we will perform the more expensive operation, which is actually reading from RAM. But maybe if we read some data, we'll go ahead and throw it into our cache so that next time we have to read it, we can directly go to the cache and it will be faster. So if we read from our cache and we do find the data there, then we don't have to perform that operation where we have to read from our RAM and that will go a lot faster. Now the downside of RAM and cache is that it's not persistent data. That means if we throw information in our cache or in our RAM and maybe our computer crashes or we restart it, we are not guaranteed that the same information that we stored there is going to be persisted. So if you're writing an essay and that essay is stored into RAM and your computer crashes, then you're going to lose all of your progress. You want to make sure that your essay is written to disk so that if the computer crashes, it's still there somewhere. And then we can go ahead and read it. And then you can basically start where you left off in writing that essay. So this is a general computer architecture, at least at the high level. Of course, CPUs are a lot more complicated. They have registers. And of course, there are GPUs as well. But as software engineers, this is generally what we have to worry about. And believe it or not, there's actually a lot of parallels from just what we talked about here when it comes to designing a distributed system as well. There are a lot of parallels between the two. And we can actually take an individual computer like this and use it to solve very big problems when we combine multiple computers together. So when it comes to designing distributed systems, a computer like this is the building block that we have. In fact, we need to combine multiple machines in order to solve those big problems because an individual computer actually actually has a lot of limitations. Now, if you need more storage, well, why not just get a bigger disk or get multiple disks? Okay, fine. If you have really, really large programs, you could also get more RAM or a bigger cache and you can do these things, but they all do have some type of hardware limitation behind them. And the biggest hardware limitation comes from our CPU. How fast we execute our code is limited by our CPU. At least that's one of the limitations. Limitations. You've almost certainly heard of Moore's Law. It's named after Gordon Moore, who is one of the co-founders of Intel, so he definitely knew what he was talking about. And it's not really a law, it was mainly an observation by him, which was that over time, the number of transistors inside of a CPU doubles every two years. And the cost is cut in half every two years, but we're mainly going to be focusing on the number of transistors, which basically in this case is going to be a proxy for the speed of that that CPU. So we can essentially assume that the speed of our CPU is going to double every two years. So we can assume that the speed of our CPUs is going to increase exponentially. And typically this is scaled exponentially. So you'll see this drawn more oftenly as this, where the slope of our line is linear because the scale of our chart is exponential. So this doesn't actually mean the speed is growing linearly, it's growing exponentially. But in reality, we've seen that CPU speeds are actually beginning beginning to plateau. Roughly in the last 10 years, the speed has slowed down. So we can't infinitely scale a single CPU. That's the point I'm making. So we are limited. And this is just one limitation of an individual computer. We've actually had distributed systems well beyond the point that we reached, you know, the limitations behind a single CPU. But the point is that we can solve bigger problems when we combine multiple computers together because individual computers do have limitations. Moore's law is beginning to break and there are other benefits of distributed systems that we're going to talk about later in the course, including what a distributed system is in the first place. I know I haven't talked about that just yet. Next, let's take a look at the very high level application architecture for a production app. You may or may not already be familiar with a lot of these concepts, but I think this will serve as a really good template for us to expand upon for the rest of this course.
Throughout the course, we'll be digging in deeper into a lot of the concepts I'm about to introduce right now, but I think it's really useful to take a step back and focus on what exactly we're trying to achieve here in the first place. So we're going to start this from the perspective of a developer. So this will be pretty relatable for us. We know that as developers, we write code, which has to get deployed somewhere. And we know that eventually our code has to reach some server where our code is actually going to run on. Now, you may already be familiar with what a server is, but for now, let's assume that it is just a computer that can handle requests meaning that it can serve users. We'll expand upon that in a bit and go even further later on in the course. And usually there's kind of an intermediate step before our code can reach a server. The code has to be built and deployed. You know, that could happen on the dev's local machine. More commonly, it can happen on some type of CI CD server, continuous integration, continuous deployment. This is a lot more common in the professional world for production grade applications, but it's sort of an optional step here. Now our server is also gonna need to store some data. So we could have some type of external storage mechanism, which really could be anything. It's really open-ended. Your first thought might be that this is a database. And yes, that's one valid possibility, but there's also many other ways we can store information and data. So this is our persistent storage. Now, of course, our server, if it's a computer, it may also have some type of storage mechanism. It could have its own disk, but we know that that has its own limitations. So this is a distributed storage mechanism. So this could actually be running on its own computer. So we assume that this storage is not running on the same server. It's connected over a network. These could even be located in different parts of the world. Now let's take this from an external user's perspective. If they want to use our application code running on our server, they have to communicate with that server. So they can maybe send a request, most likely from their browser. So if we're serving some front end code from here, our server would respond with the JavaScript HTML code that the user needs on their browser to load our page. Our server could also be some kind of back end server where from the browser, the user is making a request to our API and then our API responds with you know some type of data maybe in the form of JSON which is a popular data format that you may or not be familiar with but what if we have a lot of users and they're all making requests to our server at the same time and our single computer here can't handle all of the requests on its own well we could first determine the bottleneck with our server maybe maybe our CPU is what's slowing us down here maybe it's just not fast enough and then we can get a better CPU for our server and then our server will be able to handle more requests. Maybe it's a limitation with our RAM. Maybe by getting more RAM, our server will be able to do more with it. It could be some hardware limitation with the single server. So from what we learned about computer architecture, we could just take a single server and make it better. We could upgrade its CPU, its RAM, its disk. We could upgrade the computer itself. This is an example of vertical scaling to take a single resource like a server like our computer over here and then making it better you can think of it as like adding a block to that server we're making that single server better and this is pretty simple conceptually for us to make our system better to handle more traffic we vertically scale it by getting a better server here but as we learned earlier computers have limitations no matter how fast our CPU is it has a limitation it won't be be able to handle infinite requests. So to make our system even better, we can use a different technique, which is called horizontal scaling. Horizontal scaling is to actually take our server and make more copies of it. So we won't just have one server that's running our code. We'll actually have multiple servers running our code. The benefit of this is that if we have more users, all of the users don't have to talk to a single server. They can actually talk to one of the other servers this way we'll be able to handle more requests at the same time. You can sort of see why this is called horizontal auto scaling because we're not actually making any of these individual servers better. We're just introducing more of them to handle the same task. Now, the problem we introduce when we have multiple servers handling requests is that when a user makes a request, how do we know which server that request should go to? Well, that's where the load balancer comes in and we won't go super in depth right now, but let's assume that the load 
balancer will be able to handle that for us. It'll basically forward the request to the server that has the minimal amount of traffic so that each of the servers has a balanced amount of traffic. We don't want one of the servers to be handling all of the requests and then maybe another server isn't really doing anything. That wouldn't be very helpful. In that case, what would even be the point of horizontally scaling? So this is obviously a simplified diagram, but let's assume we have multiple servers and the load balancer is balancing the requests among those servers. Now, our servers don't have to run in isolation. Our servers might actually be communicating with other servers as well. For example, my code for neatcode.io is communicating with other APIs, for example, the Stripe API to handle payments. And of course, we could have many such external servers that we're communicating with, and I have it shown simplified here. Now, from a user perspective, this is pretty much all that's going on for our application, but we know that as developers, we have a few more responsibilities to handle. The same way when we run code locally, we sometimes have logging or print statements so that we know what's going on within our code, whether our code is working properly or that there are some issues going on. For us to get some insight into how our server is running, because it's not running on our local machine, we also use log statements, but we might not be able to store all of those on our server. In fact, we don't need to store them all on our server because our server isn't really going to be interacting with them. We as developers are going to be interacting with the log. So we will have possibly some external service and that external service is going to store our logs for us. So every time a user makes a request, whether it goes good or goes bad, our server is going to log that information into that external service, which is going to handle all the logging for us. Now, the user will never have to directly interact with this, but us as developers, if we want to know uh, how did the user's request go, is our server having problems, what were those problems, we as developers will interact with that logging service. Now, logs don't tell us the entire story. What if one of our servers isn't running very well? Maybe it has a faulty CPU or something like that. And we want to know about the resources that our server is using. Is the CPU being taken up? Is the RAM being taken up? Maybe the storage is already full. Maybe some type of issue is happening with our server. To get that insight, we would have a metrics service. And this would provide us all of the metrics that we care about of how our server is running. Is is it responding to all requests? Are some requests failing? Are the resources of our server being taken up? Basically any type of application metrics or resource metrics that we would need about how our application is running. Now, some of the metrics might directly come from logs. These would be log-based metrics. We could, for example, log something every time that a user gets a successful request, and we could log every time a user gets a failed request or failed response rather, and we could use use these logs to create metrics and metrics are usually displayed in terms of time series charts. Like we want to know how was our CPU going over time? Like was it positive trend or was it a negative trend? What was going on? And that's why log based metrics can also be used because logs are naturally time series data. Every time we log something within our server, it has some type of timestamp associated with it. Now, as developers, we can look at the metrics and get insight into how the application application is running. But if something goes wrong, you wouldn't want to have to manually go and look at the metrics to realize what's going on. Or even worse, a user would tell us, like email us that something went wrong with our application because users are constantly using the app and they would be the first to know if something went wrong. We don't want this to happen. We want as developers to know immediately when something goes wrong. So we want a push notification from the metrics. To accomplish this, we have our metrics feed data data into an alerting service, which will, for example, tell us when a metric has reached some threshold. So for example, let's say usually 100% of user requests get a successful response. But what if that threshold dips below 95%? We could set up our alerting service such that when that particular metric goes from 100% to 95% or below, our alerting service will actually 
automatically notify us. You can see this chart is obviously getting large, even though it's quite simplified. We can see how complicated an application can be. Our alerting service will notify us developers immediately as that metric dips below some threshold, and we will be notified probably at the same time as some users, but this is about as quickly as we could be notified as soon as that happens, of course, unless we can predict the future, we won't know in advance. So these are kind of the key components of an application from a developer's perspective, and things can get a lot more complicated than this. And that's what we'll be covering throughout the rest of this course. And there's a lot of things beyond this that we haven't really talked about yet, especially when it comes to networking, which is how all of these components can even communicate with each other in the first place, because they're not necessarily on the same computer. So if these components are running in different computers, there's going to be some network component between them and networks can get pretty complicated. As developers, we don't have to know all the details, but at least understanding the basics is going to be really useful when it comes to designing these large scale applications. Now let's finally understand the basics of designing a large system and the requirements that we have to satisfy to do so. Now ultimately our goal is to design effective systems to solve very, very big problems. And we're especially focused on how to do this in the context of a system design interview. And just like in the real world, in interviews, there's not always a straightforward answer. We have to weigh the trade-offs and figure out which option is the best. Sometimes there's not a perfect solution. We take the option that happens to be better. So system design is not about memorizing a bunch of facts at all. It's really about the thought process. It's about analyzing what improvements can be made and what we have to sacrifice to get those improvements. Now in system design, things can get very, very complicated. The good thing about system design interviews is you're not expected to know every single detail of every single component. And we're gonna go much more in detail throughout the course, but I think it helps to take a step back and realize what we're doing at the high level. No matter how complicated the systems we design get, ultimately we're just moving data around. When we talk about moving data, we already talked about how data moves around in an individual computer from RAM to CPU, from CPU to disk, and back and forth, of course. In larger systems, though, data can actually be moved around between machines that, that aren't running as a part of the same machine. They could be running in the same data center, or they could be running in different data centers across the entire world. So then, of course, moving data isn't so simple at all. Moving data data across a network, you know, from machines that are located on a different side of the world is not so straightforward, but it just boils down to moving data, whether it's from one machine to another or, you know, from one component of a machine to another component of that machine. You know, all these zeros and ones have to move somewhere. It turns out that moving all these zeros and ones isn't always simple. We're also pretty concerned with how we store data. Now, we already talked about how storing data in RAM is different than storing data on on disk because if a computer crashes or has to restart, the data on disk is persisted. We won't lose any of this data. But when you restart a computer, the data stored in RAM is not guaranteed. We won't be able to save this. And this is just one very simple example. Though storing data can get very, very complicated. In the context of data structures and algorithms, we know that storing data in an array is very different from storing data in a binary search tree. One of these is not necessarily better than the other. They're just different. They have different properties. Binary search trees are good for certain things, but arrays are good for other things. Each of these has its own trade-offs. Now, storing data in larger systems actually follows some of the same ideas, but usually we're storing data on databases or maybe blob stores or file systems or distributed file systems or, you know, a bunch of other ways. And each of these ways is not necessarily better than the other. They're just different. They have different trade-offs. We might want to use a database for certain things, but we might want to use a blob store for other things. But all of these different variations and how complicated they can get, it does boil down to the same thing, which is storing data. That's what we're trying to do. We're trying to move data and store data. It could be a massive, massive amount of data, which is ultimately what makes this complicated. If we were just storing a 
small amount of data, it wouldn't really matter how we store it. But we know large data has to be stored in an efficient way. And this is related again to data structures and algorithms, where we learned how algorithms on different data structures can be more efficient than other algorithms. And that can, you know, be very important when we're dealing with large, large amounts of data. And lastly, we want to transform data. It wouldn't be fun if we were just moving data and storing it. We also want to be able to manipulate it. For example, given a bunch of application logs data, maybe we want to aggregate all of that data and transform it to get, you know, how what percent of these were successful. Basically, maybe these logs are server response logs and we want to know what percentage of the requests were successful. Maybe that's what these logs are storing. And we also want to know what percent of the requests were failed. So we would take this data as an input and then transform that data to get something more useful, which we actually care about. This is just one example. I'm sure you can think of many more examples where we want to transform a set of data. I mean, these three operations basically encapsulate all of the functionality of most applications anyway, whether you're talking about Twitter or YouTube, it pretty much boils down to these three things. We want to move data around in the context of YouTube. We want to move videos around or comments around. We want to store data. We want to, of course, store videos efficiently. And we want to transform data, which could mean a lot of things. It could be encoding those videos. It could be aggregating you know, data. It could be aggregating views of each video and a lot of other types of metrics as well. Typically, it's our application code which handles this portion, the transformation. But when it comes to designing a large application, we want to be very careful with how we design it because bad design choices in our application architecture are very difficult to correct later. If you write some bad code, you can always fix that code. But if you start with the wrong database, that's not a matter of just fixing your code or refactoring some code. You have to migrate all of that data from your database to another database. And at the same time, you'll also have to rewrite portions of your application. So the idea is that we might not necessarily know how to write every single piece of code when we're designing our application. That's okay. But we should know the general architecture because we know that design choices are very hard to correct later on. What exactly is a good design? How do we know if our application is designed well? Because like I said, there's not always a correct answer. We have to think in terms of trade-offs. But even then, how do we measure these trade-offs? How do we know if something is good or if something is bad? How do we compare and contrast? Well, one very important measurement we make about a service or application is its availability. And mathematically, this could be represented as the total uptime of our server divided by the uptime plus the downtime. Or you could also rewrite the denominator to just be the total amount of time. I guess this is a slightly more formal way to represent it, but you'll never end up thinking of this equation when you think about availability, because let's rewrite this. Let's say over a day, our application was up for 23 hours out of the total 24 hours of that day. So this would actually become a percentage. That's how we usually talk about availability. So we would say the availability of our service was 96%. That means if users were trying to make a request to our service, which is, let's say, hosted on a single server, that 96% of the time that users were doing that, they got a response. Our service was functioning 96% of the time. Now, of course, when we design a system, we want the availability to be as high as possible, but it's very, very difficult to achieve 100% availability. Theoretically, it's impossible. There could be some natural disaster which destroys our servers or you know does something which maybe takes out somebody's internet. There could be some kind of EMP or war attack that would take down servers. It's impossible to get 100%, but we can get as close as possible. If our service has a 99% uptime, but 1% downtime, and we want to reduce the downtime by a factor of 10, so that means we want to cut the downtime actually to be 0.1%, that's quite a big improvement. But when you look at the uptime, the uptime would actually be improved to 99.9%. So it seems misleading, but it's actually difficult to make this type of improvement because this is really a factor of 10 improvement when you look at it from the downtime perspective. But uptime didn't increase by a factor of 10 because you know we can't really have higher than 100% availability. It doesn't really make sense. But this 
is a big jump. Don't let it be misleading. And so that's also why when we talk about availability, we measure it in terms of nines, because when we cut this downtime to 0.01%, that would mean the uptime is actually 99.99%. This is how we measure availability. Availability is measured in terms of nines. So two nines is 99%, three nines is 99.9, .9, four nines is 99.99. .99, and of course we have five nines as well. Usually it maxes out at five nines because this is very, very good availability. In terms of a year, 99% availability, we know there's 365 days in a year. So 1% downtime would mean that our service is up 99% of the time, but it would be down 3.65 days out of the year. So 3.6 days, that's not very good. If you're designing amazon.com, if the store is down 3.6 days a year, we're losing a lot of money. That's not very good, but 99.999% availability would mean that our service would actually only be down five minutes a year. So if we can get to this point, we're really not losing a lot of business. I mean, five minutes isn't very good. If we add another nine here, we're taking this five minutes and dividing it by 10. So if we add another nine here, we would actually be able to achieve 0.5 minutes, which I think is 30 seconds. So that would be even better. But you can see at this point, it's not a huge jump. I mean, five minutes down to 30 seconds. It's not huge. Like if we can get to this point, we're really, really solid. Availability is commonly used to define SLOs. SLO stands for service level objective. As developers and as designers of applications, we want to target something, aka an objective for our application to reach some availability requirement. And maybe we're designing some database, for example, and we want the availability of that database for users to be this. We want five nines of availability for our database. That would be a possible service level objective. Objective. As developers, we define that. Now, what's similar but slightly different is an SLA. You might see these two used interchangeably in industry, but SLA is technically different from SLO. You can think of an SLO as being a sub portion of the SLA. So an SLA is actually an SLO plus some extra stuff. As AWS, we would define an SLA for our database. It would be the SLO, which is we want our database to have five nines of a availability. That's the SLO. But as the SLA, we say that if we don't reach this level of availability, we will give you a partial refund. That's actually AWS's policy for AWS. If any of their services dip below their SLA, which is basically what they tell customers, this is what you can expect of our service. And this is what you're paying for. So if we don't reach this level of availability, we will give you a partial refund. That's kind of a customer agreement. Agreement. SLA stands for service level agreement. It's not just a goal. It's an agreement with a customer that this is what you can expect or these will be the consequences. Now, a few more terms that you might be familiar with, but these have a lot of overlap. Systems can have reliability, fault tolerance, and redundancy. And these all contribute to each other. A lot of people even use these interchangeably. Technically, they have differences, but it's not super important to be always technically correct in a system design interview, but having a general understanding of these terms can be very important because these define how well our system can function and how we can avoid problems. If a user makes a request to our server and our server responds, that means our server was available, but that doesn't necessarily mean our server is reliable because if we just have a single server like this, it's possible that the server could crash. So reliability is a different measurement, which is reliability is the probability that our system won't fail. Usually we don't have to represent this formally. Like we can't necessarily do a calculation that this server won't fail. Like we don't necessarily know the details of that. But generally speaking, we know if we just have a single server that's responding to users, we have a higher probability of failing than if we have two servers. So by adding a second server, we can increase the reliability of our system, but we're also increasing the availability of our system. Because for example, if we just have 
a single server here, we could possibly have a lot of people making requests to a single server. We could even have, you know, people maliciously trying to take our server down. You might've heard of this before because it actually happens a lot. It's called a DDoS attack, which is a denial of service attack or a distributed denial of service attack. That's when you have two Ds. If you just have one D, it's a denial of service. But basically people, people could intentionally or unintentionally be making so many requests that our server is not able to handle all of them, which takes our server down. Maybe a portion of users will get a uh, successful response, but most users are not able to access the server. This would be a problem. It could be that it's caused by the resources of our server. We could vertically scale this server. That would increase the availability because a higher percentage of users would be able to get a request a higher percentage of the time. So by vertically scaling our server, we can increase the availability. What about the reliability though? We still only have a single server. Maybe our server has to do like a Windows update or something. In that case, our server would go down. Maybe it just crashes. Maybe somebody unplugs the wire that it's hooked up to. The server goes down. In a case like this, we would really be happy if we had a second server, not just a single server with more resources. So this is why horizontal scaling can actually have benefits compared to vertical scaling. This is also called fault tolerance. If one portion of our system has a fault, then the system continues to operate successfully. This is fault tolerance. That means our system is tolerant to failures of portions of the system, but then the entire system continues functioning. One server goes down, but the second server still works, so it's still able to respond to users. You can see how fault tolerance is related to reliability. We would also call this redundancy. The English word redundant basically means unnecessary. We have something that's not necessary, so it's sort of a copy. In this context, it means we have a single server that's running our code but then we create a second server that's running the exact same code. This server is redundant. We don't need it to respond to users because this server is capable of doing everything. These two servers are redundant for each other. We don't need both of them, but it helps to have both of them because in the event of a fault, in the event of a failure, we have multiple copies. So we can still do what we need to do. So our system system can continue to function because we have a redundancy. By having redundancies in our system, we are able to have fault tolerance. That's the relationship. And with fault tolerance, we can provide higher reliability. It's not always 100% though, because if both of these servers are in the same data center, but maybe there's a hurricane and the data center power goes down, then both of these servers will go down. So it'd be even better to have this server, this second server, in a different data center, maybe in a different part of the world, so that if one server has you know, some kind of natural disaster, the other one will continue to function. These are some of the high level ideas that we're gonna talk more about later in the course. Another really important measurement of a system is the throughput. Throughput in general means the amount of operations or data we can handle over some period of time. So in the context of communicating with a server, for example, a client or a user, is making a request to a server and then getting some response back, we would measure the throughput of this in terms of requests per second. How many requests can our server handle per second? Obviously, this is helpful for telling us how many users, how many concurrent users could our system handle per second. Maybe a single server can only handle 100 requests per second. This is our peak traffic. A thousand users is the peak that we need to handle. How could we modify this system to do better? Well, if we can horizontally scale this, well, maybe we can vertically scale this. Maybe we can just get a really, really good server. We can add some resources to our server here, and then we'll be able to handle a thousand requests. This is definitely a lot easier. It's easier to design a system where we can just 
just say, hey, just get a better computer. But we know that the downside of this is that there are limitations. We can't, you know, infinitely vertically scale a single server. There are resources. We talked about Moore's Law. And actually, there's another downside that we talked about, which is that this server is a single point of failure. If this server goes down, then our entire system goes down because this server is a single point of failure. We don't have redundancy. We don't have fault tolerance. The reliability of this system isn't great. It's pretty simple because we just have a single server. We don't have to worry about other things, but that's the downside. We could also horizontally scale this. We know a single server can handle 100 requests per second. So if we want 1,000, we can introduce nine more servers here, and then we'll be able to handle as many users as you know our peak traffic is. The downside of this, though, is that it can get complicated because we'll have to balance the requests between servers. We talked a bit about how we can use a load balancer to achieve that. So then we have a lot more components in our system. So this increases the complexity, but we do have redundancy. And this is a more unlimited way of scaling. Horizontal scaling is less limited by physical resources, but it can definitely get more complicated, especially when you're talking about horizontally scaling a database, because then when you have data, you're distributing the data. Some of the data could be on you know, one area and some of the data could be somewhere else. Having data that's distributed gets very complicated. So this is a downside that we have to account for as developers. Speaking of databases, when we're talking about how many requests a database can handle, we usually measure it in terms of queries per second or QPS for short. And conceptually, it's very similar to servers. You could even call this requests per second. I don't think anyone would get mad at you if you did that. It's just more common for people to call it queries because that's the term used when you're talking about reading from a database. And databases have the same problems as servers that we talked about, where a single database can be a single point of failure. If we want to scale it, we can vertically scale it, but that has limitations. Horizontal scaling is better, but then we have data that is distributed and that can get very, very complicated. Keeping data in multiple databases in sync, I'm sure you can imagine, is not super easy, especially when these databases might be on different sides of the world. What happens if one database is outdated uh, compared to another database? These are problems that we'll be discussing later on. A third measurement of throughput that comes up is the amount of data per second, usually measured in bytes. It could be you know gigabytes or megabytes or terabytes, but some amount of data per second. This is just a variation of requests per second or queries per second. When we're talking about how many users we want to be able to access our application, it makes more sense to measure it in terms of requests because each request is basically mapped to a single user. But if we're talking about some kind of data pipeline where we're given a bunch of data and we want to process that data into some other format and it's not necessarily related to a single user or anything like that, designing a pipeline like this, it's much better to measure the throughput in terms of bytes per second because we don't even have a request. Maybe we just have a terabyte of data here. We want to transform that data into some other format and then write it to some, you know, sync. It could be a database. It could be a server. It could be a file system. It could be anything. We want to know how much data can we process per second. If we had a terabyte of data and we're processing a gigabyte per second, a terabyte is a thousand gigabytes. So we know it would take a thousand seconds for us to do this. But if we started with 10 terabytes, then it would take us 10 thousand seconds to do this. So that's why we measure throughput in terms of data per second. It can be useful in different contexts. But ultimately, throughput boils down to amount of operations or amount of data or amount of something over some period of time. Now, lastly, let's talk about latency, which can commonly be confused with throughput, but the difference is pretty simple. Throughput is the amount of operations or data divided by some period of time, but latency is just some period period of time. So going back to our client server model, aka some user accessing our server, the latency of that would be the amount of time it takes for that operation to complete. So maybe it takes one second for the user to receive a response 
from our server. It's basically the end-to-end -end latency for the entire operation to complete. We could also measure the latency in terms of, you know, how many seconds does it take for the request to reach the server, though that's less common because we care about the entire operation. We care about it from the user's perspective. So throughput in this context would be how many requests can our server handle per second? Maybe it's 10 requests per second. But latency is how long each individual request takes. You know, maybe one request takes uh, one second to complete, but maybe another request took two seconds to complete. Latency could be caused by the network. Maybe a user is very far away from our server. Maybe they're on the other side of the world. So maybe for that user, it takes two seconds to get a response, but maybe for a user who's closer to the server, it just takes one second for that user to get a response. Now, if you recall, we actually already talked about latency when we looked at computer architecture, because latency is just the amount of time it takes for an operation to complete. It doesn't necessarily need to include a network, you know, where a user is located somewhere else compared to the server. When we talked about how a CPU can read and write from RAM, we talked about it takes on the order, I believe, of microseconds to do something like that. But when it comes to reading from the cache, a CPU can actually read from the cache in terms of nanoseconds, which is an order of magnitude faster than reading from RAM. And the reason we have a cache is to lower the latency of individual operations, because if we can do that, then we can actually increase the overall throughput of the system. Our CPU can handle more operations per time if we can introduce something like this. And to lower the latency of a distributed system, we can actually do something similar. We could once again introduce a second server and we could have these two servers on different sides of the world let's assume that this is our earth you know it's shaped like a peanut I guess but maybe we have one server on one half of the world and we have a second server on the other half of the world not only does this increase our availability and our reliability and increases the throughput but it also reduces the latency for users located on different sides of the world without this server over here users on this side would have higher latency than users on this side but introducing a second server we reduce the latency another technique for reducing latency is having a content delivery network aka cdn but we'll talk about that later in the course the idea though is that we have intelligent ways of of designing systems that can improve our measurements of our systems. I'm sure you can imagine that having multiple servers all around the world is a pretty common technique, especially because we just talked about how it improves latency, it improves throughput, it improves availability, reliability, it improves everything. So this is definitely gonna be a technique that you're gonna leverage in designing big systems. So I hope this lesson at least gives you a bit of background on what we're trying to achieve. We want to design powerful systems that can handle failure and handle high throughput and do it very efficiently with low latency. And we're going to spend the rest of the course expanding upon these terms and focusing on how we can satisfy these requirements. Now let's cover the basics of networking. We'll be covering everything you need to know for system design interviews and also going a little bit more in depth than that. If we have two computers, for example, some client computer and some server, how do we communicate back and forth between these two? Like if we want to send data in one direction from the server to the client, how do we do that? Well, the same way we do it in the real world where we're sending mail from one house to another house, we have to know the address of each house. The same thing is true in computers. Every machine that is going to be communicating over the public internet and sending data back and forth needs to be assigned a public IP address. An IP address is what uniquely identifies a machine and distinguishes it between another machine. Like if we had a bunch of clients here, how would we know from the server which client to send it to? Well, we would identify it by the IP address. An IP address is a 32-bit integer it's written usually like this where you'll have 12 digits in total and each of the three digits will be separated by a dot so you'll have three digits here three digits here three here and three here each separated by a dot now since this is 32 bit we can't have all of these digits go all the way up to 999 because that wouldn't really fit in a 32 bit integer so the max value for each of these is going to be 256 so this would be the biggest IP address we could contain 
at least when you look at it as a single integer. With 32 bits, we can store up to about 4 billion unique public IP addresses. Now, this is quite limiting because we have more people than this on Earth, and we definitely have more machines than this on Earth. So this limitation of 32 bits for an IP address is a part of IP version 4. IP version 6 actually allows up to 128 bits. This is newer, but IPv4 is still used quite commonly. With this, though, we'll probably never reach the limit. This is quite a big number. But the important thing here is that every machine is going to be uniquely identifiable with an IP address. So now that each of our machines is uniquely identifiable over the public network, how do we actually send over the data? Like, what are the rules of communication between computers? An analogy would be sending mail in real life. In the real world, when we want to send mail in an envelope, for example, we have to specify who it's from, or at least we can, and we have to specify who this is going to. That's kind of the rule of sending mail in the real world. We have to say who it's going to and the address of that person. And the same is true when we're talking about computers. If we're going to send some data let's you know just say that this is our packet of data right now the data itself has to include who or you know which IP address this is going to and which IP address this data came from so that's analogous to this information that we typically write on the back of the envelope now of course the envelope inside once you open it up it does have some data inside of it or you know some papers or a letter or you know something in the mail and the same is true for data that we send over a network and by the way the rules of sending data over the internet is called the internet protocol or IP for short. That's why these addresses that we've assigned these machines are called IP addresses. And this data that we send here is actually called a packet of data. And like I said, a portion of this packet is actually going to be reserved for that information, which we call metadata. This metadata is kind of what describes this entire piece of data, this entire packet, just like how the back of the envelope has some information about this mail. The from and two is metadata about this mail. We call this data in the computer world a header. So this piece of data, a portion of it is going to be the header, which you know one of the things it'll include is the source IP address, the destination IP address. It'll include more stuff, but going super in depth into that is not super useful for system design. That's more the subject of an actual networking class. And so this is actually for an IP packet, an internet protocol packet. So IP basically allows us to send data between machines, but it doesn't do everything we need it to do. And by the way, this header is actually just the IP header. You'll see why that's important in just a moment. But going back to our analogy here for a minute, what if instead of just sending, you know, one letter in the mail, we wanted to send an entire book in the mail and we wanted to do so in an envelope. Let's assume we can't use like a cardboard box. Well, then one way to do it would be to actually take the book, rip every single page out of it and take, you know, an individual handful of pages and put it inside of an envelope and then send, let's say maybe it takes us 10 envelopes to contain the entire book. And we send those 10 envelopes from the same person, you know, just an individual person to some other person. And then that other person person will have all the pages that they need. Now we could try doing that with the internet protocol. We would have to send a bunch of packets, for example, and we send them from the client to the server. Then the server would have all the information. They would have all the pages of the book, for example. But how does the server reassemble those pages? Most book pages do have like a number on them, one or two or three, but let's assume we didn't have that because an internet protocol, there is no such thing for that. That's actually what another protocol called TCP. It stands for Transmission Control Protocol. It solves that problem and it solves other problems as well, actually. From the perspective of internet protocol, this is one packet of data. It has the IP header, which has some metadata about the packet, IP address and whatnot. And the rest of this is just data. It's the data of the IP packet. 
but that data itself, if we're using TCP, it's further broken up into two portions. One portion is called the TCP header. So the TCP header is some metadata about the TCP packet. So we're sending IP packets, which have an IP header. That allows us to communicate between computers. But when we're sending large amounts of data, we can't put all of that data in a single packet. So we have to split it up into you know, multiple packets. One individual packet would look like this, where we're sending TCP packets. And to do that, we'll have a TCP header on the data of that IP packet. What kind of information would this TCP header include that the IP header wouldn't? Well, one of the things is the sequence number of that packet. So when the server receives all of the packets, it is actually able to reassemble them in the correct order. So if we sent a book and we added the page number to each page of the book, the person we're sending it to would be able to put the pages in the correct order. That's what the server is able to do because every single packet of data not only is able to make it to the server because of the IP header, but because of the TCP header, the server is able to reassemble them in the correct order. So now we have a way to send a large amount of data from one machine to another machine. We can break it up into little packets which store metadata about those individual packets so that they arrive at the correct destination and they can be reassembled at the destination. And the actual data that we're sending itself is mainly what we have to worry about as software engineers. We can kind of take this protocol, the IP protocol and TCP protocol for granted. We don't really worry about that. This is mainly where we're going to live as software engineers. And this is mainly what we're going to be talking about. This is basically the application data. And this is kind of, if we were sending an HTTP request, which you may be familiar with, this is the most common application protocol. This is where all of that HTTP data for a request or a response would live at this level of the packet. And then this is what would be reassembled at the server. And this is what, as application developers, we would actually be accessing. We would typically don't need to worry about IP or TCP. So you can see in a single request, in a single communication between computers, there are multiple protocols going on. There's IP, there's TCP, there's HTTP. It's because they all live at a different layer. HTTP is known as an application level protocol, whereas TCP is concerned with the transport layer and IP is concerned with the network layer, the network meaning, you know, which device, which computer. TCP ensures that the data itself is transported correctly, that we can reassemble it in the correct order and that it arrives at the destination. And the application layer is what applications actually use and worry about. We'll definitely be going more in depth as we continue with the course. But generally, this covers all you need to know as a developer and as a system designer. Now, there's a few more basics that I wanted to cover when it comes to IP addresses. One is the distinction between a public and a private IP address. For a server to be publicly accessible, it needs to have a public IP address. So as a client or as a user, we could make a request to that server because it has a public IP address. Now our client machine doesn't need to have a public address. Nobody's necessarily gonna be making requests to it. And actually the internet traffic that we use as clients will go through some router. So if we have multiple devices connected to a single router, each of our devices doesn't need to have a public IP address, only our router does. So that's what actually happens. Our router will have a public IP address, but it will internally in our local network, AKA our LAN, our local area network, it will assign each of the machines connected to it a private IP address address and we won't go super in depth into that but a private IP address is private it won't be accessible up on the public internet but since these individual computers are you know a part of that same local network these actually will be able to technically communicate with each other but if you try to you know run a server locally on one machine and then try to access it using the private IP address uh, from another machine a part of the same local network there are other concerns that you know involve firewalls and port 
forwarding and things like that, which are beyond the scope of this course. There's also this concept of static IP addresses and dynamic IP addresses. Static, as the name implies, are IP addresses that do not change. This would be more important for the server side because if clients are making a request to a machine, that IP address should be constant so that, you know, we, we're making a request to this IP address and then, you know, eventually what if this uh, server got a new IP address that would be kind of annoying from the client's perspective. But actually servers can also have dynamic IP addresses and things actually do end up working. And that's because of something called dynamic DNS, which is beyond the scope of this course, but it's something I thought was worth mentioning. Typically for clients, we don't really need static IP addresses and most likely you do not have a static IP address for your local network. So as time goes on, your IP address may actually change, but because of the magic of the internet, things can still function perfectly fine. When it comes to networking, there's also this concept of ports. Ports are sort of a channel of communication between machines. Machines communicate between IP addresses, but also over some uh, specified port, for example, port 80 or port 22 or port 443. It is a 16-bit value. So there's about 65,000 ports for a machine. And that's really plenty because there typically won't be more than that many you know, channels of communication open at a particular time. Many application layer protocols actually have a default port specified. So HTTP, which we talked about for a bit, actually has the 80 port as its default. HTTPS has port 443. So when you go to google.com, for example, typically in the address bar, it's prefixed with HTTPS. So you're using this application layer protocol to communicate with google.com but you don't even need to specify the port. We're using port 443 on Google's server, for example. We're using this port, but the reason we don't typically specify, we, we don't write it like this because the default port for HTTPS is 443. So we don't even need to have it there. We're kind of using it implicitly. So from the perspective of a client, if we make a request to google.com on the server, we're by default, let's say using port 443, and the server is going to then send information back to the client using a port. Now that doesn't necessarily have to be 443. Actually, from the client's perspective, it doesn't actually matter which port we receive that information on. So the protocol actually will randomly assign a port and our browser will uh, reserve that port. So it could be some random port like, you know, 7,123. The information would come back to us on that port. Port. Now, this isn't something you need to know super in depth, but again, I think it's worth mentioning. So now as sort of a local demo, I'm running an application on my local machine. It's just the default Angular application. It's a demo and I'm able to access it on local host port 4200. Now, local host is just a special name for the IP address, which is 127.0.0.1. This is sort of a reserved IP address which points at your local machine. So this is a way of accessing a server that's running locally on your own machine. So this is actually the exact same as accessing localhost. Now we have to use port 4200 because that's what the application is running on. So on our local server, we're hitting this port. Now, if I change the port to 4201, it won't work. You can see we get an issue because we have no application running on that port. And just opening up my terminal in VS Code, real quick, you can see that I do indeed have that application, that Angular demo application running on port 4200. Now, if I open a second terminal and try to run that application again, it's by default going to try to run it on port 4200. But as you can see, it prompts us to use a different port because port 4200 is already in use. We can only run a single application on a single port at a time. We can't have multiple applications serving traffic on the same port. So now we know sort of the basics of how computers can communicate with each other. We have IP addresses, we have data packets that we send, which contain information about the data, which can allow us to reassemble the data once it's reached the destination. But we do have a few things that we still have left to cover.
So next, let's talk about TCP and UDP. We already talked a bit about TCP, but now we're really going to start focusing on what software developers really need to know. And you don't really need to know a ton about these transport layer protocols, but the basics are definitely good to cover. Now, to summarize, previously we talked about the internet protocol, and we also started talking a bit about TCP. And when we started doing that, we were actually moving on to another topic, which is called the internet protocol protocol suite. It's more commonly referred to as TCP IP because this is kind of saying that TCP is running on top of the internet protocol because we saw that the packets are actually encapsulated. The TCP packet is encapsulated in the IP packet. But this is, in my opinion, a pretty bad name because TCP IP, aka the Internet Protocol Suite, actually also includes other things that are not just TCP and IP, which includes UDP. I know this is all pretty confusing. You don't have to know it super in depth, but I do want to mention it because it can kind of be a point of confusion. And if you want to do your own research, these are the terms that you'll be using to search. So let's start with TCP because it's much, much more common than UDP. We talked about how if we're sending a large amount of data over a network, we have to kind of break that data up into pieces and then reassemble it on the other side. So the ordering of this data does matter because when we reassemble it, we want it to be in the exact same order that it was sent. So this is a property of TCP. This does not come with IP. Remember, the internet protocol is very bare bone. It will take data packets and then send them. And the header of that data packet will include, you know, the source IP and the destination IP. So it will send send data, but what happens if the data arrives out of order? Like we sent a bunch of packets, but they didn't arrive in the same order on the server. Well, TCP handles the ordering for us. So that's a benefit of TCP. Another benefit of TCP is that it's reliable. The reason this is important is that networks in general are not reliable. If we have a lot of data and some of these packets do not end up getting sent, like let's say all of these packets arrive at the the destination and we're able to reassemble them in the correct order. But what if one of the packets does not arrive? This one is missing. What would we do in this case? The internet protocol does not have a solution for this, but TCP does. TCP is the reason that if some packets of data do not arrive, we don't experience issues as users because those packets, those missing packets will be resent and only those missing packets will get reset and then we we will get the entire thing that we wanted. So this reliability is sort of analogous to when we send mail, going back to our analogy, when we send mail, you can add tracking to that mail. So you kind of know when the stuff actually arrives and that if something you know doesn't arrive, we can resend the same thing. For example, like on Amazon, if you order something and the tracking shows that it never arrived, then you would end up getting it resent by Amazon. Not a perfect analogy, but I hope this kind of gives you the idea because this reliability is something you do not get with UDP. And this is called retransmission of lost packets. Now, part of the reason why this is actually possible is because TCP actually establishes a connection between the two machines that are communicating. This is a two-way connection. We've sort of been talking about just, you know, sending one message, sending one letter or a piece of mail to another server from some source to a destination. But when we actually establish a TCP connection, we can send data in both directions. To establish this connection, there's something called a three-way handshake. And this is a component of TCP. We won't go super in-depth because it's not super important to know, but this is part of uh, why TCP can be reliable and why we can send data in both directions, why we can reassemble data at the destination. But this is also expensive because the three-way handshake at a high level will send data. So suppose we're establishing a connection from the client to the server. We send a message to the server to synchronize and we send a response from the server to the client to synchronize the server, but also to acknowledge that we received the message from the client. And then we send another message from the client to the server with acknowledgement of the server's synchronization. The point I'm trying to make here though, is that TCP has a lot of overhead. These sort of guarantees that we get with 
with TCP that data can arrive out of order and then be reassembled and that we can resend missing packets and that we establish a connection where data can go in both directions. All these things do not come free. Just like when you're sending mail, you have to pay extra money to get tracking and stuff like that. And maybe some kind of warranty. With TCP, this overhead is expensive on the network. We have to send additional data that we do not need to send with UDP and it takes more time. Like TCP will take time to establish that connection. This is a component of the latency of TCP. So basically TCP is reliable, but it's slower. It's very, very commonly used though, because as you can assume, reliability is really, really important when you're using the web. TCP has a bunch of application level protocols like HTTP. We kind of talked about that a bit earlier. It also has many, many others. Secure mail transfer protocol. This is used primarily for emails. There's also web sockets and many, many more. Most of the protocols you end up using are built on top of TCP. When you're sending emails, of course, you would want the entire email to arrive and in order. And same thing with web requests, which is what HTTP is used for if you're loading like a web page. We'll go more in depth on that a little bit later in the course. Now let's move on to UDP, which stands for User Datagram Protocol. Datagram is basically the word for packet that's used with UDP. Now the benefit of UDP is that we do not need to establish a connection between the client and the server. And so we don't need to have a handshake between the client and the server. A typical scenario for UDP would be a client, you know, sends a request to the server and then the server just starts sending data. And these data packets that are being sent to the client, you know, some of them may not end up making it to the client and these would not end up getting resent to the client. Those are lost forever. So if you were sending an email and, you know, one sentence of that email just doesn't arrive, that wouldn't be very good. But that's kind of what happens with UDP. There's no guarantees that every packet of data is going to arrive. The data also might arrive out of order. So maybe the first packet will first arrive, then the third packet would arrive, and then the second packet would arrive. And, you know, the fourth packet just never made it. But basically the first, third, and second packet, they arrive out of order. You know, that's also something UDP does not correct. We're not going to, you know, take these and then reorder them with UDP. UDP. They're just going to arrive out of order. So with all these downsides, why would we ever use UDP? Well, it's a lot faster than TCP. It doesn't come with the same overheads, obviously. We don't have to establish the connection. We don't have to do the handshake. We don't even have to worry about the packets. So when it does work, it's a lot faster than TCP. But like I said, you probably wouldn't want to send your emails using UDP. So what would UDP actually be useful for? Well, the most popular example is when it comes to streaming data in real time. Like for example, live streaming a video or a call or something like that, where maybe these packets of data actually represent frames of a video. In that case, you know, if one of the frames, like the middle frame here doesn't arrive, that would be okay because when you're watching something live, if there's a break in the connection, you don't necessarily need it to pick up where we left off. Like over here, you would want it to pick up where we're at in real time. Now, the ordering could still be out of order, but it wouldn't be super out of order, hopefully. And the point is that this would go faster. If you're watching something in real time, you want it to be as close to real time as possible. So UDP would give that to us. And if we're missing some frames, it's okay. When we're watching live TV, we don't need every single frame. If something gets cut from the middle of it, at least we pick up where we're actually at in real time. Like this would be the live feed. That's what we want. We don't want to see what happened five seconds ago. We don't need to resend those data packets. That's what TCP would try to do. We would try to resend those frames, but we don't need that when we're watching something live. This is just an example to show you that there are trade-offs with everything, not just when we're talking about scaling servers and things like that. Even with protocols, there are trade-offs. There are cases where TCP is more useful and UDP is more useful. Other use cases of UDP would be maybe uh, playing online games for similar reasons as uh, live streaming. Also, UDP is used in DNA which we're going to talk about shortly. But I hope this at least gives you the high level ideas behind TCP and UDP. As software engineers, we rarely have to get to this low of a level on the network stack. So for the rest of this course, we're gonna be mainly focusing on the application layer protocols that are built on top of TCP, the biggest one being HTTP.
So now let's talk about the domain name system, AKA DNS for short. And DNS is actually a very big and decentralized system, but we're gonna be looking at it in a pretty oversimplified way, but still we're gonna go a little bit more in depth than you'll even be needing for system design interviews. But I think having this type of context can definitely be helpful for seeing the big picture. The main problem that we're trying to solve is we have a client, let's say we want to access google.com. Well, we want to send a request to the google.com server. Let's say this is the IP address for that server. Well, are we going to type this into our browser? Does everybody need to know that this is the number of google.com? Like this is the IP address? It's sort of like having a phone book or a more modern example would be in your phone. You have a list of contacts where you map each person, the name of every single person to the phone number of that person. We want to do the same thing for domain names. We want to have a user-friendly name for a server. We want this to be pointing at this IP address, the same way we want somebody's name to be pointing to their phone number. So the very short explanation for this is that we have a domain name system where you want to go to google.com. Well, first find the IP address of google.com. Well, the DNS, the domain name system, will return that to our client and then we have the IP address so we know exactly where to send our request and then we get a response from the server. At a high level, this is what's going on. This is what the vast majority of people know because as software developers, you rarely need to go beyond this and the same is pretty much true for system design interviews, but we'll be going a little bit more in depth. First, let's look at a quick demo. Let's say we go to google.com and press enter. Well, we're already at google.com so it didn't do anything, but the point is that we get to this site. So what's going on is our computer is able to translate this domain to the IP address. And just to quickly illustrate this, I'm going to use a shell command called nslookup, and I'm going to pass in google.com. And the response that we're going to get is actually the IP address of google.com. So I'm going to take this here and copy and paste it. Now in our browser, I copy and pasted the IP address and I'm going to press enter and let's see what happens. Well, we got back to google.com. That's because the IP address belongs to Google. So whether we type in google.com or or actually the IP address, we arrive at the website. So at the high level, that's really all there is to it. We have some type of decentralized system that is able to take a domain name and translate it into an IP address. And there are a lot of things that actually go on with this interaction with the domain name system. Of course, your internet service provider is a crucial component to it. None of this will function without you know having the internet and your internet service provider will interact with other servers. And there's another organization involved called ICANN. It stands for Internet Corporation for Assigned Names and Numbers. This is basically the owner of all domains in the entire world. When you type in a name like google.com, how do we decide that only one person owns google.com? Why can't I just steal that domain? Well, it goes through ICANN. It's a nonprofit organization, but ICANN doesn't actually sell the domain since it's nonprofit. There are accredited resellers of the domains. And these are called domain registrars. So basically, if you were to go online and buy a domain, you'd have to go through a registrar. One would be, you know, Google domains or Namecheap or GoDaddy, any of these, there are a lot of them. And they resell the domains on behalf of ICANN. Well, not really on behalf, but they're the only ones who are able to resell them. And so this is kind of how it works at a high level. So obviously your request would actually go through your internet service provider and your internet service provider is what would interact with all these DNS components. So it would go through servers on ICANN and these servers would somehow know that, okay, like the google.com domain, maybe it belongs to a particular registrar. The Neatcode IO domain, for example, it goes through the Google domains registrar. So you can imagine that there would be kind of this chain of requests and eventually ICANN would lead us to going to a Google domain server. And that server is what holds the DNS record. So the DNS record basically stores information about resolving a DNS request. And there are many types of DNS records, but one is called an A record. A stands for address record. So this basically, I have one configured that says that Neatcode IO points at a certain
certain IP address and any request to Nico.io should be forwarded to this IP address and that IP address let's say belongs to my server and then that would eventually be the IP address for this server for example and then the request would go back to the client but you can see that this is already getting pretty complicated and this is just a very high level overview but I'm just trying to give you an idea of how all of this can work there is an organization which owns all the domains technically but there are resellers for those domains and those resellers host servers which have the DNS records so eventually a user request should land to one of these servers which will actually do the translating for us and then once that translation is complete the client has that IP address now usually the IP addresses aren't going to change for the servers very often usually they're static IP addresses though static IPs are not required there is something called dynamic DNS which means that a static IPs basically are not necessary but that's kind of out of the scope of this course but if IP addresses don't change super often the client can actually cache these IP addresses so if I type neatcode.io I'll eventually get the IP address and it'll be cached on my computer it'll be cached somewhere on the disk I believe if we want to talk to the neatcode.io servers we don't have to go through this DNS query every single time we don't have to know the IP address we already have the IP address saved on our computer this is kind of a example of caching and so this kind of rounds out for us what the purpose of a server is typically we do go through this DNS process to send requests to a server but you know essentially summarizing the last few lessons a server is essentially a computer with a public IP address and typically that IP address has some kind of domain name associated with it and this server's firewalls are configured to allow external traffic like for our own public router suppose we had some router with a public IP address we wouldn't necessarily want a public traffic to be reaching us we wouldn't want external users to be able to send requests to our computer so our firewall would block those but for public servers the firewalls are configured to allow requests to reach the server and so what the server does is it receives requests and it fulfills those requests and sends the appropriate response at least at a high level and we'll start expanding upon what exactly a server can do now I want to wrap up by looking at the components of a domain or a URL we start with the protocol over here typically in a browser you use mainly HTTP or HTTPS we're gonna go more in depth later on in the course but you could use other protocols here you could even access a file on your local file system on your computer in your browser and you'll see that on Windows for example this will point to like your C drive now this is the part of the domain itself this isn't technically part of the domain this last portion that we're all familiar with com is called the top level domain or TLD for short you've probably seen other obviously neatcode.io ends with a .io and there are many others there are country codes like JP would be for Japan you can imagine that these top level domains also go through that organization that controls all of the domains I can and same with the root portion of the domain so if you bought the google.com domain this is what you would own you'd own google.com and this portion is called the domain name or the primary domain name and this portion is called the subdomain subdomains are not necessarily required obviously we could go to google.com but also you can go to domains.google.com this is basically what they use for google domains the service where you can buy uh, domains off of another example of the subdomain could be www which i'm sure you've seen before this doesn't really serve a technical purpose it was mainly a convention that used to be used a lot it's not so common these days but some people still use it so if you were to type www.google.com you'd just be redirected to google.com and the last portion is the actual path of the domain this could you know be anything there could be you know multiple things it's followed by a slash as you can see you could also have some query params here and a lot of other things but you know this is the path of the domain this is not the domain itself if you were to buy a domain from some registrar like google.com you would own the entire domain you could also add as many subdomains as you wanted you'd control this portion entirely and if you owned this domain you would basically put inside of a dns record you would in an address record most likely you would want to say okay google.com it points to some ip address which belongs to your own server and so that's how this kind of phone book system aka the domain name system works it's a very complicated 
Secret Service, we barely glossed over it. But luckily, you don't really need to know the details for system design interviews. What we talked about here is more than enough. So next, let's move on to application layer protocols. This is typically what we're more concerned with as developers. I wanna to touch a bit on the client server model that we've sort of already been talking about throughout this course. I wanna briefly cover RPCs, and then I wanna go over some actual application layer protocols. We're mainly gonna be focusing on HTTP and a bit on WebSockets. These are the main protocols that are most useful for system design interviews. Now, starting with the client server model, the main assumption that we've sort of been making, and you can tell by the drawing, is that the client is going to be some end user, for example, you or me, could be using some kind of desktop or laptop, some kind of browser on a machine, which is gonna be making some requests to a server. This could be, for example, google.com. And after making a request, we expect that we get some kind of response back. So this is loosely the client server model. It's mainly as simple as it sounds, but there's a couple things I wanna clarify that the client actually doesn't need to be an end user. It doesn't need to be a browser. It doesn't need to be a desktop machine or a laptop or phone or anything like that. Client is actually a very general term. It basically means the one that's making the request. In the client server model, there's a client which actually initiates the request. And then there's the server, which is typically, you know, not some end user machine. It typically is a, a computer in some kind of warehouse or data center or something like that. And the responsibility of the server is to serve requests. It accepts a request and then it fulfills that request. But the client doesn't have to be a user. The client could actually be another server. It could be a server over here instead of some browser. Servers are allowed to communicate with each other. If we had google.com, for example, might use some kind of third party service, which is another server. So in that case, one of the servers would be taking the role of the client and then another server would be the actual server that is responding to the requests. Next, if you haven't heard of it, I wanna sort of introduce you to this term, which is RPC. It stands for Remote Procedure Call. This is essentially a concept we've already been talking about. When we talk about moving data between machines, part of that is knowing what data to actually move. We need these machines to be able to communicate with each other. We communicate via code. So the way multiple machines can talk to each other remotely, you know, over a network is via a remote procedure call. Remote means that there are two machines that are separated by a network. So, you know, from the perspective of the client, this is a remote machine. We want to execute some procedure call on it, just like a function call, just like in our client, which maybe is in a web browser. We have some JavaScript code and we organize our code into classes and functions and things like that. If we want to call a function, we can do so. But what if there is code on a server, on a remote machine that we want to execute. So if we want to run a function that's actually located on the server. For example, from the client, we are on youtube.com. We want to list all of the videos in our user feed. Well, to run that code, we can't do it from the browser. We don't have access to that code. The code that generates the video feed for us is actually located on the server. So we need to run code that is on the server. This green code, let's assume is on the server. So we do so via a remote remote procedure call. Now, this is a very, very loosely defined term. What we talked about is pretty much all it means, essentially executing code over a network. I personally think it's sort of an outdated and kind of a useless term, but I'm mentioning this because all of the other application layer protocols are essentially at their core RPCs. We're executing code that's not on a single local machine. We want to execute code that's not just in the browser. We want to execute code that's on the server so we can issue an RPC, which is basically from the client, it, it would basically be us executing some line of code that looks like it's local to the client, but underneath the hood, that call is making a network call. So for example, list videos, this could be a function from the perspective of the client, but the code for this function is actually written on a different machine. It's on the Google servers. And after we execute this, the Google servers will respond with that list of videos. And since this is so loosely defined, almost everything, you know, in terms of network calls fits under the definition of an 
an RPC. We're going to be focusing on things that are explicitly defined, things like HTTP, a protocol, which basically boils down to RPCs. And we'll also be talking a bit about WebSockets. Okay, now let's talk about HTTP, which is the protocol of the internet. So we've already talked about moving data between machines. That was the internet protocol, IP for short. And we took this system and made it reliable using TCP. So now we have a way of reliably sending data back and forth between machines. You can think of this as sort of the bare bones infrastructure that we actually need to build applications. But HTTP is a application layer protocol that's built on top of IP and TCP. This is what we actually have control over. Now there's a lot we could talk about with HTTP, but I'm going to be focusing on the basics because that's really all we need to know. A lot of the really small details aren't super important and they're definitely not worth memorizing. So we'll be really focusing on the big ideas. The single biggest thing about HTTP is that it's a request response protocol. So the client makes a request and the server responds with the response or RES for short. Now it might make a bit more sense why we were talking about this whole client server model and about RPCs because HTTP is just about sending some request to a server and that request will have information about what we want to execute, what kind of code on the server are we trying to execute, and the server will run that code and then respond with what we were you know, trying to get, or maybe there was an error that occurred or something happened in between. But there are basically two pieces of this communication. The client initiates a request to do this. Now under the hood, there is a TCP connection handle, there's the handshake, there's all that. So it's important to know that HTTP is built on TCP and all the overhead and cost that comes with that. But as developers, we don't really see that. There's no state management between the client and the server. Everything needed for the request and the response is you know, handled in that request and response. The client and server don't need to know anything about each other other than that, other than what's already included in the request. And I think the quickest way to learn about HTTP is just to show you. So let's go to youtube.com and do a quick demo. The first thing you probably already know is that HTTP is used pretty much every time you search for something or land on a web page. In this case, we actually have HTTPS, which is a variation of HTTP. This is what is commonly used. It's pretty rare to just use the bare bones HTTP nowadays because it's less secure. But you'll see if I take away the S and then press enter, it'll actually take us to, it'll redirect us back to HTTPS. Most websites do that by default. But what I want to show you is the network tab. So if you right click anywhere and you see inspect, this is your browser's dev tool. You may already be familiar with this, but you can go to the network tab and then see all requests, all network activity that's going on from the site that you're on. Let's go ahead and search for neat code and see what happens. The actual site isn't super important, so I'm going to cover most of that up here. But here you can see all the list of requests that are going on. And, and this is probably intimidating if this is your first time using DevTools, but this is the list of requests. So this is like the name of each request. I'm going to kind of close this. Most of these are HTTP requests, and we can sort of filter these by name, status, type, initiator, all these things. Uh, I'm going to go ahead and right click and then reveal the protocol. This is kind of what we've been talking about. So this says H3. That stands for HTTP version 3. There are multiple versions of HTTP. I'm not going to go super in depth to that, but HTTP 3 is the most recent version. And now actually looking at one of the requests here, this one results, let's get into the anatomy of an HTTP request. So one component is the headers of a request. Every request has two main components. One is the header and another is the actual body of the request. So there's actually three groups of headers. One is the general header. This includes some really basic stuff like the actual URL that we're making a request to. So when we type, you know, youtube.com into our browser, we're making an HTTP request here. When we searched for neat code, we also made an HTTP request to youtube.com. So that's like the base URL. And we also have a path here. So results with a query of neat code is how we landed on this page. There's a couple more important fields like the request method. So in this case, we made a get request. There's a few more really common request methods types, namely post, put, and delete. There's a lot more, but those are the four most commonly used. And we also have status codes. So 200 green in this case, you can kind of
kind of tell that this was a successful request also because the page actually loaded with the list of videos. But that's the main idea here. We're kind of familiar with this concept of a header by now. It's used to kind of give information about the request itself. How do we know where this request even needs to go? Well, it's going to this URL. What kind of method are we using? We're using get because we're trying to retrieve some information. Post would, on the other hand, be used to update the server. But we also have two more groups of headers, the request header and the response header. As the name implies, the request header is what the requester, the client, is actually going to set. You can see the authority is, you know, the base URL that we sort of talked about. The method, get the path, which we specify as the client, we decide what we're going to look for, what kind of information we're trying to get. Except there's several more fields here. We won't be covering all of them, but you can take a look yourself and you definitely don't need to memorize all these. We're kind of covering what you really need to know anyway. Another few are user agent. So this kind of says multiple browsers, but in my case, I'm using Chrome. And there's also accept. This is the data format that you're actually going to accept. In this case, we're getting an HTML page. You can tell that from the response here, you know, doc type HTML. This is basically the HTML page that we're viewing after we type, you know, something into the search bar. But going back to the headers, that's the request header. That's what the requester will set. Now the response also is going to set some information. So the response header will say, you know, what content type was actually returned. The request header gave some options of what content, but ultimately the response includes some HTML. That's what text HTML means. So now let's actually review some of the things we talked about and go a little bit more in depth. So, so we know every request has to go to some URL, for example, youtube.com. Suppose that this is an API. This would be referred to as the API route. So this URL defines a route. Now this route could actually serve multiple HTTP methods. We could make a get request to this route and this would be its own endpoint. That's the term that's used to define, you know, API, you know, functionality with HTTPS. So this would be referred to as an endpoint. This is its own endpoint. This is the get endpoint for this URL or this route. We could also have another endpoint using a different HTTP method. So we'd have some different functionality defined for the post method. So with get at youtube.com, maybe, you know, their server is going to return the HTML page for YouTube. Maybe post though would do something else. I don't know. Maybe it creates a user account or something to this exact same URL. We're using a different HTTP method, and that is going to do some different functionality. So this is going to be its own separate endpoint. That's what it's called if you're wondering about the terminology. So what exactly is the significance of these HTTP methods? Well, there's actually not a lot to it. I mean, the names themselves are pretty self-explanatory. I think get, you typically use get to retrieve some information. So if we're getting, you know, the YouTube homepage, that would be one thing, or maybe listing a bunch of videos as we did earlier by typing in some query like neat code. Now, if you really wanted to, you could use an HTTP get endpoint to create data. We could use get to maybe create an account if we really wanted to and pass that information in the URL, maybe, you know, the password and username in the URL itself, though we probably wouldn't want to have the password in the URL. That's not very safe. If somebody were to inspect the URL, they would see that information. So we would rather use a post request. And that's exactly what post is for, for actually creating information. So creating a user account or creating a comment or uploading a video, doing some kind of creation creation on the server is what a post request is for. And, you know, the restriction with get requests, actually, we talked about how the anatomy of an HTTP response, it has a header and also it has a body will actually get requests don't have bodies. So if we wanted to create an account, we could not pass that information into the body. Get requests don't really have bodies. They only have headers. Everything we pass in has to be in the header. That's why we have to include any extra information in the URL of the request with a get request. But post requests and the rest of these uh, HTTP methods don't really have that restriction. They have a body, which we can pass additional 
additional information into. So going back to the network tab, I found a random post request that's being made. I think this is for some kind of, you know, analytics data for YouTube. It's API slash stats and then, you know, this long string. But heading over to the payload tab, this is the body of the request. So there's a bunch of parameters here and some actual data here that you can see. Not super readable, but this is the idea. You know, there, this is a way for us to pass any type of data we want in the body. Like we could pass in what kind of account we're creating if we're leaving a comment, you know, that could be passed here. Basically any type of form submission, anything like that. It's very flexible. So put requests are pretty similar to post requests. The main difference being that put is basically an update. So you can think of these HTTP methods as being sort of CRUD, where CRUD stands for create, read, update, delete. So with that post would be creating, get would be reading, put would be updating, and then delete is of course deleting. There's a few other differences between the HTTP methods. The most significant being that these work a little bit differently with caching. Get, we would expect to be item potent. If we're you know reading some resource, we don't expect that resource to change. So get is typically item potent. It's more cacheable. With post, we're creating a resource on the server. So this is definitely not cacheable. It's definitely not item potent. After the first time that we issue a post request, it will continue to do some, you know, action on the server side. So this is not item potent. Delete usually is item potent, so it's more cacheable. But this stuff isn't super significant, and I don't think you really need to know it. We also talked about status codes. That's essentially for the client knowing how the request was actually handled. Like maybe we made a request to YouTube.com, but for some reason the server is having a problem and it can't like fulfill the request. We would get some error code for us as clients, as users to know what went wrong. Was it a server problem that happened? Or maybe we made a request that was invalid. Like maybe in the youtube.com search bar, we, you know, use some special characters that we're not supposed to, you know, some star or something. And then with that invalid string, the server, you know, tries to parse it, but it says, you know, this is invalid. I'm not going to respond to this type of request. And it would send that information to the client. Like you made a mistake. This is not my fault. This is because you gave me an invalid string and so I can't do this. So the client should know, was it my fault or was it the server's fault or you know what exactly happened? Maybe the, the request and the response was perfectly valid. How do we know that? That's why we have status codes. This is part of the HTTP protocol. And as you can assume, this would be pretty helpful for developers. We don't need this at the TCP level, but at the HTTP level, this is very useful for us, though this isn't actually required. If we wanted to, we could send very unhelpful status codes and some people do, but that's not good API design. You definitely don't need to memorize the exact status codes, but I think, you know, knowing that 200 is a successful response. So, you know, status code 200, which I think we saw earlier, is okay. Basically, that means the request was okay. There's another status code 201, which basically means a resource was created. So not only was the request okay, which we know from it being a 200 level code, but whatever resource resource we were trying to create, maybe we were adding a comment to a video, it was created successfully. You can assume that this would probably be used for a post request rather than a get request. And then a couple more that we sort of talked about client error. Code 400 would be for a bad request, sort of what we talked about with like an invalid string. 401 would be for unauthorized. For example, we're trying to delete a video that's owned by some other user. We're unauthorized to do that. Maybe we're not the creators of that video, so we can't delete the video, of course, you know, this would be the status code for that. We could also use bad request if we wanted to really, but this is just a bit more specific. And there are other codes, 404 for a resource not found. You've probably seen that in your browser before. There's also 500 errors, which are usually more rare. The most common would be something like 500, which is an internal service error, or 502, which is a bad gateway, or 503, which is you know just the service is unavailable. But at the very least, I hope this gives you a high level overview of what HTTP is all about. It's really for us developers being able to execute some code remotely and then get a response, just like we're executing a function as a part of you know our own code base. The last thing I want to quickly cover is SSL slash TLS. So this is where the HTTPS actually comes in, that you know last character, which actually reminds me we didn't talk about what HTTP stands for because to be honest, it's not super important. It stands for hypertext transfer protocol, and the last character S, you know, stands for secure or it could 
could just be HTTP with SSL. The relationship between SSL and TLS is that SSL stands for secure socket layer. It came before TLS, but people still use the term SSL, even though it's outdated at this point, and TLS is much more widely used. TLS stands for transport layer security, and we'll only be talking about this at a high level because it's not super important for system design. The main idea is that HTTP is not necessarily secured against something called man in the middle attack, MITM for short. Basically, if we're sending data, we know we have IP, we have TCP, and now we have HTTP and adding the S to make it secure. Because if we are sending data, just like sending mail in maybe a cardboard box where that box is transparent, where you can see, you know, maybe we have, you know, a bag of money in here or something like that, right, in the box. If we're sending boxes that are transparent, anybody who sees the box in transit can steal it. They can see exactly what's inside and then open it up and take it. So that's where SSL and TLS comes in. If we're sending information on a site, we want that information to be uh, encrypted. So from the client, if we enter our password, 1234, for example, and then send it to the server, anybody in the middle of that HTTP request can see it. And we won't go into exactly how that might happen, but the idea is that networks are not very reliable or secure. Anything could happen. You could be at a coffee shop using public Wi-Fi, and you know, those HTTP requests could be monitored, and someone could see that your password is 1234 in the middle. That's a man in the middle attack. SSL and TLS basically will encrypt anything that you send over HTTP. So if our password is one, two, three, four. This will actually be encrypted to be some kind of hash or something. You know, let's say it's X, Y, Z. So even though our password is really one, two, three, four, that will become some other string like X, Y, Z, and that will be sent to the server and the server will be able to decrypt it and then understand that the real password is one, two, three, four, and then use that. And if for some reason it was sending this data back, it would encrypt it and turn it into, you know, X, Y, Z. That's at a very, very high level because I think we've already spent enough time talking talking about the most important parts of HTTP, and most people just take the S for granted. It just adds security. For example, if you were on a site like this, never SSL, at the top left of your browser, you'll see something like this is not secure. That doesn't necessarily mean you're gonna get a virus or something from the website. It just means that any data you send to this site, like your password, for example, you should be really careful about that because if somebody is eavesdropping in the middle of the connection between your browser and the server of never SSL, they will be able to see everything. But in this case, I'm not going to be entering any data anyway. So this site, you know, the fact that it's not secure isn't really a huge deal. And the warning message here kind of implies as much. So having gone through all this talk about networking and protocols, we finally arrived at a solution, HTTPS, which is reliable and is easy for us programmers to use. And it's also secure and we can use it just like we're you know executing functions locally. It just happens that it's happening over a network on a different machine. But using these concepts, we can build very, very powerful applications. So now let's talk a bit about the limitations of HTTP and about another protocol that can kind of fill in the gaps of HTTP, which is WebSockets. But there's also a lot of application layer protocols. We're not going to be talking too much about all of these because I don't think it's super important, but you've almost certainly heard of some of these. FTP is file transfer protocol. By default, it runs on port 21. As the name implies, it's for, you know, transferring large files between computers. There's SMTP, which stands for Secure Mail Transfer Protocol. It runs on port 25, I believe, by default. These ports, by the way, aren't super important. I'm just kind of mentioning it because we know HTTP by default runs on port 80. The rest of these also have their own default ports. But SMTP is, you know, optimized for sending emails. SSH is to remotely connect to another machine and run, you know, a CLI on that machine. WebRTC is for video and audio streaming. The interesting thing is that all of these are actually built on TCP. Reliability is important for these protocols. WebRTC, though, since it's optimized for video and audio streaming, this is actually built on UDP. So TCP is definitely the more common transport layer protocol, but UDP also has its use cases. It's all about the trade-offs. And now we'll be moving on to the trade-offs of WebSockets and the differences with it between HTTP. So let's first look at the problem that we're trying to solve. 
Let's say that we are trying to build a chat application. So right now I'm on Twitch. We're just watching some random streamer and here we have the chat. So you can see that users are typing, you know, their messages. It doesn't really matter what they are. There's some text. Each user is able to send messages in the chat. And of course we are seeing messages in real time. As the messages come in, we are seeing them from all of these users. So how would we implement this? So from our browser, as the client, we can send requests and we get responses back. With HTTP, we can load twitch.tv, we can load the web page, we can load the list of streamers, we can get a lot of information. HTTP is satisfactory for pretty much everything we need to do. But when it comes to reading chat, how are we going to do it with HTTP? At time, let's say 12 p.m., we could send an HTTP request and get a list of all the chat messages at that time. Now, maybe at 12.01 p.m., we could send another message and then get all the messages at that point in time that were sent, you know, in between 12 and 12.01. We could keep sending HTTP requests like this to update us with all the newest chat messages. This is called polling. This can be implemented with HTTP. But the problem is, how do we time these intervals? Probably one minute is too long to wait. That means we'd have to wait six. 60 seconds before seeing the newest messages. Maybe we can pull every one second. That would probably be good enough. And this would probably work in most cases with HTTP, but it's less optimized. You can see this way, us as clients, we have to create a new connection, a new HTTP connection, which we know is built on top of TCP, which is somewhat expensive. And we have to create a new connection every time we want, you know, the newest chat messages. A better way to solve this problem is with a better protocol, better in terms of that protocol is designed to solve this problem. It's called WebSockets. What we first do is called the WebSocket handshake, which basically the client will actually send an HTTP request. And that request is to establish a WebSocket connection. So after that HTTP request, the server will usually respond with a status code of 101, which basically means it's taking this connection and upgrading it to a WebSocket connection. So that's the WebSocket handshake not super important to memorize. But the important thing is that after that handshake, there is a persistent connection established between the client and the server. So there is a connection. It's not like HTTP, where with HTTP, we send a request, get a response back, send another request, get another response back. That's kind of how it is with HTTP. But with WebSockets, there's just a connection established and we can send information in both directions. With HTTP, usually the client initiates some requests and then the server responds with what the client needs. With WebSockets, the client is the one initiating the connection, but once the connection is established, data can move in either direction. Like we could send from the client, like maybe as a user, I'm typing a message, that message goes to the server. Maybe I send another message and you know a third message. Three messages were sent, the server didn't have to respond with anything, but then maybe I don't type anything for a few minutes and then the server starts responding. You know, Every time there's a new message, like some other user on the other side of the world is typing in, you know, some ABC message. And every time that happens, the server is going to push that information to the client. As the client, we don't have to pull, we don't have to keep checking, does it have a new message? We don't have to do that. Every time there's a new message, we immediately receive that from the server. The server pushes that information to us. And, you know, we could also, as users, send information to the server at the same time that that's happening. It's not a big deal. So this is bi-directional communication. This is something that HTTP doesn't really do out of the box. Well, at least not until HTTP version two, which introduced streaming, which kind of makes WebSockets obsolete actually. But to avoid confusing you, we won't go super in depth into that because WebSockets are very prevalent to this day. And most people I assume don't even know that HTTP two actually makes WebSockets obsolete. So I think in a real interview, WebSockets are perfectly fine. I would just feel irresponsible if I didn't kind of mention this caveat. But now going back to our Twitch example, and I'm going to go ahead and open up the network tab again and refresh so that we you know, get our data here. 
So this is a bit hard to read, but what I'm gonna do over here is in the filter window over here, I'm gonna type in WS for WebSockets. And here you can see that we have a connection right here. This is the name, it's the chat for our Twitch streamer that we're watching here. This is the chat connection. And guess what, which protocol is it using? Not HTTP, it's using WebSocket because this is kind of exactly the problem WebSockets is for, for real time chat communication. So here you can see it responded with a status of 101, that is from the the initial HTTP request that was made to twitch.tv with a get request to establish that WebSocket connection. And it responded with a status of 101. It was switching protocols. It's upgrading this to be a WebSocket connection. And then after that's done, we can go to the messages tab here. And here you can see the actual interesting stuff. We can, you know, scroll through here and get the messages in real time. Every time we get a new message, this is some metadata. I think it's which user did this message come from. But if we scroll all the way, eventually we get here. This is the message that somebody typed in. Let's just go to the most updated one real quick so that we can find it in the chat here. Somebody is saying, what is the number in the middle of Zarya's? I'm just going to copy that, make this window a little bit more readable. I'm going to control F and see, yep, this is the message that somebody just typed. We got it in our WebSocket connection. The benefit of this is we don't have to make a request to the server every few seconds, for example, to check, was there a new message? Anytime there's a new message, we are immediately pushed that in real time. Every time we type a message here, other users are seeing that in real time. This is less expensive from a networking perspective. We don't have to create a new connection every single time. We just have to do that WebSocket handshake. We establish a connection. We can send data in both directions. So now you know, if you're designing an application that needs some kind of real-time data streaming or you know, bi-directional communication, aka a full duplex connection. That basically means we can send data both directions. WebSockets is what you would use. So this is really, really useful for creating any type of chatting or real-time data, like something like a live feed, like your Twitter feed, for example. That could be implemented with polling. Like if you check every few seconds, is there a new tweet? That would be perfectly fine to implement with polling. But for something like Twitch chat, we probably don't want to use polling. If we have hundreds of messages coming in a minute, we want to see those messages in real time. The order of those messages might also matter. So WebSockets is better for that. The downside is that there is a state established between the client and the server. Maybe this connection could actually break at some point and then the server would continue to send data. But in general, what we covered, the problems that WebSockets solve is what you should really be focusing on. The conceptual difference between, you know, the client initiating every request, receiving a single response for every request, whereas WebSockets, we can, you know, just keep communicating in both directions. So now that we've finally built up an understanding of how information is sent, especially at the application layer, whether we're using HTTP or WebSockets or a different protocol, we have a way of creating APIs. It stands for Application Programming Interface. And that's a very, very general term because API is just used very loosely. It's pretty loosely defined. It's really just any type of programming interface. So for example, in a web browser, there's this concept of local storage. It's basically a way of storing information in a browser persistently, but it's specific to a single machine. For example, when you go on youtube.com, you can toggle whether you want to use the light theme or the dark theme. And that information is usually stored in your browser in local storage. And to access local storage, there's an API. And in this context, API just means, you know, the interface that we use to access local storage. It's pretty simple. We basically read and write from local storage, but that, you know, technically is an API. If you create an object in object oriented programming for that object, you define some interface like the functions that are used or the methods that are used to access the data of your object. That is technically an API because it's a programming interface. Now, most commonly API is used to indicate some kind of external service like an HTTP API. And that's mainly what we mean when we talk about API in this course. When we're designing APIs, we're talking about API paradigms, how to build APIs, different ways of doing the same thing. That's what we're talking about, some type of API that's going to serve user requests. And I want to focus on three of the most common modern paradigms for this. By far the most popular and the most important, I think, for you to know is REST APIs. 
more recently, GraphQL APIs were introduced. GraphQL was actually created by Facebook. I think at the very least, you should be aware of GraphQL, even though it's a lot less common and less important than REST, but it does solve some of the issues that can come up with REST APIs. And lastly, we're gonna be talking about gRPC. And gRPC APIs also have their trade-offs. That's really the important thing you should be focusing on. What are the pros and cons of each of these? You don't necessarily have to be an expert. You don't have to have developed a dozen APIs with each of these paradigms. But at the very least, I'd like you to be able to discuss one or two trade-offs for each of these. So what are REST APIs? Well, first of all, REST is an acronym. It stands for Representational State Transfer. It's not a protocol. REST APIs are built on top of HTTP typically, but that doesn't mean REST is actually a protocol that's built on top of HTTP. It's more a set of loose restrictions that we apply to HTTP APIs. And when these restrictions or guidelines are applied, we get what's called a REST API. Now, what are these restrictions? Or you could also call them standardizations because that's really what REST is about. It's about creating standardized APIs that everybody can recognize and be familiar with that are easy to use and have some other benefits like being able to scale them. I will say that REST is used very commonly. Nowadays, HTTP APIs are synonymous with REST. People don't even know what exactly REST means. A lot of people think REST is the same as HTTP. It's not the case, but you will see a lot of these terms that we we talk about misused. It does somewhat make sense that this is synonymous with HTTP because, you know, for the most part, there's a good chance you've exclusively interacted with REST APIs and nothing else. Now, the biggest thing about REST APIs is that they are stateless. It's called representational state transfer because what's going on here, when we send requests back and forth from the client and the server, we want to send everything that we need to know about that request and that response because that's what REST is all about. We are making those get requests, post requests, all those kind of methods that we talked about with HTTP. Remember, REST is built on top of HTTP. It very closely aligns with HTTP. With responses, we are getting those status codes like 404 or maybe, you know, 201 something. But one of kind of the standards that we apply is that this has to be stateless. First of all, what's an example of actually having state? Well, suppose we have an endpoint like this and we, and this is a get endpoint. We have the domain, you know, youtube.com and every REST endpoint is associated with something called a resource. A resource is a noun. It's a thing. In this case, we have videos. A video on YouTube is a resource. We could also here have had a user or listing for that video. We have a video ID. Let's just use ID for short here. And then for that video, we want another resource. Actually, we don't care about the video itself. This is actually how we would get a particular video, just a single video, we would get the ID of that video. And from this endpoint, let's say we get the video. Now for that video, maybe we want all of the comments. So we'd have another endpoint over here with comments. And this would actually give us an entire list of all of the comments. Now, getting back to my point about state here, let's say we actually want to list a bunch of videos. We're on the YouTube homepage and we want to list by default, let's say this returns 10 videos. And then let's say we actually want 10 more videos, we scroll down or maybe we go to the next page. Remember when there wasn't a news feed and we actually had to go navigate page by page? Let's say we have to do that. There's two ways we could implement that with our client server architecture here. The server could actually have some information for every single user. Maybe the server has some code. It's storing a session for every single user server side. This isn't a client side session, but on the server, it's keeping track of every single user. The server knows that I just saw 10 videos. Now I'm asking for 10 more videos. So it's going to remember that and it's going to show me 10 new videos that's not a part of the original set. This is just a very high level example. The point is that this is stateful. This is not stateless. We want REST APIs to be stateless. That's the whole point of REST APIs. 
Now, another way to make this stateless for the server to not have to know anything about every user, the server should not have to manage any state related to this. Technically, the server could access a database. You know, maybe there's a database over here. The server can access that and there is some data written to the server about the user or something like that. This technically is REST. We are allowed to store persistent data in a database. Stateless does not mean we don't store anything. It just means that from the perspective of the server, there is no state being stored in the server itself. There is definitely going to be some state in the browser. In the browser, we definitely have some cookies almost always. We will have some session storage on the browser side. We're not going super in depth to kind of these concepts, but they are a way of managing state and information for a particular user. But this is all stored on the actual browser, on your actual machine. It's not stored on a server. Now this information is sent to the server, but it's not stored there. So to solve this problem of fetching videos, we would use something that's very, very common in REST APIs and good APIs in general. It's called pagination. So instead of keeping track of how many videos we've already seen for every single user on the server, we actually send that information. We paginate that information in every individual request. The request itself should have all the information we need. Now, one way, if we're using a GET request, we don't necessarily have a body in the request. So we would send the pagination information in the URL typically itself. We could use a query parameter. A question mark here is a query parameter. So we're you know adding a parameter to this URL. Just like how earlier we had the ID, this is called a URL parameter. Just like with function parameters, we're passing in some value here. This is not going to be literally the string ID. It's going to be some you know video ID. It could be XYZ, something crazy, but it identifies a video and then that's how we get it. This is a URL parameter. We have something else called query parameters. It's just another way of having a variable in a URL, just a different format. So in this case, query parameters have a question mark. We could have two parameters. One is for limit. It tells us how many videos to fetch. Let's say limit is equal to 10. And then we could have another parameter. This is getting long, so I'm gonna erase it, which is offset. And that's gonna tell us where to actually start. So for our first request, we would say maybe the offset is zero. We want to start at the first video. And now we want 10 videos. Assume I also have that limit equals 10 here as well. Now, if we want the next 10 videos, we don't want the server to have to remember we already saw 10 videos, we want 10 more. So we send that in the request itself. Instead of the offset being zero, we say the offset is 10 and we also want 10 videos. So the offset is gonna tell us skip the first 10 videos we already saw. Show me the next 10 videos. We're limiting this to 10. We could limit it to 100 if we really wanted to. But the point is we can send this stateful information in the request. It doesn't have to be persisted on the server. The main reason we do this, right? Why jump through all these hoops? Who cares? Well, the main reason we do this is what if you have more than one server? What if you actually have three servers here? When you as a client make a request, it could go through a load balancer, which we haven't talked a lot about yet, but this load balancer is going to route requests to one of the servers. Now it could be possible that one of the servers does have the session information of a user. For me, for example, I make a request to this server. This server knows how many videos I've already seen. Now I want 10 more videos. What if the next time I make a request, it actually goes to one of these other servers that wouldn't work. But if we change this to be a REST API where it's stateless, none of the servers have any state. Now they could be talking to a central database, which has all the data. These servers may be inconsistent with each other. They may not all have the session information for me as a user, but the database usually does have everything, but we're not going to get super in depth to that just yet. But when we make it so that these servers do not need to store any state information, we allow ourselves to scale horizontally horizontally. We can add as many servers as we want with a RESTful API with that type of architecture. We are allowed to horizontally scale this. That's the big benefit of REST APIs.
Now that covers mainly what we need to know about REST APIs. The rest we already kind of talked about when we talked about HTTP, like the status codes, like 400 for client error, 500 for server error. These codes are very important for REST APIs. That's kind of how we communicate whether a request was good or bad. Like I mentioned, REST APIs add the restriction of every request, every endpoint needs to be related to some resource. And we don't have verbs in these resource names. Like we don't have this and call it get video videos, for example, or post a video or create a video or upload a video, we don't add verbs to HTTP endpoints because the HTTP method like get or post or delete or any of those is what we use for the verb. What action are we taking on this resource? We'll talk a bit more about this when we actually talk about designing good APIs and following some of the best practices. Now, by far the most common data format for REST APIs is JSON. JSON is a a very popular data format. It stands for JavaScript object notation because it looks very similar to JavaScript objects, but it's not exactly the same. A little bit confusing in my opinion. But the benefit of JSON is that it's very, very human readable. So like this is a JSON object, for example, it's basically a bunch of key value pairs where every key is a string. So in this case, we have the first name of somebody and then their name is John. So this is the key, this is the value. It's very flexible because we can have these primitive data types like strings, booleans, integers, doubles, if we wanted to, we can also nest objects as well. Like we have a key here address, but that's its own nested object. And that object has some key value pairs as well. We can also have arrays. Phone numbers here is not an object. It's actually a list of objects, which correspond to a phone number, the home phone number. This is an office phone number. And we can also have null values. So big benefit here is that it's very, very readable, but performance wise, we can actually do do better as we'll see when we talk about gRPC. Okay, now let's move on and talk at least a little bit about GraphQL and gRPC. GraphQL APIs are relatively new. I think back in 2015, they became public. They were created at Facebook and there are really two main motivations behind GraphQL APIs. First of all, GraphQL is not a protocol. It's actually built on top of HTTP, but it only uses HTTP post requests because as we're we're going to talk about we need to send data in a body and we know that get requests do not have bodies so we need to send it in a http post request so all that talk about protocols was not useless because it does come up these important points of which method to use does come up so graphql uses post requests and in the body of that request we include a query which basically tells us exactly which resources we want from the server now before before we get too far into the solution, let's actually talk a bit about the problem. As we create a you know really big application, we are going to be accessing a lot of resources. If we do this with REST APIs, we will have you know some endpoints for videos and comments and users and a lot of stuff. So with all these resources and all these requests that we're sending from the client to the server, there's going to be a couple problems that arise. One is going to be over. So when we make requests and we want some user information, for example, we want to list a bunch of comments, right? We have like five comments that we want to show. And for each of those comments, we want to have a little card like this, where we have the profile picture of the person, we have their username, and then we have the actual comment that they made. This is the comment body. So for this comment here, we just want the user profile and the username, but a user will have a lot of information tied to them. An individual user will have a lot of information on on YouTube, like how long has their account existed? What year was it made? Maybe 2020 or a bunch of information that is related to a user, but we don't need it here. Right now, we just care about a certain user and what profile picture they have and what's their username. That's all we care about. We don't care about all the other things that are included with a user resource. So with a REST API, if we have five comments for each of those comments, we want to get user information for the creator of that comment. We're going to end up fetching 
getting a lot of data that's not necessary. If only there was a better way for us to somehow specify that we only want the profile picture or we only want the username for that person. We don't want all the extra information. I guess what we could technically do with a REST API is add custom logic on our server to only get the exact fields that we want. But with this, we're going to have to be making a lot of server side changes every time we come across a similar problem like this with overfetching. With GraphQL, we can do exactly that though. For every single resource, we can specify exactly which fields of that resource we want. And then only those fields are going to be returned to the client. So what happens is the client gets only the data that it actually needs, exactly what it needs. So with this, we basically save some performance costs. We can send less data over the network and then our application will be faster. We won't be fetching unnecessary data. So this is the main problem that we can solve with GraphQL and the GraphQL APIs are very, very flexible. Another problem though is under fetching or you know, having to make multiple requests for a comment section. Like we have five comments and for each of those comments, we want the user information and we want the actual comment information itself. We want the body of that comment and we have you know a bunch of these. Now, let's say we list a bunch of comments, right? First, we have to get the video and then we have to list all the comments for that video. And then with each of those comments, we have to get the user profile picture and the username. So we have to make a bunch of consecutive requests. Wouldn't it be easier if we could group all of these in a single request? request and get all of the information that we need in a single request. Well, that's another problem that GraphQL solves for us. We actually have just a single endpoint with GraphQL, but there are two operations that we can do for GraphQL endpoints. One operation is query, AKA doing reading, any type of read operation where we don't modify any data on the server. The other uh, operation is a mutation. This is basically any time we need to mutate data or update data on the server whether it's a delete or an update or a post, like we're actually just creating a resource on the server, that would all fall under mutation. So in our case, when we wanted to get the videos, get the comments and get the user information for each of those comments, we could do that in a single query. So I think these are really the only high level points that you should keep in mind when it comes to GraphQL, unless of course you want to dive in further and actually develop some GraphQL APIs yourself. One last thing I'll mention before we get into a quick demo is that for GraphQL endpoints, they they are built on HTTP POST. POST requests are not item potent with HTTP. So the downside is that we can't cache GraphQL requests as well as we can, or as precisely as we can with HTTP or with REST APIs. But now let's take a look at a quick demo. GraphQL comes with pretty good tooling. This is actually GraphQL Explorer, and this is the SpaceX GraphQL API. This is just an example that I found. With GraphQL APIs, this is how a request is. Even though it's built on top of HTTP, we don't really see that portion. We don't see the HTTP aspect. We just see the query and the response. So here you can see we have a bunch of resources that we can query from SpaceX. We can get the launches passed and limit that to 10. So you can see we do have some type of pagination capability with GraphQL. And so as we kind of check these, I'm going to uncheck a few of them. Rocket here, I'm going to uncheck that. And that kind of took away the entire rocket. We can bring it back and then for an individual individual rocket, we can get even more precise. You can see here, we're asking for a rocket. This query here is basically telling the GraphQL endpoint, which resources do we want? We want the past 10 launches. We're limiting that. And then for each launch, we have some fields like the mission name, and we have the launch site and a launch site could have some other information for rocket here. I'm just going to uncheck everything except first stage. So here I'm just going to go ahead and uncheck everything for rocket. All we have is first stage, but here we get an error. We need to specify some sub fields so we can click on cores and then we get some more fields here maybe we don't care about the reuse count so we just keep status and we don't care about the flight either so we can pick exactly what we want maybe we don't need the extra data like missions maybe we do need the missions and we need the extra information like flight number and in addition to all of this we also need the ships we can get exactly what we want we don't need to build you know multiple rest api endpoints for each of these things we just have a single endpoint here where we can 
can query exactly what we need. There's also mutation endpoints. They are structured the same way in terms of the query, but they would actually be updating data on the server. We're keeping things at a pretty high level, so we're not getting super in depth into the syntax of this, but you can kind of tell that this syntax is pretty similar to JSON in the way that it's nested and that it's pretty flexible and open-ended. But unlike REST APIs, GraphQL actually does have a schema. Like here, this is the schema of the endpoint. We have launch pads available to us, but we can't just specify some arbitrary thing. We can't here ask for like a Tesla. This is SpaceX, so you know there's no Tesla field here, and we can't just manually add that. We have a schema that we have to follow. We can only choose what's available here. That's a difference from REST APIs, which operate typically on JSON, which is very flexible. We can pass anything into the body and get anything in the response. Now, gRPC is another way of creating APIs. It's also built on HTTP, but it's actually built on top of HTTP2. We sort of talked about how there's multiple versions of HTTP. We started out at 1.0, then 1.1, and then we got to 2, and then recently we got to 3. These are the high-level versions of HTTP. We won't be going in-depth into each of these. You don't really need to know it, but mainly I want to mention that gRPC is built on HTTP2 because it needs certain features of HTTP2, but but unfortunately, gRPC cannot be used natively from a browser. If you want to make requests from a browser using gRPC, you need a proxy. So typically gRPC web is what's used. There are other proxies. The reason that's the case, we can't use it directly from a browser, is that gRPC needs some fine-grained control over HTTP2, which browsers typically do not provide. So that's already a pretty big downside of gRPC. You can use it from a browser, but it's not as easy to do so. So typically gRPC is used for server to server communication. So if you had multiple servers here and they want to communicate with each other, that's what gRPC is for. And the reason it's beneficial is because performance wise, it is objectively faster and more efficient than REST APIs. And the biggest reason for that is instead of sending raw JSON, which JSON is just a string, we're just sending a string of characters when we send JSON with REST APIs. The benefit of gRPC is that it actually sends information in something called protocol buffers. These are essentially schema objects. Protocol buffers provide schema. REST APIs do not necessarily give schemas. JSON is not a schema, but protocol buffers, you can define a schema, exactly the type of data that a RPC endpoint will return. And these data objects are serialized into a binary format. So when we send data with gRPC, we are sending a smaller amount of data than we would be when we're sending REST APIs. And this is what makes gRPC just objectively faster than REST in almost all cases. And it's not only faster, gRPC is actually very, very powerful. Since it's built on HTTP2, it actually provides a lot of stuff that you need other protocols for. Like streaming, we can do a one-way streaming. We could be streaming data from the client to the server. We could also stream data from the server to the client. We could also do bi-directional streaming. Does this remind you of anything? Maybe WebSockets? It should because this is exactly what WebSockets can accomplish for us. You know, two-way communication, bi-directional communication, gRPC can actually do that. gRPC, like I said, is not a protocol, but we did kind of mention earlier that HTTP2 sort of makes WebSockets obsolete. This can get really, really confusing because, you know, we learned about WebSockets, but all of a sudden HTTP2 can do the exact same thing. Well, first of all, I want you to know that the vast majority of people do not actually know these facts that I'm teaching you. Most engineers don't don't know this, but I feel I should be responsible and tell you what's technically correct, but at the same time tell you what you actually need to know. This is technically correct, but you don't necessarily need to know that HTTP2 makes this obsolete. It's more about the trade-offs and understanding what we can accomplish with each technology. And when it comes to gRPC, it's very, very powerful and it's very fast. So what's the downside? Well, it's newer. It was created in 2016. It was actually created by Google and open source. The downside is that there's a lot less tooling around gRPC. It's a lot newer. It's a lot less standard.
standardized and it's definitely more difficult. Protocol buffers, while they are much faster, when it comes to development, they have schemas. Schemas can be kind of annoying. And with gRPC, you definitely need good tooling. We already talked about how it's difficult to use from a browser. If you're building an equivalent API, using gRPC would certainly take you less time than just using REST. REST is a lot more popular. It's a lot easier. And in general, just has a lot more community support. Also with gRPC, even though it's built on top of HTTP, we know HTTP does have status codes. So, you know, with a request and response, we know what happened, whether it was good or bad. With gRPC, we don't have that. We actually have error messages. gRPC does not really make use of the status codes of HTTP. You actually have to have your own custom error handling based on those error messages that you define server side. You have to handle that client side, however you decide. So these were a lot of the technical trade-offs. I'm going to talk a bit about the developer experience and we'll take a look at an example right now. So here's an example from the public Google Docs. This is an example of a protocol buffer schema. A message is basically a keyword which defines a schema. This schema is called a search request. It has three fields. One is the query field, and these fields are actually ordered. As you can see, query is the first field. Page number is the second field. The third field is results per page. Because this is going to be serialized and then deserialized into like a binary format with zeros and ones, it's not going to be human readable. So we do need to put the ordering of each of these fields because once it's deserialized, it will basically turn into an object in your programming language of choice. You know, you could be using any of these supported programming languages, Python, Go, Java, anything like that. And this protocol buffer will be converted into an object in your language. And this is Proto3 syntax. It's the most current version. And all of this would go inside of a .proto file. Now to actually create a gRPC API, you would again in a .proto file, you could you know define some messages, but you would define a service. In this case, we have a greeter service and we would create an endpoint, which we call an RPC, a remote procedure call. And this is the name of that RPC, say hello. It will be passed in some request, but that request remember has a schema. gRPC is all about the schemas. So this will accept a a hello request, which in this case is a very simple object. A hello request just has one field, which is a string, and it's called the name. And this RPC endpoint will respond with a hello reply. And a hello reply is also a very simple message in this case. But you can sort of see the power of this. When we pass in a request, we have a schema, a specified schema that we are to follow. And when we get a response, we're also getting something with a schema associated with it. We know exactly what we should expect with a response. And then of course, for this endpoint, we would implement our own custom logic, not in the proto file itself, but in your language of choice, like Java or Python. If you want to learn more in depth, I recommend following the docs or creating your own gRPC API. But at a high level, I don't think you're expected to have work every single technology, every single API paradigm, everything that we're going to discuss in the rest of this course. But the last thing I want to note here is that from a programmer's perspective, with REST, we were talking about resources. We were talking about videos and comments. There were not verbs associated with those resources. The HTTP method, whether it was get or post or delete, that indicated what action we were taking on a resource. With the gRPC here, you can see that every RPC, every endpoint has a action associated with it. A remote procedure call, an RPC is an action that we're taking. This is a function, say hello, is just a function that we're executing on another machine. So with RPC, we do have the verbs, the action that we're taking. It's not just a resource. We don't have those HTTP verbs, even though this is built on top of HTTP. We kind of don't care about those verbs anymore or the status codes. We're programming this in a way as if we're just calling functions locally, but these functions are actually executing on different computers. So that was definitely a lot that we covered. I want to emphasize that REST APIs are by far the most common and most important that you'll need to know, but I would recommend knowing at least a couple things things about GraphQL APIs and gRPC APIs, because these are definitely growing paradigms that have their own trade-offs. 
So next, I want to talk about the basics of API design. We know a few API paradigms, which basically allow us to control the interface of our API, the surface area, or you could also call it the API contract, which basically describes how we're going to use a particular API. We have some service. For example, this could be the Twitter API or the Reddit API or the YouTube API, anything. There's some functionality of an application. Let's assume this is Twitter. We want to do certain things with this. We want to maybe create a tweet or delete a tweet or edit a tweet. Well, you can't actually edit a tweet on Twitter, at least not until recently. So we're just going to assume that we can't do that. Or you want to see a list of tweets like for your home feed, or you want to like a tweet or retweet something, right? You can do all these things on Twitter. Now the API design portion is only about the actual surface area of the API, how we're going to interact with Twitter. Twitter, what we are going to do, what actions are we going to take, creating, reading, updating, that's basically CRUD. Pretty much most actions are going to be within the scope of CRUD, creating, reading, updating, and deleting some resources or entities. Entities are things, entities are nouns. In this case, a tweet is an entity. It's a thing that we're going to be interacting with. It's a resource. And the verb create is mainly going to be handled, I'm going to be focusing on rest. So it's it's mainly going to be handled with the actual verbs like get, post, put, delete, stuff like that. But if you were doing this with an RPC framework like gRPC, the verb itself would actually be included in the endpoint. But again, the important thing about API design is we do not care at all about the implementation details of the API. We only care about the surface area, what we are actually interacting with as users. API design is pretty similar to just coding in general, right? Like creating functions and each of those functions, you know, has some input output. We don't care about the implementation of that function, but we care about what are the parameters or arguments that go into a function and what do we get back after we create a tweet, we expect to you know, get a tweet in response to that, or maybe some error code telling us why it didn't work. But the reason API design is a really important topic in the real world is because with publicly facing APIs, we can't change stuff. Like let's say we have a, a method or an endpoint for creating a tweet. Let's say it looks something like this. If we wanna create a tweet, we have to give the user ID of the person creating the tweet and the actual text content of that tweet itself. So that's like our endpoint point for creating a tweet. Now, if we implemented this with a REST API, which is how Twitter and actually the vast majority of public APIs are implemented with REST, this is an example of what it could look like. It would be a post request because we're creating a resource on the server, passing in a few parameters here, but those aren't going to be included in the endpoint definition. This endpoint could accept, you know, a body and that body itself could have some key value pairs. Let's assume it's JSON because that's the most popular. It could have a few key value pairs, the user ID, and then the ID of that user, the content, which would map to, you know, the actual string text of that tweet that we're creating. So it really is just like, you know, object oriented programming or just creating an interface or an object or a class. It's not super complex, but we have to be really, really careful with this because this is a public API. Let's say these two parameters are required for our endpoint, and we want to make some changes to this, right? We want to add some more parameters that you can add to a tweet. If we were just just starting out with Twitter and we had this as our public API and all of a sudden we wanted to add some crazy feature like being able to reply to tweets. Like let's say this is a tweet and this is a separate tweet. You know, these can exist individually, but maybe this tweet is actually a reply to this other tweet over here. Well, how would we modify our create tweet endpoint? Well, we would have to pass in, let's say another parameter for the parent tweet possibly, right? And that would be, let's say parent tweet ID, right? The ID of the parent tweet that this child is a reply to. Well, this is actually okay. This is acceptable because we will make the parent ID optional. It is not required. So what that means, if now users want to create a tweet that's a reply, we can use this parameter to the create tweet endpoint. This will be passed in the body. It works perfectly fine. But also at the same time, all the people that are using the original create tweet endpoint, the one that didn't even have parent ID available that are just passing in two parameters, this will still work. The whole point of adding an optional parameter is that it is backwards compatible. The people using the older version will not break. But what if we added parent ID and 
we made this required, that means all the people using the original endpoint aren't passing this in currently. I mean, they could update their code maybe pretty easily to do this, but if we push these changes to our API, it will break literally 100% of the existing users until they update their requests to pass in another parameter. That's why we have to be very, very careful with API design. It's an important topic. Being backwards compatible is really, really useful. But of course, there are going to be some changes sometimes where we have to introduce new required parameters or we have to just change and redesign the entire API. In that case, we would not have a backwards compatible API. And that's when versioning comes in. Typically, most APIs will have some type of version associated with it. You know, this is an example where the first thing in our URL path here is the version of the Twitter API. Twitter has, I think, a couple APIs. They have version one, and this is kind of a common way of doing it. I think Twitter actually doesn't even have the V. They just have the version itself. Stripe, I think, does have a V, but you know, th that's a small detail. But the point is that the version of the API is important because now if we introduce a new version of this API, we will not break the original API. We'll have two versions of the API coexisting at the same time. Now, after a tweet is actually created, that tweet will have some information that we didn't necessarily pass in. A tweet is created server side, and we assume it'll be persisted to some database. But we, don't, like I said, we don't have to worry about the implementation details. We're just talking about the interface, the API contract. You pass in some parameters that are optional or required. You get back a tweet. Now, the tweet itself could look something like this. This is obviously really simplified. It could have a lot more, but every tweet is going to have some owner or user associated with it. Like the creator, I guess, would have been a better word for user ID here. But, you know, there's going to be some unique user who created the tweet. The tweet could also have an ID itself to uniquely identify it because, you know, a user is not enough to uniquely identify every tweet. But of course, this tweet ID, for it to be universally unique, it would have to be created server side. But this is an implementation implementation detail that we do not have to worry about because when we create the tweet, we do not have to pass in the tweet ID since it is created server side. That's all you really need to know. It's not going to be sent by the client who's actually creating the tweet. But the user ID though does have to be sent because only users can create tweets. The content will also be provided by the client, like what's actually included in the tweet. But the timestamp that it was created at, technically it could be created by the client if we really wanted to. And then on the server, we could validate that this time is reasonable like it happened you know at roughly the time that the request was reached by the server but probably not a good idea to have this because users should not be the one taking the timestamp at the time that the tweet was created at because it's created on the server side the server should be the one responsible for this created at time so we do not pass that in to our endpoint and the number of likes of course is going to be zero initially but we also don't pass that in when we're creating a tweet that will be handled server side but you know, tweets can be liked and unliked. So that is some additional functionality we'd have to include into our uh, API. Now, if we wanted to actually get and retrieve or read an individual tweet, obviously when we create a tweet, we get that as a response, but we should also be able to read tweets after they've been created. We should be able to read tweets that we ourselves have not created. So we'd have a very, very similar looking endpoint here. The URL is almost the exact same, but we have one additional parameter parameter. This is a URL parameter. That doesn't mean that the URL is going to be v1 slash tweet slash ID. This is a parameter. There's going to be some value that we put here, which is going to be a tweet ID associated with an individual tweet. A get endpoint would be to just read that tweet and all the information associated with it. We could also have had a delete endpoint, which would be responsible for deleting that tweet, but only if we are the actual creators of that tweet. So we would probably have to pass our user ID and probably some more additional authentication and authorization would go on in the back end. But that's something that's out of the scope of API design typically. Now, what if instead of getting an individual tweet, we actually wanted to list all the tweets for a particular user, just a single user, we wanna list all of their tweets. Well, a single user could have a lot of tweets. I mean, some people on Twitter just go crazy. They have thousands and hundreds of thousands of tweets. Pretty insane if you ask me, but it is something 
something we still have to handle. So of course, we don't necessarily want to return every single tweet in a single request. That might crash the user's browser, and it's pretty unlikely that they would want to see thousands and thousands of tweets. So we do what we kind of talked about, which is pagination. It's very, very important in API design to have pagination when you're listing a large amount of data. And it's basically handled with two parameters that we kind of talked about. One is limit. This is sort of the max size, the max number of results you want to be returned by an endpoint call. So for example, we could pass in list all of the tweets for a particular user, but limit it to just 10 tweets. Now, what if that user has 100 tweets? Well, we're only going to see the first 10. Maybe we're sorting it based on chronological order, right? Like based on the created at timestamp. But Possibly the user doesn't even have 10 tweets. What if they only have one tweet that just created their first tweet and we call our endpoint with limit 10, we're only gonna see a single tweet. So this is the maximum that we could retrieve. But now suppose we want to see 10 more tweets. We need a second parameter, which I call offset because it's pretty simple. It basically tells us what's our starting point. You know, we could be starting at zero. That would be the beginning, the first 10. If we're starting at 10, that means we want the next 10 after the first 10, or we could be starting at some arbitrary position like 2,500. Now we would definitely be listing a bunch of values using a get endpoint, but the thing about get is that there's no body for a get. We can't just pass in a bunch of stuff in the body of the get request. We have to take these and put them in the URL itself, either as URL parameters or as query parameters. But there's actually one problem. We can't reuse this endpoint definition because this is already reserved for getting an individual tweet. Given this path and some tweet ID, this should return a single tweet. Or maybe here we could actually have had, you know, multiple tweet IDs, but the point is that this is going to return a tweet. This ID is based on a tweet ID or multiple tweet IDs. But if we want all tweets for a user ID, we should probably create a different endpoint. We're going to have the get as the HTTP method, but we need a different path. So let's try to create one. So this is what an endpoint for actually listing tweets for a particular user could look like. So we have our base path here, you know, version 1.0, and then we have our users resource. So we're starting at the user user level, and then we're getting an ID. Usually we just have ID for short, at least I prefer to, but we could have also written here user ID to be a bit more specific, but typically ID is followed by the resource that it's applied to. So this ID applies to the user. And then after that, for a user, we have resources, AKA tweets. And from the tweets, we just want to list them. So this is, you know, what we're passing in just tweets, or we could have just have tweet here as well. But important thing is that this is so long, it takes two lines to fit. This is still a part of the original endpoint. And these are the query parameters. By the way, I forgot that this is a get endpoint, but we have a couple query parameters and these could be optional or they could be required. It's probably better to have this be optional because the default value, if we don't specify offset, the default value will probably be assumed to just be zero. We're starting at the beginning. If we don't have limit set, that doesn't mean that this should be limitless. That doesn't mean we need a hundred thousand tweets from a single endpoint call. This will be some default value something reasonable like 50 or 20, you know, something like that. So if we don't specify anything, it still works, but we can add additional query parameters that are optional. So users have more control. Also, before we take a look at the Twitter API docs and a couple other docs to see what real APIs actually look like, I want to discuss a couple things about REST APIs in general. First of all, we've been kind of writing our endpoints like this in coding interviews since, you know, it's more open-ended, like we could have been using gRPC. It might be better if your interviewer just allows you to kind of interface a endpoint just as a function, like, you know, the way we did with create tweets, and then that could have some parameters like user ID and some other stuff. And for actually defining entities like this, maybe just something like this works. With API design, that's really the big thing. Like what are the entities that we're actually talking about? We have tweets, we have users. Well, that's actually pretty much it, but we have a lot of relationships between these things. Like users can have tweets, users can like tweets, users can follow each other. We could have gone you know, pretty in depth into the API design of Twitter and we definitely would have only scratched the surface. But to kind of simplify this, usually instead of writing out the entire rest 
test endpoint, probably better to just kind of write it out as a function that takes in some parameters like a user ID, you know, stuff like that. And then it returns an entity like a tweet. So we get the kind of input output and we don't have to worry about the actual implementation details. And also you probably don't need me to tell you this, but when we make get requests, we probably shouldn't actually create resources in our API. Getting is only for reading. We don't want to create resources with a get request, pretty much as the name implies, but also because get requests are supposed to be item potent and they're assumed to be item potent. That means if we pass in the exact same input parameters to an API call, we will get the exact same result after the first call. That basically means that taking our very simple example where we're reading an individual tweet, like we pass in the tweet ID and we want to see all the contents of that tweet. If we call that endpoint once, we'll get the tweet. If we call it more times after the first time, it should not give us anything different. The tweet should not change as a result of get requests. They should be item potent. The reason that's important is for caching because by default, get requests are cached. So if we were misusing the get request, which we technically could, we could make a get request and the code on the server side could actually be creating stuff. Given a get request, we might end up updating some content of the tweet. We could technically do that. There's nothing stopping us from doing that, but it's very, very bad practice. You'll probably never do it. And this is a pretty obvious mistake to avoid, I think, but still definitely worth mentioning because I don't see a lot of people talking about this. Okay, now let's take a quick look at how the Twitter API is actually designed. So these are the Twitter API docs. You can see here, I'm looking at Twitter API version two. There are other versions, as you may have guessed. And there's a lot of stuff here. Like you could read this for a long time. There's a lot of details. We'll just be looking at a couple of functionalities. You can see here under manage tweets, we have a couple endpoints for updating a tweet here. This two is just the version. This means we're using Twitter API version two. And then we have a tweets path. So this would be added to like the base Twitter API, which I think is just API. Twitter. And you can see we don't need to pass in the tweet ID when we're creating one because that will be handled server side. But if we're deleting a tweet, we definitely need to pass in the ID of the tweet that already exists. Taking a look at how to post a tweet, you can see here we have the full endpoint URL. We have additional information about how this endpoint is rate limited. Like we wouldn't want a public user to be able to make a billion requests to this in a second that could crash the Twitter API. So we have some limit applied to it. In this case, it's 200 requests per 15 minute window. And we have some additional information about the API. Generally, if you're coding a public API, it's very, very, you know, important to have good documentation. In many cases, if you add good comments to your code itself, you can generate good public facing docs that are similar to this for every parameter. In this case, you can see since this is a post request to create a tweet, we will use the body of the request and it is formatted in JSON. That's the most common because it's very simple and readable. And these are kind of all the options that we could pass into the body. Most of these are optional pretty much all of them are, I think, which is pretty good for backwards compatibility. Now, taking a look at the timelines that we can actually create, there are a few. The simplest one, I think, in my opinion, is the actual user timeline. This is for a particular user. We want to see all the tweets that they have created. And you can see it's pretty much exactly like we talked about, where we start with the user's resource. And then for that user ID, we get all of their tweets. Taking a deeper look at this endpoint, you can see, of course, it's a get endpoint. So that means if there are parameters that we want to pass into this endpoint, we can't do that in the request body. We have to do it in the URL. So scrolling down, you can see that we have that single path parameter. This is the ID, but it's a user ID. And the other parameters are query parameters like we talked about. And we sort of talked about limiting the number of tweets that we see. We can see that there's a similar query parameter for that called max results. You can kind of read the description here. It looks like by default, it will display 10 tweets at the maximum if we don't specify any max results because this is optional. We don't have to specify it. And we talked about having an offset for keeping track of where we are. Like we've seen 10 tweets so far. Now we need 10 more, something like that. Instead of using offset, 
offset. In the real world, it's more common to have a pagination token. This token would be returned by the first request and it would basically keep track of how many tweets we've already seen. So we would take this pagination token and then pass it into the next request. And then we would get another new token in response. And we just keep using the most recent token to get more and more tweets. So we definitely covered a lot so far. I definitely want to encourage you to take a look at some of your favorite websites and take a look at their public APIs if they have any. Most social media sites have some. I think Twitter's is relatively simple. So I wanted to start with this API, but there's actually other APIs like this here is the Stripe API. It's very, very good documentation wise. I think these docs are easier to navigate and read because they're just more put together. But since Stripe is related to payments, it's not something that's easily as understandable as tweets, something that most people are familiar with, like a social media site. You have a lot of things like payment intents and things that you might not immediately understand unless you've actually used Stripe before. But there's some pretty cool things that you can learn. I definitely recommend, you know, reading through some public API docs. Like here, you can see something cool that Stripe did is they have these really large objects. This is a payment intent object. There's a lot of information and a payment intent is associated with a customer. So what Stripe does, it makes this customer field expandable. What that means is by default, this payment object will return some customer ID, but that customer ID could be expandable. That means when we make that request, we can basically choose to expand the customer object. That means instead of getting the customer ID, we would get the entire customer object. But if we don't need that, we shouldn't expand this. So this kind of gives us similar control that GraphQL does. We can choose multiple resources that we want, or we can choose to not include resources that we don't need. So while we covered a lot, we really only scratched the surface with API design, but I think this definitely gives you a really good foundation of what you should focus on. You want things to be backwards compatible. You want endpoints to be clearly defined and you don't want endpoints to conflict with each other. You want to provide pagination. These are really the core basics that you should have a good understanding of. Okay, so now let's talk about caching, which is a very, very important concept at all levels of software development. We already talked about how in a single computer we have our CPU and our CPU reads and writes from our RAM, which is definitely faster than reading and writing from disk. The downside, of course, is that RAM is not persisted. Disk is persisted. And of course, our CPU can read and write from its own cache, and that's the fastest. Our CPU can read and write from the cache much faster than it can read and write from RAM. The downside is that our cache can't store a ton of data. It can't store as much data as our RAM can, but it's a lot faster. So this is one example in a single computer, but caching is also used in distributed systems where we have lots of computers. But at its core, caching is essentially this. It's essentially taking a copy of data, which may already exist in RAM, for example, that data is here, but we also copy that data and put a subset of it in our cache because it's faster. We want to lower latency and we want to increase throughput because if it's faster to read and write from the cache, that means we can write more data. We can read more data at a much faster rate than we could with RAM and disk. And also when we're talking about, you know, multiple computers over a network, we can decrease the network cost because we'll be sending less data over you know shorter distances we'll take a look at a few examples of how that's done so now let's actually take a quick look at neatcode.io and back to our handy dandy network tab i'm going to show you something pretty cool so here i've searched for main we could you know undo that and what i'm going to do is refresh and i'm going to type in main because that's going to filter out the stuff we don't care about and it's going to leave us here with some javascript i click it, you can see that this is you know, neatcode.io slash main blah, 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 dot JS. So this is actually a JavaScript file that's running in your browser. So this JavaScript file is, you know, the code that I wrote, it gets bundled into a single file. And that's what kind of controls the functionality. Like if I, you know, click sign in over here, it opens up that dialogue. I click cancel, it closes it. That's part of what this JavaScript does. Now, the thing about it is that this is static content. What that means is it's going to be the same unless of course I make some code changes to the site this JavaScript is gonna be the same time like if I refresh this we're getting the exact same JavaScript 
file here, we're getting the exact same thing. It does not change. If I look at the response, you can see, you know, it's a bunch of, you know, JavaScript code. It's not super readable because it's been bundled and all that, but it stays the exact same. We could look at it a hundred times. It stays the exact same. So this would be a good use for caching. Since this JavaScript is not changing, we could cache it. We don't have to make an HTTP request like this to get that JavaScript every single time. So actually what our browser could do is we could cache this on our computer so that every time we load NeatCode.io, we don't have to make a network call to load this JavaScript. It'll automatically be saved to our computer. And that's exactly what's going on actually, because here you can see when I made that request, what was the size of the request? Well, it was cached, it's disk cached. We didn't have to send any data over the network because this was cached. Now I'm gonna do in the browser over here, I'm gonna click disable cache in the top left over here. So with cache disabled, now I'm gonna refresh one more time and we're gonna see what happens. Here you can see it took 265 kilobytes of data. It looks like it took about 0.1 seconds, so not super long, but now I'm gonna uncheck disable cache and we're gonna refresh one more time. And now you can see that it, you know this data was cached. It's already in our cache. Scrolling down, what sort of allows this is actually an HTTP header. I don't think we talked about this because you know there's so many headers but there's a header for caching it's called cache control we can have multiple values but in this case it says max age 3600 that basically means that this javascript can be cached for at most 60 minutes or aka 3600 seconds so when we're requesting this javascript we're not making a network request it takes eight milliseconds because we're reading from disk now if i disable the cache of course and refresh it it takes longer it takes 123 milliseconds because we we actually had to make a network call. And taking one last look at the HTTP headers, you can actually see that in the response header, there was actually a cache hit. That means that when we you know, looked in our cache for this data, this data already existed in our cache. Okay, so now let's go back to the drawing board and sort of summarize what we talked about and expand a bit upon it. From the perspective of our client, we have our own disk. It's you know a part of our computer. It's not like a separate database or anything, but we have our own disk storage. We have our persistent storage for our computer. In this case, our disk is actually our cache. Now, we kind of already talked about at the beginning, disk is slower than RAM, which is slower than, you know, the CPU cache. So why would we use disk if it's the slowest of all of them? Well, disk is still much faster than sending data over a network. You know, sending data over a network takes in the order of 0.1 second up to, you know, multiple seconds, like three seconds. But reading a disk, especially if it's a small amount of data, is much, much faster on the order of milliseconds, as we saw earlier. So what's happening here is we're sending a request to the server, and then we get some JavaScript back. It could be JavaScript, it could be HTML, it could be CSS, it could be some kind of content that's not changing. That's very important. It has to be static content. And then when we retrieve that JavaScript, the client throws it into the cache. And then, you know, before the client makes another request for the same data, it's going to check the cache. Does the data already exist? Yes, it does. And it hasn't expired yet. So if it does exist, that's called a cache hit. That means we looked in the cache and the copy of the data was already there. The opposite is a cache miss. I'm sure you can kind of guess what that is. We look in our cache, but that data is not there, or maybe it's expired. The data is stale. That means, you know, the data, the max age of the data would have already expired. So if the data is stale, then we would have to send another request. That would be a cache miss. We'd send another request to the origin server. And then when we get the data back, we throw that data into our disk and save it for later. Now, there's also the concept of a cache ratio. That's basically the total number of hits divided by the number of hits plus the number of misses. So basically what percentage of our cache reads are actual hits? Like how many times do we look in the cache and actually find what we need? Obviously we'd prefer the cache ratio to be higher rather than lower. Now this is just one example of caching. There are many, many others. We pretty much try to use caching wherever we possibly can because it speeds things up a lot. It's a pretty simple strategy that can be really, really powerful, but things can get more complex. Let's take a 
look at another example. We saw an example of caching from the client's perspective, but what about the server's perspective? If we have a massive amount of data, let's take Twitter for example, like every time we create a tweet, our server is gonna take it and throw it into a database. So we haven't talked a lot about databases, but for now let's assume that our database is implemented with disk because that's usually the case. Data for a database is stored on disk, but we're also going to have some type of key value store that's implemented on top of memory, something like Redis. I know we haven't you know, talked about databases or Redis yet, but Redis is pretty commonly used for caching. It's sort of like a database, but it's implemented with memory. And of course we know that memory is much faster than disk, but it's not persisted like disk is. And typically we can't store as much data in memory. So we have this use case of we're going to create tweets, which are going to be stored on disk. And then when a user wants to list some tweets or read an individual tweet, possibly by tweet ID, just to keep things simple, let's say we're getting a tweet by tweet ID. Now our server, what's it going to do? It wants to do things as quickly as possible, but there are a lot of tweets. So we could search the database for that particular tweet and then return it. Now that's, you know, the most basic way to do it, but that's pretty slow. We can add Add caching to this backend solution. We can use a in-memory store like Redis, where what we do is take a subset of the data. So in this case, what our server would try to do is it would first check the in-memory store. Does that tweet exist in the in-memory store? Nope, it doesn't. So then we have a cache miss, but that's okay because now what we're going to do is read from disk. We're going to get that particular tweet. We're going to return the tweet to the user, but now we're also going to store that tweet in memory. So now the next time somebody asks for that same tweet, we're going to look again. We're going to check memory. We're going to see it's there. That's a cache hit. And presumably people are going to go on Twitter, but not every single tweet needs to be read. I mean, the vast majority of tweets probably aren't read by people. And I'm not just talking about my tweets, but there probably are a smaller number, a small subset of the tweets stored on disk, maybe by Ariana Grande or somebody like that, you know, really popular tweets. And that subset of tweets can probably fit in memory, or at least a portion of them can. These are the tweets that a lot of people are going to be reading. So a lot of requests are going to come to our server to read that small subset of really, really popular tweets. So even though our in-memory cache is much smaller than our disk, since the vast majority of people read that small portion of really popular tweets, this actually speeds up our server's performance a lot and also increases our throughput. You know, maybe read Reading from disk, we can only read like a thousand or maybe 10,000 reads per second from disk, but from memory, we can do a lot more, typically a hundred thousand reads per second from memory. So this is much faster and much more powerful. This can scale much higher. Now this isn't the complete picture because there's actually several different algorithms we can use in caching that can accomplish different things. First of all, this simple caching strategy that we talked about is actually actually called right around. So right around caching is basically when we write to, you know, our storage, like writing to our server, we actually skip the cache entirely. We just write the data to, you know, our primary storage. We skip the cache and write to storage, in this case, disk. And then when we want to read, we will make some read request. We'll check our cache. Data is not there initially, right? So we expect there to be a cache miss the first time we try to read some data, and then we'll find it on disk, throw it in the cache and return it to the user. That's very basic. It's right around cache. It you know, guarantees that there's going to be a significant number of cache misses. But at the same time, we're not going to put anything in the cache unless it's actually being read because we know there's going to be millions of people creating tweets. We definitely don't need to put a tweet in memory every time it's created. Because like I said, the vast majority of tweets, mine included, don't really get a lot of people seeing them. Another caching strategy is write through cache where we're you know creating some resource like a tweet we immediately write it to the cache 
and you know after that we write it to the primary storage like disk in this case this is even more simple but it probably depends on the application if we actually want everything to be cached you know when it's initially created and we have another strategy called write back caching which is sort of a much faster way of doing things when possible but it can be less reliable and cause some inconsistency it's a pretty lazy way of doing things in this example when we create a tweet we would throw it into memory so that would be fast we would put it in our cache and we would actually skip the disk so just creating a tweet would be very very quick and then we could you know respond to the user okay we're done we didn't even have to you know do anything with disk and then next time somebody reads that tweet we immediately go to our cache it's there and then return it so this is really really simple it's basically ignoring the existence of our disk i wish we could do that but we can't because we have disk for a reason it's for persistent storage so what would happen if our server crashed then all the data here would not have been written to disk. So what we do is a sort of lazy way. We take the data and periodically dump it to the disk. So we'll take all the data that was recently written to our cache and then copy it to the disk periodically. This can be fine if you're fine with some amount of data loss, but you probably wouldn't want to do this with Twitter because, you know, let's say you create a bunch of tweets, they're in memory and the server crashes. Well, they never got saved to disk so we would lose those tweets permanently we don't want this to happen so we probably wouldn't use write back caching in this scenario but there are cases where losing some small amount of data won't be the end of the world maybe when it comes to liking and disliking tweets maybe that's you know not as important so we can use caching for that and make things go a lot faster we can use write back caching so this is a very fast strategy but you know it won't work in all cases it depends on your use case you have to look at the design of the application. What kind of data loss are you willing to tolerate? Okay, so now let's talk about eviction policies. We need eviction policies because, like I said, our memory or our cache is limited in size. We can't store, you know, an infinite amount of data in our cache. So sometimes we reach the limit, like we fill up our cache. In this example, at least, we filled up our cache, but we want to read some tweet. So we check our cache. The data is not there. Then we check disk, we find the tweet. So then we return it to the user and then we also write that tweet to memory. But since our cache is full, we have to decide what piece of the cache, what data in the cache are we going to remove? Are we going to remove this portion of the cache? Are we going to remove this portion? You know, another portion? We have to decide and we could do it randomly, sure, but probably there are some more intelligent ways of doing things to maximize the cache hit ratio, right? That's what we want to do. We want every request, if possible, to have been cached. We want to never read from disk if we don't have to. Well, there's many different eviction policies to choose from. I'll quickly go over some of the most popular ones. I mean, of course, there's random them, usually not the smartest. There is another very simple one called FIFO. You're probably familiar with this if you're familiar with the concept of queues or, you know, those types of data structures. FIFO is first in, first out. So just like a line, like the data that was added to the cache, we added, you know, one piece of data, another piece of data and more. These had an order that they were added in. And when it's time, like let's say this is our cache and we filled up the cache, we have to choose what to remove. We're going to remove the first one that was added and then add a new piece to the end of it. And we would continuously uh, remove just like that. If we had to remove again, we'd just remove from the beginning. First in, first out. What was first added to the cache is going to be the first one that gets removed. Now, this probably wouldn't be really useful for Twitter if, you know, the first tweet added was made by, you know, some really popular celebrity. And that tweet is being read by hundreds of thousands of people. Just because it was the first one added to the cache doesn't mean it should be removed if people are still wanting to read that tweet. So there are better ways than FIFO. A couple of them are called LRU and LFU. So LRU stands for least recently used. So going back to our example, let's say we're adding a few things to our cache. We add one, two, three, and now let's say our cache is 
full. So which one are we going to remove? Well, it's pretty similar to FIFO first in first out, but instead we're going to be removing the one that was least recently used. Let's say that this one was added first and then this one was added second and this one was added third and then none of them were read after that. So this is the order that they were read in as well. So which one of these would we want to remove? Well, this one was the one that was least recently read, so we would remove this one. But let's assume that these are the order that they were added in, but then uh, somebody makes a request to read a tweet, and let's say this is the tweet that they want to read. So what we would do is move this to the end over here. So now this one is the most recently used. So now if we're adding another tweet, let's say we're creating a tweet, we're adding a fourth one here, which one of these are we going to remove? The one that was least recently read, and that's going to be the one all the way at the right. So, you know, we'd remove this one. So it's a pretty simple algorithm conceptually. In our previous example, where if we had like a really, really popular a tweet that's being read a lot. So let's say this is that tweet. So if this tweet is being read a lot, it's going to keep getting pushed to the end over here, meaning it was recently read. So then we're never going to remove from this side. We'd only remove from the beginning the ones that were least recently used. So LRU would definitely be better if there was a single person with a really, really popular tweet. We don't want that tweet to leave our cache. So LRU would be helpful for that. Now there's another popular algorithm called LFU. This is least frequently used. So in that case, you can kind of think of it as a bunch of key value pairs. So our key is going to be, you know, the tweet itself. And then the value of that tweet is going to be the number of times that tweet was read. So how frequently was it used? So, you know, maybe tweet X was used 10 times, tweet Y was used four times, and tweet Z was used 12 times. And now maybe we're adding a fourth tweet. So now let's say we want to add tweet A and, you know, initially, its red count is going to be zero. That's perfectly fine. But we only have three spots, but we have four tweets now. So before we actually add this to our cache, we would remove one of these three. Which one are we going to remove? Well, with LFU, we're going to take the one that's least frequently used. So the one with the smallest count is Y. So we'd remove why? This wouldn't be a bad algorithm for Twitter either, actually, because the most popular tweets are going to stay in the cache, but we still allow new tweets that are possibly less popular to be added to the cache. And if those tweets, you know, are read a lot, they will increase in their frequent count and therefore they won't be evicted. But if this tweet was never read by anybody, it would be the first one that we evict if we wanted to add another tweet to the cache. But overall, I think in Twitter's case, we would probably prefer LRU cache because there could be some really, really popular tweets like this one that has a really, really high frequently used count, but maybe it stopped. Like maybe this was a really popular tweet from a celebrity a year ago and it reached a really, really high cache hit count. But after a while, like maybe after a week or something, nobody really read that tweet again. Well, with LFU, it would stay in our cache because the used count, the cache hit count is so high. So with LFU, we don't even care how recently was this used. We just care about the total count. So probably in Twitter, since tweets get old and people don't read old tweets a lot, we would probably prefer LRU in this case. So while there are a lot of details when it comes to caching, there's so many different implementations of it. At the core, it's pretty simple conceptually. We're trying to speed things up and we're willing to make some trade-offs to achieve that. We're willing to sacrifice some consistency. And while we covered a lot today, we're actually not done with caching. We're going to continue to be discussing it because it's such an important topic. So now let's talk about content delivery networks or CDNs for short. CDNs are a way that we can cache data closer to end users so that we don't have to make requests across the entire world. I just realized this picture with our client being so close to the origin server isn't good. I'm going to move this. Okay, so now our client is over here. They're a little bit farther from the origin server, but they're still, I guess, floating in the water over here. Let's assume they're on a cruise or something like that, maybe on a plane. Here you can see we have a bunch of servers distributed around the world. One of these is the origin server and the rest of these are CDN servers. The idea, as I said, is to bring the content 
closer to the end user. So we might have our all our servers in a single region in the world somewhere, but our users are probably all around the world. So we'd like for all our data to be as close to users all around the world as possible in every region. Now here I've drawn it pretty simplified. We only have a single origin server and about five CDN servers. In reality, we could have hundreds or thousands of CDN servers all around the world. So they really should be pretty close to the end user, at least the majority of our end users. The downside though, is that we can't put everything on CDN servers. CDN servers are pretty dumb. We can only put static content that is not changing. We can't have application code running on the CDN servers. There's sort of a new thing called edge servers that are being worked on right now and being introduced. These are newer, so we won't be covering them. They can actually allow you to run code on sort of like CDN servers, on servers that are distributed around the world close to end users, but that's kind of beyond the scope of this. And this is a very, very new development, so we're going to not be covering that for now. So if we can only put static content in CDNs, then what's the point? What kind of static content would we actually do anyway? Well, sort of what we talked about earlier was the JavaScript. In the caching example, we talked about how that JavaScript is not changing. For every user, it's going to be the exact same. And unless I actually update the original code, the user is fine to access one of the CDN servers. So that JavaScript that we looked at in the last lesson actually is hosted on a CDN because it's not changing. It doesn't need to hit the origin server every single time. But there's actually all kinds of static content like images or videos. Videos aren't changing. Images aren't changing. If people want to see a picture of the Eiffel Tower, for example, it's going to be the same for everybody. We don't need it to be on the origin server where we're running code. It's okay to put copies of that image everywhere around the world so that when a user wants wants to access that image, they don't have to go all the way to the origin server. That image is already on a CD and they can travel a much shorter distance to get that data. So it's faster and it lowers the demand on our origin server. We're distributing the data in CDN servers, which decreases the latency because it's a much shorter distance, but it also increases the availability because what if one of these CDN servers goes down? It's okay. We can go to the next closest CDN server. So we increase the reliability and the availability of our entire system. Now there's a couple different types of CDNs. We can have a push CDN or a pull CDN. So let's say we're building an application. Let's say Twitter, for example, we have our server that's going to be handling requests like creating tweets, deleting tweets, and doing all kinds of stuff. Now, one component of a Twitter profile is the profile picture, right? It's an image. So this can be hosted on a CDN. This image is static, it's not going to be changing unless a user changes their profile picture. So what we're going to do with a push CDN is as a user uploads this image, it's going to be on our origin server, but we're also going to actually spread it out. We're going to push this data to every single CDN server immediately after it's been added to the origin server, because now we've split it up. And when clients access it from anywhere in the world, clients will be reaching the closest CDN server. They don't have to go to the origin server. So that's pretty simple. Now, pull CDNs are a bit different. It's more similar to the traditional caching example that we looked at because with this, if a user uploads a profile picture, it will be on the origin server. We're not going to immediately push it to all the CDN servers. With pull, a user is going to make a request and maybe they load somebody's profile and they want to see that little you know circle profile picture at the top left of that user. Well, first they're going to hit the closest CDN server. They're going to check is that profile picture already cached at my nearest CDN server? No, it's not. So then the CDN server is going to act as a proxy. I know we haven't you know, gone super in depth into that, but this is an example of a proxy. The CDN on behalf of this user is going to say, well, this is a cache miss. I got to find that image. I'm going to go to the origin server. It must have the image if it exists. And then the origin server is going to return it to the CDN. And then at that point, the CDN will cache the image and then this user will be returned that image, of course, but then any other user close to this CDN that's making requests to the CDN will also get that image. And the next time a user requests it, it will be a cache hit because now the CDN has that data. But at the same time, maybe users in the other side of the world over here, they don't care about that same profile picture. Like people in this side of the world, maybe they don't even care. They 
never request that same profile picture. So we never had to push that image to all these other servers on the other side of the world because it wasn't necessary. Users over here, maybe they do access the CDN, but they don't look for that exact same profile picture. So this CDN server will only have the copies of data for users around it that are actually using that data. We don't want unnecessary data. So a poll CDN would be better if users around a certain regions of the world have different interests and they're using different data of the origin server. So at a high level, CDNs are this idea of moving data closer to end users, just like how in farming, maybe certain countries can farm a lot of bananas, but then those bananas are shipped to end users, aka grocery stores, where people actually can just drive down to the grocery store and buy some bananas. They don't have to go across the entire world where bananas are actually grown. Now let's take a look at a quick example. Let's go to twitter.com and once again, opening up the dev tools, though this time we're going to actually be looking at the elements tab because we want to see the HTML. So scrolling pretty much all the way down, you can see that Twitter is actually using a CDN, a content delivery network. Now what this is for, it looks like it looks like it's some JavaScript and it's for handling Apple authentication. I assume it's for this sign up with Apple functionality that they have. And I'm actually going to copy this URL, this Apple URL and open it in another tab. So opening it, you can see that this is just some JavaScript code. It's created by Apple. It's not very readable, but it's just code and it's static code. So we can assume that this is not going to be changing very often. Every user who loads twitter.com is going to be loading this JavaScript. So while Twitter could take this JavaScript and create a copy of it and then host it on their own servers, or they could have installed that package, assuming there's a package for this, they could have installed it and hosted it on their own server. But it looks like they're using a content delivery network that's provided by Apple so that every time a user opens up twitter.com, they don't have to load this JavaScript from Twitter's server. They can load it from a content delivery network server that's much closer to their own location. So going back to our drawing really quickly, assuming this is Twitter's server, we have to hit that server to, let's say, load twitter.com. Maybe there's no way around it. We have to load our own profile page and we have to log in and do all that stuff. So we do have to interact with Twitter's server. We have to go this entire distance. But if there's some data like images and JavaScript and Apple authentication stuff that can be hosted, not on the origin server, we can create copies of it, static copies, and put them all around the CDN to access that portion of data. We can just go to the CDN. So we're basically taking a large amount of data here, breaking a piece of it off. We could have hosted this data all in the origin server, or we can create little copies of it and put it all around the world in CDN server. So now we have a smaller amount of data that has to travel this entire distance. And a little bit of that data will be moved closer to every end user, regardless of where they are around the world. We do this because it's possible and it speeds things up. If we could do that with the entire data, we definitely would, but we can't because there's going to be some stuff over here on the origin server that's not static. It's different for every single user. Every time a user opens up the page, they see something different. That almost always happens when we have authentication, right? Everybody logs in and they see a different experience. They see a different feed. They see different content. That's what this is about. Now, quickly going back to the dev tools, I went to the network tab and I typed in CDN and then we saw this Apple ID JavaScript that we looked at in the elements tab earlier. There's one last quick thing I wanted to show you. It has to do with that Ash control header that we talked about earlier. So this time you can see that the cache control does have multiple values. There's max age, so 86,000 seconds and some other stuff. But I want to focus on this public value. Cache control can have multiple values for the visibility. It can have nothing here, which we saw in the last lesson. It can be private or it can be public as well. Public means that this data, this JavaScript is allowed to be cached on other servers that don't include the user's browser. So if there's some middle layer server, which in our case there is, there's a content delivery network, this JavaScript can be cached by the CDN. That's what this public specifies. If this was private, that's basically indicating that this should not be cached by a CDN server. In that case, the CDN would not cache 
this JavaScript. But in this case, it's perfectly fine for it to it's public. And that's the idea. This would be relevant when we're talking about pull CDNs, where from the client, we make a request to the CDN server, the CDN server doesn't have the data, then we make a request to the origin server, it does have the data, it returns it to the CDN server. And then the CDN server sees in the HTTP header that cache control is public. Okay, great, I'm going to cache that thing. And then anytime a user needs it, then I'm going to give it to them immediately without having to go back to the origin server. So I know we talked about a lot of things when it comes to caching and content delivery networks, but if you can understand this very basic high level use case that moving data closer to users is faster, that is the most important part of all of this. So next, let's talk about proxies and load balancers. And these are really, really big topics to be covering in a single video. But the good thing is we actually already know more about these than you might think. And also as developers and you know system designers, we actually don't need to go super in depth into these topics. But if you're interested, I would recommend doing so because it can get pretty interesting, but you know, pretty complicated and very nuanced. First, let's talk about proxies. There's two main topics types of proxies. Let's start with forward proxies. And sometimes proxy just implies forward proxy. If somebody just says, you know, proxy, they probably mean forward proxy rather than reverse proxy, but not always, which can get confusing. So if we are clients and we are trying to make a request, you know, to some server, but we have a middle server in between. So this middle server in this case would take our request and then forward it to the actual server on our behalf. And not only that, but it would actually act as a user. It would be the middle layer that would do the workforce. It would actually hide the client from the destination server. So, you know, let's say we make a request that has our IP address in that request, right? We know that's just how the internet protocol works. But having a middle layer is like having a friend that's going to do something on your behalf. Like you have to, you know, send some information somewhere and then somebody in between like the mailman or something does it for you. Maybe that's not the best analogy because, you know, with mail, your address and stuff is still on the envelope. But the idea here is that the middle layer, the proxy will hide the user and protect their identity. But since this middle layer is handling that traffic, this can be used for other things as well. Like for example, maybe your country or your computer or, you know, something with your network is not allowed to access this server. Well, but you are allowed to access the proxy server. So what the proxy does is for you, since you're not allowed to directly go to the origin server, you can't do that. The proxy server does it for you. It will go to the server on your behalf and then respond to you. So it'll bypass that restriction. A forward proxy can also block things like on a corporate network or on a school network. It's pretty common to have all devices that are connected to that corporate network go through some proxy. Now, maybe if you try to access some site that you're not allowed to, like sometimes corporate networks will actually block YouTube, which is kind of frustrating, I think. But your corporate network, your corporate proxy could say, hey, you're trying to go to YouTube. Nope, not going to let you do that. All traffic goes through the proxy proxy and the proxy decides it sets rules that can block access to certain sites and certain resources. So a real world example of a forward proxy would be, you know, just like a corporate proxy, like I talked about, or sort of a VPN, right? That's a very natural thing because VPNs hide the original user from the server. They hide your IP address. You can act like you're from a different country and all that kind of stuff. Now, moving on to reverse proxies. So the simplest way to describe a reverse proxy is is that instead of hiding the client or the user, which is what happens with a forward proxy, a reverse proxy actually does not hide the client, but it hides the destination server. Like as a user, we make requests to this server, but this server is actually not the one handling our request. We, this middle layer, this reverse proxy is actually taking our request and with all the information that it includes, like the IP address and everything, which it doesn't necessarily have to do, but usually it does. And then it takes that request and forwards it to some other server. And then that server fulfills the request. It goes back to the reverse proxy and then the reverse proxy sends it back to the client. But the important thing here is that 
unlike with a forward proxy, the client actually does not even know about the existence of the destination. It just knows that this reverse proxy exists. Everything we do goes through the reverse proxy and then we get something back. We don't even know about the existence of all the other servers. And the server though will probably know about the existence of the client, not necessarily, but usually that's the case. And at a high level, it's really that simple. Now, what is an example of a reverse proxy that you can think of? Well, we actually talked about it recently. CDNs, right? Do you think a CDN is a forward proxy or a reverse proxy? Well, as users, we directly go to the CDN. Like that's our cache. That's where we're going to try to read data from. But possibly that CDN will make a request to another origin server that we don't even know the existence of, right? And we don't care about it. We just interact with the reverse proxy with the CDN. And then the CDN maybe will go to the origin server, get the origin server, cache the data, and then send it back to the client. But the point is, we don't know about the existence of this. The reverse proxy, the CDN abstracts this away from us. We don't have to worry about that. Now, another popular example of a reverse proxy is actually a load balancer. That's what we're going to spend the rest of this lesson talking about. Load balancers are very, very important, but luckily for us, conceptually, they are pretty simple, though implementing them would not be super straightforward in the real world because there's a lot of like networking details involved with that. So a load balancer is a type of reverse proxy where a user is going to make requests which are going to hit the load balancer first. But we have multiple servers. Reason being that we have a lot of user traffic that we have to handle. A single server can't handle all that traffic. So we actually have multiple servers, you know, doing the same thing. Let's say all of these are running the exact same application, the exact same API or whatever. What we want to do is horizontally scale the servers, which is exactly what we're doing. And we want to distribute the traffic evenly among all the servers, aka we want to balance the load of, you know, user traffic. So conceptually, that's it. Like that's what a load balancer is for. And in terms of system design interviews, this is pretty much what people mention. And it's almost laughable in my opinion, because, you know, load balancers are super complicated. Yet in interviews or in discussions, we just say, you know, I'm just going to throw a load balancer in front of it and then horizontally scale the those servers, presumably they're implemented with REST, which allows them to be, you know, scaled. They're stateless, let's say. So that's great. And now how exactly do we distribute that traffic evenly? Well, there's many algorithms to do it. The most simple is probably round robin, which as the name implies, we go round robin. We go, you know, in a cycle, the first request will hit the first server. The second request will hit the second server. The third will hit the third server. And then the fourth request will start all over. We'll go back to the first, we'll go back to the second, then the third, and just go in cycles just like that. So this will mean that each of the servers will get an even amount of traffic. Now, a problem could be that one of the servers is less powerful than the other ones. Like we have a hundred servers. Some of them maybe just happen to be less powerful. In that case, we would have a variation of round robin, which is called weighted round robin. Maybe this server is, you know, a 10 and this server is a five and this server is also a five. Or, you know, in terms of percentages, this server should get 50% of the traffic. This server should get 25% and this one should also get 25%. So in that case, we would round the requests like this. The first request goes to the first server. The second request also goes to the first server. Then the next one goes to the second and then the next one goes to the third. So since this server is twice as good as the other two, we expect it to be able to handle twice as many requests. So if this one got four requests, these other ones would get two requests each. Now there's many other ways we could also do this. We could load balance based on the number of least connections. That's another strategy. We get a request and we route it to the server that has the least number of connections. Like with round robin, just because we're evenly distributing the requests, maybe some requests just you know take longer to process. Maybe this first request asked for a lot of data, so it takes you know a bunch of computation to do that. Maybe even though it was first, it takes longer to process. Like this second request is finished, and then we're making another request. Where should we route it? Well, this server is already taken. It has a connection, so we send that to this server, which does not have a connection. So this is low load balancing based on the server that has the least number of connections. So that's another valid strategy. If these servers are located in different locations, we could also, you know, load balance 
based on user location. Maybe this server is in North America. That's where the client is. So we route the request to this server. Maybe, you know, this server is in Asia. This server is in Europe. And if European users are accessing the site, we route those requests here. Asian users, we route those requests to this server. There's another variation that we'll probably talk about later on, which is called hashing. So we actually take that user request and use some field, possibly the IP address or the actual content of what the user is requesting. And we take a hash of that or maybe hash the user ID. We could do anything, but hashing has its own benefits that we'll be discussing later on. I also want to quickly mention, but not go super in depth into this. There are a couple types of load balancers, layer four and layer seven. Layer four is at like a lower network layer. You can think of this as being the TCP layer. This is the transport layer. And layer seven is the application layer. You can think of HTTP, like an HTTP server is the load balancer here. Now, the benefit of a layer four load balancer is that it's typically going to be faster because all we do is look at the IP address to, you know, determine how to balance. So we could use, you know, location based balancing, or we could just use round robin, but we can't really be smart because with TCP layer, we don't actually have access to the application data. We can't, you know, decrypt that. We can't see exactly what resource is the user using. So while this is faster, it's less flexible with layer seven load balancers, we can can look at the application data. Maybe one of these servers is handling certain types of resources. Maybe this server is all about tweets, for example. Maybe this server is all about the user profile. And the third server is all about authentication or, you know, I'm just making this stuff up, but they serve different purposes. With a layer seven load balancer, we could intelligently route user requests. We could see a request and see it's based on tweets. It's related to tweets. So we'd route it to this server. Another request could be related to authentication. We'd route that request here. So layer seven is more powerful, but since it's layer seven, we'd have multiple connections. Like we'd have a TCP connection established here and another one established over here. So it's more expensive because we are going to be decrypting every request request and then creating a new request. Whereas layer four, we'd actually just be taking a request and then forwarding it to another server. We're not doing anything with the application data. We're just taking the IP address of that request and its destination was this server, but we're going to replace that IP address with one of these servers, IP addresses and just forward it there. And then when we get the response back, we just return that response back to the client. This is a very high level overview. Most likely the distinction between layer four and layer seven won't come up at all. But simply put, layer seven is faster, but less flexible. Layer seven is slower, but much more powerful. Now you might be wondering if we just have a single load balancer like this one, what happens if this load balancer goes down? This is sort of a single point of failure. Yes, we horizontally scaled our server. So we increase the availability, increase the reliability. If one of these goes down, it's okay. We can still route requests to these other servers. Load balancers are capable of doing that. But what if the load balancer itself goes down. Well, in that case, the easiest thing to do would be to have multiple replicas of the load balancer. So we'd actually have multiple load balancers and then you know user requests would be going to each of those load balancers. Or maybe we just have a backup load balancer. And if this one goes down, then requests would be routed to the other. Typically, load balancers can handle a very, very large amount of traffic and handle really, really high throughput. So it usually doesn't come up that a load balancer would be over overloaded because they're not actually doing anything. Typically, they're just forwarding the request to other servers. But if you're really, really interested in load balancers, I'd consider reading a paper by Google. You can search for maglev. It goes a bit more in depth into how load balancers can be implemented. And if you're looking for some open source implementations, the most popular one is Nginx. It's a very popular open source load balancer, and it can be used for a lot of other things as well. It's really, really powerful. There's a good chance you've already heard of it. But in the open source world, if you're going to be implementing your own load balancer, you're probably using um, Nginx, though it's a lot more easier to just use a load balancer provided by a cloud provider like AWS or GCP. That's much more common because these are you know pretty hard to implement because these are really, really powerful. And if you can get it out of the box, that's probably preferred.
So now let's talk about consistent hashing. And actually going back to our load balancer example, let's just talk about basic hashing for now. We talked about how we can balance user requests a pretty simple way using round robin, just going in order from all the servers and then just cycling through all of them. Another way we briefly mentioned, we can actually use hashing to balance the requests to the servers. In this case, we have three servers and let's say we want to hash based on the user's IP address. Like we have to take user requests and hash them in such a way that they land at some server. And an IP address is some integer value. We're going to oversimplify this. Let's say one person's IP address is six. So we can take that IP address and mod it. This is a math function, basically taking the remainder of six after dividing it by the number of servers that we have. We have three servers. So we mod six by three, we get a remainder of zero. So we know that this IP address six should be mapped to server zero. Well, which one of these is server zero? Let's just label them like this zero, one, two. So an IP address of six is always going to be routed to this server. And if we took an IP address of seven, we would get a remainder of one. So it'd be routed to this server. If we took an IP address of eight, it would be routed to this server. And assuming that the IP addresses are roughly uniform, which they probably will be, we can assume that this is a pretty basic way of balancing the load between the servers. Now, one benefit of this hashing approach compared to round robin, the same user with the same IP address address of six will always be routed to this server, even if this server is not the one with the lowest amount of traffic. But what could possibly be the benefit of this user always going to this server? Well, if our servers are REST APIs and they're stateless, then it doesn't really matter because whether this user goes to this server or this server, it doesn't matter. The servers are identical. There's no difference between any of them. But what if each of the servers had some little Redis cache attached to it. And this is not a shared cache. I'm talking like this is a Redis in memory cache so that it belongs to the server. If they all had a shared cache that they were all talking to, that would be different. But each of them has their own individual cache. And let's say that these servers are not stateless. They are caching something for the users that they're getting. But this server would only be caching the requests for this user or any other users that are routed to it. And this server is never going to cache anything for user seven because those requests don't go to this server. They go to another server. So this works with hashing. But if we were doing round robin, sometimes user six would end up going to this server and then maybe we'd cache some information for them. Great. But then that same user might go to another server the next time they make a request. So then this server would check the cache. Well, I don't have anything. So I'm gonna have to reprocess all that work. But if that request had instead gone to this server, it would have already seen the data in the cache. So hashing is is more suited if we want user requests to be mapped consistently, right, to the same server. We want an individual user to be mapped to the same server because then we can do more complicated things like caching at that server level. And this is where, as you can guess, consistent hashing comes in. So while this very basic hashing approach is a good start, it doesn't solve everything actually. And I'm gonna tell you why. I changed the example a little bit so that it better illustrates the point that I'm going to make right now. But functionally, this doesn't change anything because nine modded by three would still be mapped to zero. 10 would be mapped to this one. 11 would be mapped to this one. And this is, of course, an oversimplified example. Your IP address isn't going to be such a small number. So now assume we've been taking requests and balancing them, and we've been able to take advantage of the caching because requests are mapped consistently to the same server. But a problem is going to arise when we remove one of these servers. Let's say I take server number two and just get rid of it. Maybe it crashed or maybe we couldn't afford three servers anymore, or maybe we don't need three servers. Maybe two is enough for us to handle the remaining traffic. So what's going to happen now? Well, ideally this user and all existing users going to this server will continue to be routed to this server and all existing users being routed to this server will continue to do so. But all of the other users, maybe one third of our users over here will have to be routed to one of these other servers. Maybe we split them 50, 50 between these two. That's the ideal 
scenario because then all of these users still get their requests cached because they access the exact same server. It's consistent, but these users, we can't really do anything about that because this server went down. We have to move them to a different server. So that's the ideal scenario. That's what consistent hashing would actually do. But watch what's going to happen now because we now have not three servers anymore, but we have two servers. So our hashing function is actually going to change. So now we have to mod by two. So we take nine modded by two and we get one. So actually user nine is not going to be here anymore. And user 10 is not going to go to server one anymore. They're going to go to server zero. So we basically swap these two guys. So user 10 will be here. User nine will go here. User 11, it doesn't really matter which one of these they go to as long as we do it roughly evenly for the remaining users. Maybe we had user 14 here, user 17, which in this case actually would not be distributed evenly. But continuing with this example, user 11 would be moved to server one. So what we wanted to happen did not. In this example, the exact opposite happened. So this would be very inefficient because now user nine is going to go to this server. All their data that was cached on this server is now useless. And user 10 had all their data cached on this server, but now they're going to the other server. This is distributing the traffic evenly, but this is not an intelligent way of doing things. If we could do things more intelligently, like I mentioned earlier, it would be much more efficient because then we could actually make use of the caching that we're doing. In many cases, if we didn't have a cache for each of these servers, consistent hashing would not matter. It's not always universally going to be the best solution, but in this example, it is beneficial. And it can be beneficial in a couple other examples as we'll discuss later on. Now that we already kind of know what we're trying to accomplish with consistent hashing, let's briefly talk about how we could actually do it. We're going to focus at the high level because this can get pretty mathematical and that's not really useful when it comes to system design. But the idea is that our servers are actually going to be placed on some type of circular space. I've shown this pretty oversimplified because each of these servers still has that 0, 1, 2 number. But in reality, this is a circle. It could actually be that this is 0 degrees. This is 120 degrees. This is 240 degrees. And you know that's how we take user requests and we map them somewhere onto this circle. But I'm going to be continuing to show this with an oversimplified view of 0, 1, 2. But we're going to be taking user requests. And instead of directly hashing and mapping those to a server, we're actually going to be mapping each request somewhere onto this circle using our hashing function. So we could take user nine and map them somewhere. Let's say they go directly to this server. We take user 10 and map them to this server and we take user 11 and map them to this server. But in reality, each of these, for example, 11 could be mapped somewhere that there is no server. It could have been mapped here or here or somewhere in this region. But the idea is that wherever this is mapped, we're going to go from that on the circle. We're going to keep going clockwise and this user will be assigned to the first server or node that is on the circle going in the clockwise direction. So anything over here would be assigned to this server, anything over here would be assigned to this, anything over here would be assigned to this server. But to keep it oversimplified, let's assume that 11 just goes here. So, so far, this is exactly as our basic hashing algorithm was. We're distributing these requests roughly evenly across these servers. Now, the difference is going to be when we take one of these and actually remove them. Now, you might be thinking, well, if now we have two servers, isn't our hashing function going to change? Aren't we going to take nine and instead mod it by two and mod this by two? No, I've oversimplified this. Our hashing function is actually not going to be so simple as just taking the IP address and modding it by the number of servers that we have. Let's say that's N. It's not going to be that simple, but let's take another pretty simple algorithm. Let's say we actually were modding by a integer 360. So we were able to map each request somewhere on this circle. And we decided to intelligently place each server at a location where these would be evenly spaced, evenly distributed apart so that each of them get a roughly even amount of requests routed to them. As you can imagine there's a lot of math that goes on with doing this which is why i've kept this pretty simple but the idea is that now our hashing function is actually not going to change nine is still going to be routed wherever it was let's say it's routed exactly to this server or it could have been routed somewhere over here and then moved over 
to this server, it's still the exact same. 10 is still going to be either somewhere here or exactly to this server. And all of these are still going to be routed over here. The only difference is with this region over here, all of these requests were originally being routed to this guy over here. But now, since this server doesn't even exist anymore, maybe it crashed, maybe we intentionally got rid of it. Now, all of the users that land over here are going to continue going clockwise until they find a server. At least our consistent hashing is going to do that on behalf of the user. And all of these users originally going to the server are now going to land at this other server. And this is really the best we can do. We want all the original users going to these two servers to remain the same, because if we have a cache on these servers, we want those users to be able to read from that cache. We don't want that cache to go to waste. So we definitely don't want to swap these guys, but all the users going to this server, well, that server crashed, maybe it's cache went away with it. So there's nothing we can really do about that anyway. Might as well take these users, move them to a new server. Ideally, we would want it to be distributed evenly. With this diagram, we can see that all of these are going to just this server. And at that point, this server will be the one handling about two thirds of the traffic, whereas this guy will just be handling one third. I'm not going to go super in depth, but as you can imagine, there are solutions for this. There are optimizations we can make to minimize this amount and to evenly distribute the traffic. And while we mostly focused on what happens when we remove a server, as you can imagine, the same thing would happen as we add servers as well. We want to keep users consistently going to the same server. So what would happen if we added a new server over here? Well, all of these requests would still be routed here. All of these requests would still be routed here. All of these would still be routed here, but all of these now would go to the new server. There's not really anything we can do about that either. We could choose to route these requests still to this server. Maybe the server does have a cache that these users can use. But if we're adding a server, we probably did that for a reason. Maybe we're trying to handle a larger amount of scale. So maybe instead of just adding this server, we added a few more here and here. And we do those intelligently so that this gets a roughly even amount of traffic as the rest of them. Then there's not really anything we can do. At least we know that we're minimizing the amount of users that have to go to a new server. At least all of these are still going to the original server. It's just this small portion that's not but at a high level, that's really all there is to consistent hashing. It can get a lot more complicated as you get really in depth. But at a high level, this is really all we need to know as developers that consistent hashing is a tool in our toolkit that can help us in certain cases. We kind of talked about the popular example of doing load balancing, but only when it makes sense. If each of these servers don't need to consistently map user requests to these individual servers, consistent hashing doesn't matter. We can use a more simple approach like like round robin, because that's the downside of consistent hashing. It is complex and we may not actually need it in most cases. There are other cases where it can be helpful. One example we talked about is CDNs. You can imagine that routing requests to different CDN servers, we would in some cases want to keep that consistent. So consistent hashing is also used to route requests to CDNs. It's also used heavily in databases, which we haven't talked a lot about yet. But imagine that instead of these being servers, these are actually database nodes. So we've taken our entire database and split the data up into three nodes. And we keep a third of our user data on this node, a third on here and a third on there to be able to handle more traffic. So when we get a user request, we know that an individual user really needs to go to this node. This is where all their data is anyway. So routing them to this node would not be useful. Maybe all their profile information is not on this node, it's on the other node. So consistent hashing would be pretty useful in in that case as well. There's another hashing algorithm that's very, very comparable to consistent hashing. It is rendezvous hashing. It's conceptually pretty similar. It tries to accomplish the same thing. In some ways, it's a bit more simple. So if you want to learn a bit about that, it could be useful, but I think consistent hashing is enough for system design interviews when it would come up. The difference between these two wouldn't really be huge in my opinion. And to quickly summarize the main components of consistent hashing, we have our hash key, which in our case was the IP address, but it 
could be something different. It needs to be something that can identify a user and then consistently map them to a node. IP address is a pretty easy way of doing so. We have our hash function, which would definitely not be as simple as modding the IP address. It's probably going to be some industry grade hashing function, something like SHA, which stands for secure hashing algorithm. It's going to be some variation of this or some other industry grade algorithm that we don't really have to go in depth. And lastly, we have our nodes. In this case, they were servers and we were doing load balancing. They could be CDN servers. They could be database partitions or shards, but we use the general term nodes. We have a certain number of them. That number of them is changing. They could be increasing or decreasing. And that's when we need consistent hashing if we need to consistently map requests to the same node. And that really is all there is to it. Okay, now let's finally get into one of the primary ways that we store data for our applications, which is using databases. And this lesson is called SQL, which stands for Standard Query Language. But in this lesson, we're actually going to be focusing on relational database management systems, RDBMS for short. And SQL just happens to be a major component for most relational database management systems. And generally, people think of databases, they divide them in terms of SQL versus NoSQL, which is why I'm keeping it as SQL for now. But we're going to be talking about much more than just SQL. And by the way, SQL is a query language, as the name implies. It is a way we can access data that's stored in a relational database management system. Now, there's a lot to cover with databases, so I will quickly go over the basics, but I mainly want to focus on the trade-offs of relational databases when it comes to system design. So first of all, relational database management systems are stored on disk. We've already kind of talked about that. They're stored on disk because we want the data to be persisted. Like if the computer crashes, data that's on disk should be persisted, but data in RAM is not the case. That doesn't happen when our computer crashes. In RAM, stuff can be lost. And since we're going to be storing a very, very large amount of data on disk, we want to organize it in a way where we can read and write from it very efficiently, where we can find exactly what we need and do so in a very organized way. The data structure that's typically used for relational database management systems is a B plus tree. We won't go super in depth into it, but it's sort of like a binary tree where each node is actually not a two way, right? Like that's binary where every node has two children. With B plus trees, every node actually can have M children. It's an arbitrary number. In this case, let's say M is equal to three. So this is an M way tree, a three way tree, I guess. And each node is a little bit different in the sense that every node actually actually doesn't just have a single key value. We actually split each node into M minus one key values. So since our M is three, we'd have two values for every node here. The reason we have M minus one is because B plus trees do follow that sorted property of, let's say we have a two value over here and a five value over here. What would we expect to go to the right of that? Well, all values that are greater than five. So let's say we have a six and seven here. What about two and five? What's gonna go in between those? to well three and four and then over here let's say it's zero and one so the values are in some kind of sorted order and the reason we do m way trees rather than just binary trees is because this will really help us reduce the size of our tree we want to minimize the number of read and writes that we have to do assume that each and if this entire thing is stored in disk which it's not because these trees can get very very large and and to get the data that we actually want we may have to traverse the entire height, which could get really, really large. And increasing the number of children for every node is a way to reduce the height of the tree. And to take this one step further, data is actually only stored in the leaf nodes of the tree. These keys up here, these non-leaf nodes, just help us get to the data. But all the data is stored at the bottom level and it's stored in sort of like a linked list fashion where if we did some kind of search, we're looking for some key, maybe this is the key that we're looking for, well, now we found it. But at the same time, all of these are now in sorted order as well. So if we didn't just want this one value, maybe we wanted a range, we can do that like 
this because these are connected, they're sequential, and this gives us that flexibility. So at the actual data structure level, this is how relational databases are typically stored. Now, the way we actually key the data itself, because if we're organizing some data, let's say we're organizing it based on a phone book, because that's kind of the simplest example, we have a phone book and that phone book stores information for people. Let's say it maps a name to a phone number. Well, how would we want to search for people in that phone book? Would we want to use their phone number or their name? Well, probably their name. So when we do this, when we store the tree and we key it based on some value, this value is called the index. And we can't just key by a bunch of values. That wouldn't really make a lot of sense. So we have to kind of choose our index intelligently. And in this case, it's pretty obvious that the name is what we want to search for because here we basically go in alphabetical order. We're looking for somebody with the name starting with the letter B. Maybe we'd go down here and then we'd find that person here. That's the idea. It's about indexes are about having some sorted property. And you can tell this B plus tree definitely has the capability to provide that sorting for us for at least a single index, right? We can choose a single index like the name and get that sorting. The main motivation is about being able to find and read data as quickly as possible. So now let's skip past the data structure level and actually get into what we can accomplish with relational database management systems. The basic idea behind relational databases is that there are a bunch of tables. We could have separate tables. In SQL, the actual SQL language, you could create a table with this statement, create table, name it people, and this is the schema of that table. That's very important with relational databases because with a table, we specify what the data needs to actually look like when we start adding data to it. So when we create this table, we say there's going to be exactly Exactly two fields and the first one is going to be called the phone number and it's going to store a value of an integer so in this case you could assume that these little dashes here don't even exist we could have also stored these as strings if we wanted to I'm just kind of showing the capability here but we also have a second field called name which is going to be a string that's what varchar means and the fact that it's variable length means that it can be up to 100 characters but not necessarily 100 characters it could be less than that too and in a table like these, the actual records themselves, the instances of a person here would be a row which satisfies the schema. So here we have an integer for the phone number and the name is a string where the name is Alice and we have another record for Bob and we could have a bunch more and we could have other tables as well. Like this is following our phone book example, but maybe we have another table for homes like home addresses. And let's say that the home table looks something like this where every Every home has a phone number associated with it and it has an address associated with it. This is a pretty simple example, but the point here is that people and homes, these are related and we could have a relationship between these two tables where we say every single phone number that's stored and associated with some house has to belong to a person. So this is a constraint that we can specify with SQL. This is an example of of a foreign key constraint where we take a key value from one table and then apply some rule to it with a key value from another table. And SQL provides a lot of powerful stuff like these. There's a lot of other constraints we can have as well. On a single table, we can say that phone number can never be null. Every single person has to have a phone number. And every record of every table has to have a way to uniquely identify every row in that table. This is where the primary key comes in. Primary keys do just that. They uniquely identify every record in a table, every row in a table. So how do we create a primary key? Well, typically we specify one or more columns to uniquely identify a row in a table. So in this case, multiple people can't have the same phone number. So that would be what we could use in this case. Multiple people can have the exact same name, but probably not the same phone number. So maybe we can use the phone number to uniquely identify every row. And I want to emphasize that these constraints that we're talking about, these really make up the backbone of relational databases. This is something that's not usually possible with NoSQL databases, as we will discuss later on.
one. With these relations, we can also perform joins, which means that for homes in this case, every phone number here is going to be corresponding to some person. Let's say for every home, we want to know who's the person that that phone number corresponds to. What we would do is join these two tables for every record in the homes table. We would say, find the matching phone number in the people table and then get the name of the person that lives there. So this is a SQL example of where we're reading from these two tables, people and homes, and we're joining them based on the phone number field, even though, you know, this is phone number, I'm kind of, you know, oversimplifying this. And then the fields that we're actually getting after these have been joined is just the person's name and the home address of that person. So this example has sort of become nonsensical at this point, but I just wanted to briefly go over the major concepts behind relational databases. Now let's get into the actual system design aspect. What are the trade-offs of relational database management systems? And what better way to understand that than go over the ACID properties? The vast majority of relational database management systems are ACID compliant. So ACID is an acronym. It stands for these four terms. I'm going to go over them out of order because I think it'll just make more sense that way. The first one I want to talk about is the last one in the list, durability. That's pretty much what we already covered. And that's why database management systems use disks. When we talked about Redis, we said that it uses memory. So Redis, even though we talked about it in terms of being a cache, in some cases, it's actually also a database, but it's it's definitely not a ACID compliant database because we already see it does not follow durability because it stores everything in memory. Now there's some trade-offs with that. It's definitely faster, but it's not durable. And relational databases are all about being ACID compliant and giving us these things, even if we have to sacrifice maybe a little bit of speed to get there. And we're not quite done with durability. I want to introduce this concept of a database transaction. A transaction is more than just a query, it could be a collection of queries. And queries are not just reading data. We saw an example where we're selecting a bunch of data, but we could have also been inserting data into the database and then maybe reading something else. In a single transaction, we might do multiple things. We can also issue some updates to the tables. And every transaction starts with a begin. It has a beginning. This is usually the keyword that's used. And then we do a bunch of SQL statements, some inserting, some some deleting, some updating, who knows. And then once all those operations are done, we commit the transaction. And at that point, the transaction has been completed and every transaction that's been committed, we expect it to be durable. We expect it to be persisted, even if the database crashed after that. So if we did not commit the transaction, maybe if we did an insertion here, but we didn't commit it just yet, then we don't expect that to actually be persisted. We'll touch more on transactions, you know, right now, pretty much as we move on to atomicity. So atomicity can be kind of confusing for a beginner, but think of it this way. The word atom itself is a physics term. And originally we thought atoms could not be split, right? You take an atom and you can't split it in half or into a additional pieces. That's the idea behind atomicity when it comes to database transactions, even though we know atoms actually can be split. But when it comes to database transactions, we have that beginning and we have that commit. And atomicity just says that every single database transaction is all or nothing. You cannot split a database transaction. If we have multiple SQL statements running in this transaction, like let's say we have a part one to this and we have a part two and these do some something. If we do part one of this, but then our computer crashes and we never finish the second portion of the transaction, then this entire transaction is going to fail. This first part is also going to fail. We're not going to actually commit this part. If the entire transaction did not complete, then none of it completed. And if the entire transaction did complete, only then is it committed. Only then is it persisted. It's all or nothing. We don't commit half of a transaction, no matter what. What? Let's take a quick example to better illustrate this. Let's say we had a transaction and we have a table which represents the amount of money in somebody's bank account. Alice has $1,000, let's say, and Bob has 500. And part one of this transaction is removing $500 from Alice's bank account. In SQL, we do that with an update statement. So then here we are left with $500 in Alice's account. And let's say that 500 we removed from Alice in part two of the transaction 
million, we are adding that 500 to Bob's account. So now Bob has a thousand. Okay, so then the transaction is completed. We commit it, everything is fine. But what if we did not successfully complete the second part and our database crashed in between? That's okay, maybe we restart the database and now everything is fine. But what is our database going to look like if the second part of the transaction crashed and we did not have atomicity? Maybe this was actually committed to the database. Then our database would look like this. $500 disappeared from Alice's account, but never got to Bob's account. So that money was destroyed. It doesn't exist anymore. So you can see how atomicity can be really important in certain applications, but sometimes it's not necessary. Next, while we're still on the point of transactions, I want to cover isolation because it's very much related to transactions. Isolation has to do when you have multiple transactions happening concurrently on a database, you want the transactions to appear as if they happened in order. This transaction happened and then this transaction happened or in the opposite order. But you don't want multiple transactions to have side effects on each other because things can get kind of strange. There's a lot of problems that are introduced when you do not have isolation, like dirty reads, which we're going to talk about in just a minute. And there's a couple other like phantom reads or non-repeatable reads. And you know, there's other problems as well, but let's focus on dirty reads and take a look at a quick example with our two transactions here that we have. Let's assume this transaction is the same where part one of it is to remove $500 from Alice's account. It's left with 500. And then this other transaction is actually adding, let's say 200 to her account. Then we would actually be left with 700 in her account at this point in time, assuming this transaction started after the first one, but the first first one was not complete yet and part one of this executed and then this one commits. Okay, well, this one is still not finished yet. What if our database crashed in this case? We would be left with 700. And while this transaction did not commit, but this one did commit, we would be left with 700. That's not what we want. So what went wrong? What was the problem? Well, this second transaction read a value that was not committed yet. That's called a dirty read. And it can lead us to an inconsistent state like this. This is related to atomic. So isolation means that these transactions are actually serialized. They will be executed in a particular order. This one will execute and then this one will execute. So when this one actually reads the value from here, it will read the original value, which is a thousand and add 200 to that. So this one would actually have ended up being 1200. And then this transaction would have came in and remove 500 from there and leave it with 700, let's say. So even though it kind of appears that the transactions are happening concurrently and they might be because concurrently does not mean in parallel, they will appear as if they were executed serially in a particular order, one executed and completed before another one. Now, finally, moving on to consistency, it's actually pretty simple. It means data consistency. There's a different consistency that's used in a different acronym, but consistency in terms of ACID just means data consistency. This is following the constraints that that we as developers specify on the database. Like I said, some columns will have some constraints like being not null. We always want the money in somebody's account to be not null. Maybe that's not true. Maybe null means zero in this case. So we wouldn't apply this constraint to this column, but we would apply it to the name column. We definitely want everybody to have a name if they're gonna be stored in our bank account database. So that's one constraint. There's also the other constraints that we talked about briefly, foreign key constraints and all kinds of stuff. Where certain columns have to be unique and a lot more. You can see how if we didn't have atomicity and we didn't have isolation, it would be hard to follow the constraints that we specify. If a transaction could happen halfway through and then not complete, and then when we restart our database, we could be in an inconsistent state. Same thing if transactions happen without isolation, like one completes halfway and then another completes and then another completes halfway. There can be inconsistency, but the point with consistency is that it's actually expensive to maintain. If we want to have a foreign key constraint, every time we update our database, let's say this name is actually a foreign key for another database or another table rather, we're going to have to read through this table and then read through the other table to make sure that we are being consistent, that we haven't introduced some value here that doesn't exist in another table. So that's the main idea with consistency. We can create rules.
rules and our database management system will make sure we follow those rules that we never reach an inconsistent state. Now, these are really the main principles to understand with relational databases. And each of these definitely comes with its own trade-offs as we'll continue to discuss throughout the course. So now it is NoSQL time. NoSQL stands for not only SQL. It's really, really open-ended. As the name implies, we do not have standard query language for NoSQL databases. But really a better name for these type of databases is non-relational, because that's really it. These databases do not have relations the same way that relational SQL databases do. And so we can't really use standard query language to join tables and to query them and do kind of those complex operations. But non-relational databases come in all types of shapes and sizes. There's a lot of variations. SQL databases were originally used for a long time, for literally decades, but recently in the 2010s, no SQL databases have become popular to kind of get past some of the limitations of SQL databases. But that doesn't mean no SQL is, you know, superior. There are trade-offs between these types of databases is relational versus non-relational. And by far the biggest limitation that no SQL databases can get over is scale. That's usually the biggest problem that no SQL databases are trying to solve. They are trying to scale up more than regular SQL databases can. We'll talk a bit more about that later on, but for now, let's talk about a few variations of NoSQL databases. The first and most simple one is a key value store. And I guess you could argue that this isn't necessarily a database because most of these are in memory stores. They don't use disk like Redis. We've kind of already talked about that throughout the course. There's also memcached and etcd. These are some popular key value stores and they do work pretty much just like a hash map. They take some key value, like, you know, somebody's ID and then map it to some object, which is going to be flat in nature. Like, you know, they can have some fields, but that's pretty much it. We don't have relations between these, you know, key value things. There's no foreign key constraints. There's nothing like that. I mean, these IDs themselves, these key values do have to be unique. You can think of that as like the primary key, but other than that, it's pretty basic. The benefit is that if you need just a very simple scenario, and you need to read and write a lot of data very quickly, Redis and Memcache, because they use RAM, they do not use disk, they are very, very quick. So you can see that that's kind of the trade-off we make when we use key value stores versus using a regular SQL database. Usually key value stores are used together with like a primary database. The key value store would typically just be used for the cache, sort of what we already talked about a few lessons ago. Next, we have document stores or document DBs. These are are sort of a step up from key value stores. It's basically that we have a collection of documents. So with SQL, we had a bunch of tables and rows. With document databases, it's more that we have a bunch of collections, which are basically a container for documents. And this would be an instance of a document. A document, really, the simplest way to think about it is it's just a JSON object, typically. Like, it's a bunch of key value pairs that could be nested. So a document itself is going to have some type of primary key that is identifying it. And then from that primary key, we get an object, but this object is not flat in nature. You can see it's nested. Like we have a couple fields out here. Like it's just like a JSON object. We have a field out here, which is its own object. And then that object itself, which has a list of values. And that list contains some more objects. And then finally, we get to the individual key value pairs. You know, ID is one, name is John Doe, and a bunch more stuff, right? The benefit of this is that it's a lot more flexible than a regular SQL database where we actually have to define a schema for every row in a table. With collections and documents, there is no such thing. We do not have a schema for the document. We can literally just keep going. We can, you know, mix and match types. We can do anything. We can keep adding fields that don't exist right now. We can remove fields. There's really no constraints generally. And this flexibility is why you would use a document store. Well, at least that's one of the reasons. The other reason for using pretty much any NoSQL database is scale. And that's definitely the case with 
document databases as well. The most popular open source document based database is definitely MongoDB. You've almost certainly heard of it, even if you haven't used it. There's also wide column databases. We won't discuss them super in depth because they can get pretty complicated. But at a high level, these types of databases can handle massive, massive scale, but they are typically oriented for a lot of rights. Like if you have a lot of rights that you're storing in a database, like you have some time series data or something like that, that's what a wide column database would be for. It does have that kind of flexibility that document-based databases have where we don't necessarily have to have a schema, but sometimes we actually can have a schema with wide column databases. But while they are good for a lot of rights, it's better to use these databases when you don't need to read a lot and you don't need to update the database a lot like when you write something you're not expecting to have to update it again which would be the case with time series data and you know some other types of scenarios as well but among the databases we've talked about so far these are definitely the most optimized for a massive amount of writing that we are going to be doing probably the most popular wide column database is cassandra it's open source there's also google big table which had some inspiration for cassandra but moving on to graph based databases these are all about relations actually when we talked about relational databases we talked about foreign key constraints we talked about having multiple tables and joining these tables together maybe we have a people table and we have a table for a bunch of cities with you know information about those cities and we want to join you know people and cities together to get a person's home their home address with their city information and all that so we have like a middle table which connects people to cities and then with SQL we would you know, do some join to join these tables together. But the point here is that we have relations between people and homes, homes and cities, and you know, people and cities. And as we get really, really large, like for example, if we're talking about like a social media site like Twitter or, you know, Facebook or pretty much anything where it's all about the relations. Like, you know, we have people, we have a bunch of users. Some people follow other users, right? Like this would be a follow. And maybe this person follows that same person back, or maybe they don't. Maybe this person only follows other people, but not this person. And maybe this person over here is followed by thousands and thousands of people, but they don't follow anybody, right? Like we have this relationship with social media sites and this type of stuff can get very, very complicated. If you wanted to store all of this in SQL tables and every time you wanted, you know, for this person, who are all the people that they follow? And among all of the people they follow, what are like the secondary connections between these people, right? Like the way that Facebook will tell you friends of your friends, like do you have any mutual friends with somebody? Like, like these types of relations are hard to represent with SQL and it can get really expensive if you want to have to do like joins on multiple tables and you have to do that for like thousands and millions of records in a table. It's better to represent this type of problem, a social media site where we have follows and followers and things like that with a graph because graphs are really the natural structure. I'm talking about these types of directed graphs and that's what graph DBs do at least at a high level. So, you know, this node would represent a person and the edge from the graph would represent some type of relationship between these two people. In our case, you know, this is follows, but we could have a lot more stuff and it could get a lot more complicated. That's kind of what graph DBs do. They actually build on top of SQL in some ways, like they definitely keep the relational part. So I guess this isn't entirely a non-relational database, but we're just focusing on the high level. So you kind of get the idea of when you would use this rather than use like a key value you store. So now I want to get back to the motivation for NoSQL databases. And as I kind of said at the beginning, the biggest thing is all about the scalability. NoSQL databases can generally scale a lot better than SQL databases. And it's all about the restrictions we put on SQL databases, on relational databases, especially the ACID properties, right? Like we have tables and we have a lot of stuff to do. We have to make sure transactions are atomic, that transactions are isolated that they behave as if they were performed serially and that data is going to stay consistent. When we say consistent, we mean that all the constraints, the foreign key constraints, the non-null constraints, the unique column value constraints, all those are going to be enforced. The problem with this is if we have a single database and it's really, really big and it's you know handling a lot of requests, like thousands 
of requests per second. And we want to scale this database up. The easiest way to scale a SQL database is actually vertically, just getting more resources for that single database. If we try to scale horizontally, which we know horizontally is more unlimited, like horizontally is better if it's possible because it's much more powerful, but it's really hard to scale horizontally with relational databases because of the things that we talked about with ACID, you know, properties with isolation. If we take this database and split it into, let's say two databases to keep things simple, that doesn't mean we actually replicated the database. I'm talking about putting half the data in one portion and half the data here. So we would have two nodes, you know, two different computers running half of the database each, right? So then maybe half the requests go to this database, half the requests go here. But how do we know how to route a request to the correct database? Like what if, you know, one request needs data from this database, but it was routed to this one? Well, that's definitely a problem and we won't go super in depth into it just yet, but there's actually a lot more problems with SQL databases, we need to sometimes do joins. What if our request was routed to this node and we're reading some data and then we try to join some of this data with some of this data and we try to enforce the foreign key constraints, the non-null constraints, the unique constraints, and you know all that stuff, especially the foreign key constraint, because we'd have to probably reference both of these databases. And to keep things consistent is going to be really, really hard because of all the stuff that we get because of all the good stuff we get with SQL databases, this problem of horizontally scaling becomes really, really hard. And no SQL databases actually do not follow these principles generally. I mean, many times they will have atomic transactions, but they do not guarantee the consistency. Well, they don't even have like those constraints, the foreign key constraints and all that. And they don't necessarily perform transactions in isolation. Generally though, they are durable. Of course, not the memory databases like Redis and all that, but document databases and most databases are durable, but we don't get everything. And that's the point. No SQL databases like document databases sacrifice ACID so that they can scale. So because when we split data, we can put half the data here and half the data here. We don't have any foreign key constraints to worry about. And we're probably not going to be doing joins between, you know, half of our data here and half the data here. We're not going to be doing that. So this allows us to actually split data into multiple nodes and horizontally scale the data. This is the major, major benefit of NoSQL. Now, NoSQL databases also have kind of their own acronym. I don't think it's great. I don't think it's as good as ACID. It's definitely not as popular or as important in my opinion, but there is, you know, a bit of knowledge that we can gain from base and you can learn more about this if you'd like, but I'm just going to boil this down to eventual consistency because that's really what the entire acronym is about. I think it's a pretty poor acronym and you know that because it's not even a full acronym. They kind of cheat and make this into two characters, even though eventual consistency is for the E, we don't have like an extra C over over here, but whatever, let's kind of skip past that. But now let's talk about eventual consistency. We know that NoSQL databases can scale better because we can take data from one node of the database and split it into two nodes. But with NoSQL databases, we can also replicate nodes. Like we can have a node here, this is our database, and then we can create a replica of that node, which is basically a copy. So we have two copies of the same data. So how do we handle reads and writes? Well, if we write data to this database, then don't we have to write that same data to the second database or these two replicas may become inconsistent. When we say this word consistent now, we actually mean something different, slightly different than the ACID acronym. When we talked about consistency, then we were talking about the consistency of the data that the data would follow the constraints that we specified, like the foreign key constraints and all that. But when we talk about consistency here with replicas, we're talking about is the data going to 
be, you know, in sync? Like if we write some data here, is it going to be consistent with the replica over here? Or are they going to be inconsistent? Maybe the, uh, the value that we just wrote to this replica is not on this one. So when a user reads from this replica, they get the up to date value. But if a user reads from this replica, they do not get the up to date value. That's kind of a problem. And generally one of the nodes of our database is considered the leader and the other one is considered the follower. So in this case, what we would actually do is every time we write, we're only going to write to the leader database. We would never write to the follower database because the leader is going to be responsible for all of the followers being written the same data. So eventually this leader will make sure that this data also gets written to this follower, but also any other followers that we may also have. In this case, we just have one, but we could have multiple followers, but we're only gonna have this one leader over here. And NoSQL databases and this acronym base is all about eventual consistency. We sacrifice the fact that some people for a small portion of time will see out of date data. It's just like a cache sort of, like a stale cache, but this replica will have stale data and for a short amount of time, users are might be reading this value and they may see a non-up-to-date value. Like if you were looking at a tweet on Twitter and you saw a follower account for somebody that's smaller than what it really is, it wouldn't really be a big deal in most cases. That's why NoSQL databases are powerful. Yes, in some cases we may get a stale value for a short amount of time, but eventually this replica will have the most up-to-date value and then we are good to go. There's no guarantee on how long that time may take. It could take a long time, but usually it's not. It's pretty reasonable on the order of milliseconds or seconds. Now, technically we could have database replicas with SQL databases as well. It's just that this kind of scaling, this replication and, you know, partitioning of data, like taking a database and breaking it into smaller pieces, or in this case, taking a database and creating a copy of it to handle additional scale because because that's kind of why we're doing this, right? Even though we can only write data to a single, you know, node of our data, only a single replica, when we read, we are we are able to read from multiple replicas, even if we're getting some possibly stale data, we are able to handle a higher amount of read capacity, even if we have the same amount of write capacity, because generally reads are what people are gonna be doing. When you open up Twitter, you're probably gonna be scrolling through your timeline, you're probably not gonna be writing 100 tweets. But these are the trade-offs that we make with NoSQL. We can sacrifice data consistency for eventual consistency and be able to handle more reads. And we can also partition data. You can actually partition data with SQL databases. We'll sort of talk about it. It's sharding. It's just that no SQL databases typically provide this by default. And if you do this with SQL databases, you actually split up a database into smaller pieces. It's very, very complicated to manage that with a SQL database. Because of all the constraints that we have, it can get really, really complicated, which is why it's a lot less common with SQL databases and why you know document databases and key value stores and all that were introduced. Okay, so now let's talk about replication and sharding when it comes to databases. And these are actually two pretty different things, but they're also related, which is why I want to cover them together. So let's start with replication. Let's say we have our database and we just have a single database node, whether it's SQL or NoSQL, it doesn't really matter too much. All of our application data is on this database. Every read write has to go through this single database. And maybe that's perfectly fine while we have a small amount of traffic, but as we get more and more traffic, maybe we have too many connections on our database at the same time, or maybe we're just processing so much data from our database. Every query has to read through so much data and do so much stuff that we can't handle as many requests as we're getting. Well, that's where replication comes in. We take our database and actually replicate it, create a copy of it, and then we are able to handle more requests, but it's not this simple. Replication has a lot of nuance with it. There's a lot of trade-offs that you actually have to make. There's a lot of decisions that we can make. Let's take a look at an example of leader follower replication. This is also known as master-slave replication, where the leader is the master and the follower is the slave. 
In a lot of textbooks and other material, you may see it referred to as master-slave, but that's starting to become more of an outdated term and you may see it referred to as leader-follower, so that's what I'm going to be sticking with. So the idea is pretty simple. We have a database and we replicate it and create a follower database. So the leader is the one that's responsible for, you know, replicating its own data to one or more followers. Now the followers could actually also replicate data as well if they wanted to to some other followers, or maybe the leader will be the one responsible for replicating to all the followers, but that doesn't really make a lot of sense. It's okay if you know the followers pick up some of the work if they're able to do that. The more important thing is, what is the leader going to be doing from the client's perspective? And the client could be you know, an actual user, but in reality, users don't directly talk to the database. They actually go through our own like application. They'll be making a request to our application, and then our application will talk directly to the database. But in general, from some client perspective, we can read from the leader and we're also able to write data to the leader node. Now with leader follower replication, we actually are only allowed to read from the follower database. We're not allowed to write to it because the way our replication is working, our leader is going to replicate its data to the follower whether we have one or more of them. But if we allow clients to write data to the follower, then the follower in this case is not replicating its data to other nodes. So if we were allowing people to write to the follower, obviously things would not work. We would have some data here that doesn't end up getting replicated to the leader. And then if somebody tries to read from the leader, they will not see the up-to-date data from the follower. So this is one way of doing things. Now, obviously, with this, we are able to scale reads, which is usually more important. Like think about most applications you use. Are you writing data or are you just loading pages and reading other people's data? Usually reading is more common. So this is a relatively simple way to scale up our reads. And the way we actually do it with replication, there are many different strategies for replicating data. The main trade-offs though is when it comes to asynchronous versus synchronous data replication. As the name implies, asynchronous is when we don't have to do it immediately. Like a client writes some data through the application and then they write you know, some piece of data over here onto the leader. So if the leader is doing this asynchronously, the leader is going to at some point take this data and replicate it to the follower and all the other followers will also get the data at some point. That's asynchronous. We don't know exactly how long it could take. It could be on some schedule, like every hour the leader will do that. Usually it will be more frequent. But it could be based on some schedule or it could just be, you know, a few seconds later, the leader will take that transaction that the client wrote to the leader and then, you know, make that same transaction on the follower. And this works. The follower will have up to date data. But the downside is with asynchronous replication, other clients who are reading from the follower may see inconsistent data. We will have inconsistencies between the leader and the followers, at least for a short amount of time. So if we're okay with that, this works. Like maybe for a few seconds, some clients who are reading from the replicas will see stale data. That's a trade-off that we make. Now with synchronous replication, every time a user has a write transaction on the leader, the leader will actually stop and immediately take that write transaction and immediately replicate it to the followers. Now at first, this seems really good because we won't have inconsistent data. As soon as that data is written to the leader, it will also be written to the follower. Like there's no inconsistencies with the data between leader and followers. Anytime a client reads, they will not see any stale data, but this actually does have a negative. There is a downside to doing synchronous replication. And as you can guess, it is with latency. If we are replicating data immediately, it does still take time. It does take time as soon as the user writes data to the leader then the leader will write data to the follower and only after that's done is the transaction considered complete from the client's perspective we will not tell them the transaction is complete until we replicate the data as well and if the replicas are in different parts of the world you can imagine that this will definitely increase the latency significantly and I think these are really the important points to consider when we are talking about replication. 
Now with this type of replication, not only is the benefit that we're able to handle larger like read scale here, we're able to handle more reads at a time, but we've also sort of increased our reliability and availability because if one of these databases goes down, like for example, if the leader goes down, at least we have a mostly up-to-date replica that has most of the data. So if the leader goes down, at least we have a replica that could take the leader's place. So that's another benefit of replication in this case. Now there's also leader leader replication where we have multiple leaders. This is also called uh, master master replication or multi master replication. Of course, the benefit here is that we can actually read and write from every single node. So not only do we scale up the reads, but we also scale up the writes. This is really, really powerful, but as you can imagine, it comes with its own trade-offs. Instead of just having a single leader where we then replicate to the other followers and then maybe the followers can replicate to the other followers, here we have multiple leaders. We only have two in this example, but we could have even more. And I'm sure you can imagine replicating data between multiple leaders can get very, very complicated. Of course, these replicas are gonna go out of sync, right? Like some data is gonna be written here, some data is going to be written here and then these have to like kind of swap that data and these are definitely going to get out of sync and these are not going to be very consistent like that's going to be the downside here with multiple leaders we're definitely going to have lower consistency between the um, leaders between the nodes even though we are able to scale up the rights so if we do asynchronous replication here our data is going to be loosely consistent, but it's definitely not going to be consistent. And if we do this synchronously, then we're definitely going to see much higher latency depending on how many leaders we have and how they're like geographically distributed around the world. Probably the main reason you'd want to use multi-leader replication is if you had like, let's say this is our world map. We have like one half of the world over there and one half of the world over here. If we had, you know, a leader serving every continent of the world let's say we have a database over here and we have a database over here everybody from this half of the world has their own leader and everybody from this half of the world has another leader for them and that's pretty much it so if these two database nodes become out of sync it's okay because everybody from this side of the world is going to mainly be interacting with one of them everybody from this side of the world is mainly going to be interacting with the other one now sometimes people from this side of the world might fly to the other side that's okay because we are going to keep these in sync but maybe every hour or so we then you know like sync these together and then give them all the up-to-date data but we don't have to do it immediately so this is a really good you know use case this is kind of the main use case of multi-master multi-leader replication being able to serve different parts of the world roughly independently Okay, now let's talk about sharding. And the thing about sharding is that talking about it is actually not super complicated. We can talk about it in a pretty simple way, but implementing it is very, very hard in practice. And you probably won't be going into the details of sharding in an interview setting. It can get really, really complicated. So we'll mainly be focusing on the basic ideas and the basic trade-offs that you'll be talking about in real interviews. Now, what is sharding and what problem does it solve? Well, Similar to replication, if we have a database and it's getting so much traffic, so many reads or maybe so many writes that a single computer can't handle all of it. I mean, we can vertically scale our machine, but we can only go so far with vertically scaling. So then we try to horizontally scale this database. One approach would be with replication. We can handle a larger amount of reads with replication. We can even have a strategy for writing and being able to write more data with replicated nodes. But sometimes that's still not enough. What if we have such a massive amount of data, not terabytes, but petabytes of data, massive, massive amounts of data, and certain queries, right, like searching that amount of data in a single machine is way too difficult. Queries are taking multiple seconds, right? Imagine you load Twitter and it takes you five or 10 seconds to see your Twitter feed. That's such a massive amount of data that a single query is going to take seconds and seconds to retrieve the data that we want. So this is where sharding comes in. We actually not only put this data on multiple machines, on multiple nodes, 
phones and computers, but we actually take the data itself and then split it into smaller databases. I mean, literally we take a table, right? Like we know every table has some schema. Every table has a bunch of rows and we take half of those rows and put them in one of the databases. And then that database will be on its own machine. That's very important because if we put both of these on the same machine, that's not really solving any problems. So we put them on different machines. So we have more resources. And then, you know, the second half of data in a table goes to the other database. And of course, we have more than two, uh, you know, smaller databases, but these are called shards. We've taken our individual database and broken it into smaller pieces, aka we sharded the database. These are database shards. And then if users want to read and write data, they will go to the individual components, the individual shards. And not only are we able to handle more traffic because now maybe half the traffic will go to this node, half the traffic will go to this node, we'll be able to handle that. But the queries themselves will go faster because this one has half the data. So presumably a query on this shard will be a little bit faster than on the original database. Same with this component. And we could have further broken these down into smaller shards. Now, how do we decide how to actually distribute the data? Like here, you can see half the data goes here and then the other half goes here. How do we decide what half of the data goes where? Well, there's a couple approaches. The simple one is range based. So we would take some range of values here and some range of values here and decide. Now, what value do we actually use? Well, that's called the shard key. So this is actually a special value that's used to decide how to split the data up. And one type of shard key is a range based shard key. So for an individual table, we would typically choose the primary key for using how to actually split the data up. So assume that, you know, this table has some primary key and using that primary key, we say that some range of values like the most simple one I can think of right now is male versus female. If we're doing this based on sex, for example, like males go to this shard and females go to that shard. And this is a really basic one because this is actually discrete. It's like two values. Another one we could do is based on last name, like the first character of your last name. So from everybody from A through L or something like that is gonna go to the first shard. If your last name starts with any of these characters, you're gonna go here. And then for the second half, maybe it's M, through Z. So if your last name starts with a character in this range, you will go to the other shard. So this way data is consistent, sort of at least like we're just looking at it from one table's perspective, but everybody, you know, from this table will go to another shard and then everybody from this portion of the table will go to another shard. But as you can imagine, running joins on, you know, two halves of a table is going to be pretty complicated. In fact, it's going to either be really slow or it might just not work. And this is, you know, and now we are starting to see the complexity of sharding with just a single table. Maybe it's fine. But if we shard a second table and maybe data from that table is related to the first table. So how do we keep things consistent? How do we make sure that, you know, the corresponding data from the first table is also matched to the same shard? This is where things can get complicated. You have to implement a lot of custom logic depending on how you do things. Instead of range based sharding, we can also use hash based sharding. And this is actually a use case for consistent hashing. Consistent hashing is another algorithm that's used to shard data, to decide how to distribute data into multiple shards. So while things can get really, really complicated, these are the basics that you'll really need to know for system design interviews. And it's also worth mentioning that with sharding, SQL databases, op popular open source SQL databases like MySQL and Postgres, they do not have sharding by default. If you want to shard your relational SQL database like MySQL or Postgres, you will have to implement the logic for that yourself at the application level. You, from your own application, will have to decide how to you know, shard the data, how to know where to find the data, which shard has the data that you're looking for and all that.
And it makes sense because SQL databases naturally are not meant to be distributed in this way. When we do this, we're losing the consistency that we get from ACID, where we know that foreign key constraints and all the other constraints that we specify in our database schema and all that is going to be enforced. We lose that with distributed data and with shards. But typically, most NoSQL databases will actually have sharding by default, like it will be implemented as a part of the database management system. And that's because NoSQL databases are naturally meant to be sharded. That was the whole point of NoSQL databases, that we can horizontally scale them better. I mean, yes, our data will have to be split up into shards. That's okay, because we're not going to be joining the data very much. We're not going to be having foreign key constraints. Our data is non-relational. The data doesn't even have to be consistent from the nodes. It will be eventually consistent. I hope this is starting to make the difference between between SQL and NoSQL a little bit more clear. Now let's talk about CAP theorem. It's a very, very popular theorem that relates to databases or distributed databases. And frankly, for how popular it is, it's a very, very poor theorem. It's really widely misunderstood and it's not as helpful as many people think it is. For more details on why that is, I would check out Martin Kleppman's blog post about CAP theorem. It's not super long, but I definitely think it kind of raises a lot of really good points that I mostly agree with. But I'm mainly going to be echoing a lot of the points that Martin Kleppman makes. So first of all, it applies to some distributed data. Like let's say we have a database, you know, over over here, if we just have a single database, it doesn't really apply. It mainly applies when we start replicating data. So for example, if this is the leader and this is the follower, then we can sort of apply a cap theorem. But mostly people apply it to NoSQL databases because they have replication by default. But a lot of times people will try to apply cap theorem to just a regular SQL database with a single node, no followers, no replication, and it's not really sensical in that case. So that's what I want to mention. I bet if you've learned about cap theorem before, it wasn't mentioned to you that it only really applies with replicated data, though it's kind of implied. So we have an acronym and it's pretty simple. C is for consistency, A is for availability, and P is for partition tolerance. And what people think is that from this acronym, we can choose two out of three. So we could choose CA or CP or AP, but the problem is that that's not the actual theorem. But the problem is that P is actually implied. It's always going to be a part of our choice. So the real theorem is that P is guaranteed and we are allowed to choose either C or A. Like that's the most we can do. But I guess before I get into too many misconceptions, I should tell you what the theorem actually is, which is in a distributed system, if we have some replicated data, think this is our leader database and this is our follower database. First of all, partition tolerance, which is poorly named. I think that's where a lot of the confusion of cap theorem comes from. People don't know what exactly partition tolerance is. It's actually very, very simple. We have our distributed system here. We have two databases. One is a follower. One is a replica of the leader database. And of course, we could have a lot more followers. We could have a lot more replicas, but this is a simple view for now. And this is our network. We have two nodes in our network. Of course, the leader is going to be backing up data. It's going to be copying data that's written to it, to the follower, to the replica. But the problem is if we get a partition, a partition in this case is a network partition. That means that our system here of two nodes gets gets cut it gets partitioned and then we have these two you know databases one is a replica of the leader now these two databases can't talk to each other so we get some type of network problem but maybe users can still interact with this database and some users can still interact with the other database so this is a partition in this case partition tolerance means that our system will continue to function if our system becomes disconnected in some way if one half of our system can't communicate with another half or maybe we had 10 databases and one of them was disconnected from the other it could be any type of network partition so we could decide that because 
our two databases can't talk to each other anymore. We're just going to, you know, not let this entire system function. We could decide that, but you know, the vast majority of the time we do not. That's why P is guaranteed. Just because, you know, our two databases are disconnected doesn't mean we want to prevent users from being able to interact with them. So assuming that we are partition tolerant, just because our system gets a network partition that we will continue functioning. So that's implied. This is almost always assumed. Then we can only choose between one of these. We can only choose one of consistency or availability. Why is that the case? Well, let's first understand what consistency and availability actually means in this context, because another poor thing about the cap theorem is that these terms are not what you expect them to be. That's where a lot of the confusion comes from with cap theorem, though I think it still can be a decent tool to reason about the trade-offs when it comes to choosing which database should be used to solve a particular problem. But in this case, consistency actually means data consistency between the replicated data. So we know that this leader is going to have data written to it and it's going to copy all that data with the follower. Now it might be asynchronous. It might take some time for the leader to replicate that data, but it will do so. But consistency in this case means that every single read will get the most up-to-date written data. So if somebody actually writes data, like while our system is partitioned, if somebody writes data to, you know, the leader database, and then somebody reads from the leader database, then they will get the most up-to-date data. But while our network is partitioned, none of the data from the leader will be written to the replica. So if somebody reads from the replica, they will not get the most up-to-date data. So this is an example where we do not have consistency. Every read does not get the most up-to-date right. This is a different consistency from ACID. It's slightly different with ACID. Consistency meant that, you know, a single node has consistent data, right? Consistency with ACID does not apply to replicas. It, we don't need replicas to talk about ACID consistency. Okay, but what about availability? Well, it's pretty Pretty similar when we have a network partition we know that one of the replicas or many of the replicas may have out of date data right that's what we learned with consistency so now the problem is the choice that we have we can say well since this replica is not going to be able to get the most up-to-date data from the leader how about we just disallow users from using just the replica, they can continue to read and write from the leader because we know that reading and writing from the leader is going to have consistent data, right? It's going to have the most up-to-date data. People can write to it. People can read the most up-to-date data, but we only achieved this consistency by giving up availability because availability in this case does not mean highly available. It doesn't mean that 99% available or 99.9%. .9%. It doesn't mean, you know, what percentage of requests are going to get a valid response. That's not what availability actually means in this context. It means for our system to have availability deemed by cap theorem would mean that every single node in our system, every single database node, including this one that does not have the most up-to-date data, every single node will respond to valid requests. So if this database does not crash, we know that this database did not crash. We intentionally said that this is not going to be responding to requests anymore because it has stale data, but it did not crash. And we say that every database that does not crash, whenever it receives a request, it responds. So every node in our system is available to respond to user requests. That's what it means. We're not talking about 99% or anything like that. We're talking about every node that did not crash is going to be available for users. So looking at it this way, it becomes pretty obvious when we have a partition, why we can only choose one of these. We can only choose to make all of the nodes available for users, even if some of them have inconsistent data, or we can decide to intentionally, you know, st stop these from serving users to ensure that all the nodes in our database that are serving users have consistent data that have the most up to date data. So there it is. That is cap theorem. So when it comes to designing databases or choosing which database to use for your application. The important thing about cap theorem is that we can only choose between one of these. We might not be able to choose either of these. Actually, it's not guaranteed that we get two out of three, but the thing is that we have to make a strong consideration 
between consistency and availability. What matters more? In many cases, it's okay if we have inconsistent data, if we have some stale data, like with Twitter follower accounts or something like that, as long as we are able to handle more traffic, because that's what availability is still about at the core, right? We want every node to be available because we want to be able to serve a larger amount of users. And that's really what you gain from Cap Theorem, because technically, when you get really, really technical, very few databases are actually CA, CA meaning they have these two out of three, or AP, meaning they get these two. Very few databases actually, you know, rigorously fit these definitions, which is why it's better to keep things simple and just focus on the consistency versus availability trade off that you have to make and kind of understand why that is because at the core, it is pretty simple. A lot of times people will visualize cap theorem using a Venn diagram, even though, you know, that region where you have all three doesn't really apply. That doesn't really exist. You can't really have all three of these. It's kind of just a logic problem if nodes can't communicate with each other we can't of course you know guarantee these two it's just a contradiction and lastly let's finish up by understanding maybe a slightly better theorem this is actually an extension of the cap theorem p-a-c-e-l-c p-a-c -E that is basically you know cap theorem still it means you know given a partition if there is a partition because you know not always is there actually going to be a network partition but it's always possible because networks are unreliable a network may always go down you know one data center might go down somebody's router might go down anything could happen so when there is a partition let's say yes when there actually is a partition or versus no when there's not a partition so when there is a partition we can only choose between a and c we can choose between availability or consistency, right? We can choose to favor one of these, but if there's actually not a network partition at any given point in time, at some point in time, there's not a network partition right now. So actually, if there's not a network partition, why can't we choose both consistency and availability? Well, we actually did talk about that for a brief moment. When we have a database and we are replicating that database, it takes time to do that, right? So if this is our replica and somebody is trying to read data from this replica, but it's taking us some time to back up the database or to replicate the database, we have to, for that user, favor two things. Either we favor latency or we favor consistency. Either we let the user read data immediately, but they might be getting stale data, right? That's a trade-off that we make. So we favor latency. We, you know, get low latency for the user, right? That's what L means here, low latency, or we give them consistent data. We give them the most up-to-date data, even if they have to wait a few seconds for us to replicate this data. So that's why I think this theorem is actually a little bit better because it gets at what a lot of people think of when they think of cap theorem. A lot of people are probably thinking of latency, even though cap theorem does not have anything to do with latency, the you know, follow-up theorem does. But at the core, these theorems are not about us writing our own computer science paper. It's about us understanding what trade-offs we can actually make, what trade-offs we have to make when designing a system, when designing a distributed data storage system. Okay, so now let's talk about object storage, which has become a pretty important storage mechanism in the last 10 or 15 years. It's much newer than the file system that we are pretty familiar with, but this is much more comparable to a file system than it is to an actual database, where with databases, how we structure and filter and search for data is much more important with databases. But with object storage, data is actually stored in a flat, way. There's no hierarchy with file systems. We know we have folders and then inside of those folders, there can be more folders or there can be actual files and things like that. But with object storage, there actually isn't anything like a folder. Now, popular examples of object storage would be AWS S3 or Google Cloud Storage. Azure has their own object storage. Object storage is pretty common. And with some of these services, they kind of give the illusion of a file system with 
S3, you can have folders and then have files inside of them. But in that case, the folder is actually just a part of the name of the file. It's a way to kind of give you that illusion. But there actually aren't hierarchies with object storage. All of the objects in S3 are stored in a flat way. And when we talk about objects, the predecessor to object storage was blob storage. And when we talk about objects, we mean blobs. Blob stands for binary large object. Objects gives us the OB. So we have blobs. These are large objects. Typically, we're talking about media, things like images, videos, maybe a database backup, which is not, you know, media, but it's a large object. We store files, typically not like just a regular text file, which we expect to update because when we put files and objects in object storage, we can write those files. We can add those files and then we can read that file, but we can't edit that file. We can't update a file. And that's one of the trade-offs with object storage. We cannot update things that we add. Object storage is optimized to store a large amount of objects in a storage in a flat way so that there is no hierarchy so that we can immediately find objects that we have stored sort of like a hash map where every object has a unique key. So that gives us a very quick way of accessing that file. That's kind of a parallel from object storage to hash maps. And another parallel is that we cannot have duplicates in hash maps. And that's actually a similarity with blob storage and object storage as well, because with S3, you need globally unique names. It's not enough to have a unique name in your S3 instances, but actually if you have a name conflict with anybody else who's using S3, that doesn't work either. You have to have globally unique names and that's kind of where this comes from. Now, enough about these details. Let's talk about actual use cases. From a design perspective, we don't really need to know much other than if we're storing large files that we need for our application, things like images and videos and other types of media or anything for long-term storage in general, we could, of course, use our database. We could store images and videos inside of a database, but it doesn't really make a lot of sense. Are we ever going to be querying based on image or a video? Well, we might want to use some metadata related to an image, like the name of the image or information like that, some tag related to the image or a video name, a video title, some attribute about a video. We might use that. And that type of metadata, of course, we can store it in a database, but videos and images, these are large files. We could get into gigabytes when we're talking about videos. What sense does it make to store that in a database? It's going to slow down our queries, increase our storage, and we're going to be reading and writing from our database a lot. And having these in the format of a database doesn't make a lot of sense either. Since if a user wanted to see an image or a video, we'd have to read that from the database, from our application, and then from our application, send that back to the user. It's better in this case to use object storage. So assuming we had these files in a flat way in some object store like S3, for example, the interface for reading and writing files from an object storage is actually with HTTP. So we don't have to query anything. We don't have to write any SQL. We don't have to filter things. We don't even have to read the entire database or object store. We can actually just make a network request to S3, our object store ask for whatever file name that we have. It's going to be globally unique and we will configure our object store so that we are the only ones who can actually access this file. We won't go super in depth into the security issues, but assume that there is some kind of security capability there. So via HTTP, we get back a video or an image and then we can send that to the user. So this is a much better way. Object storage makes sense. We can easily find these large files. That's exactly what it's optimized to store these large files. We have a better interface for using them, HTTP. So that's just a much better way of doing things. And typically with system design interviews, anytime you have large files, you'll mostly be using object storage for them. If you're not already familiar or haven't used something like S3 before, you can kind of just imagine something pretty similar to Google Drive or Dropbox. It's just a bunch of files and images similar to a file system, but we don't have folders, or at least we have the illusion of folders, but we do not have to search for a file in a file tree. Just knowing the file name, we can kind of use that similar to the way we use hash map keys. So object storage is optimized to store a large amount of large files. And from a system design perspective, these are pretty easy to reason about. 
So now let's get into another really powerful tool, message queues, which are actually pretty simple, at least conceptually. The main idea is that if we have a large amount of application events and those application events are going fast, so much so that maybe our application can't handle them all at once. And we want to process these events asynchronously. Now, of course, we could scale up our servers, but if we really don't need to do these all at the same time, all at once, it's better to queue these events and handle them at some later time. And that's exactly what message queues can provide for us. So what will happen is those events will be sent to another component called our message queue. And then from that message queue, those events will then go to our application server. And then finally, our server will actually process those events. Let's take payments, for example, payments maybe take a long time to process on our server. Maybe we have to do some analytics data on them. And then after we've done that, after we've processed the payment, then we write something to our database. We write that transaction or something like that. So this is a pretty basic scenario of using a message queue. The main thing to notice is that we've decoupled the events and this could actually be its own application. Like this could be its own server creating some events, some user events like gaming data or something like that. And then those events go to some queue, which is durable actually. All the stuff that's stored, those messages, those events, when they're stored in this queue, they are durable, they are persisted. If the queue crashes, that data will still remain there. It's not lost. It's not being stored in RAM. It's usually being stored on disk. So we have decoupled these two services, the one that will produce the events and the one that will actually receive and process those events. These are decoupled and this queue architecture will allow us to process the events asynchronously and allow us to handle a larger amount of scale because those events don't need to be processed instantly. We can queue them until we're able to process them. And with this type of example, we'd probably process them first in first out, but there are other methods we could use. Now at a high level, this is really all there is to message queuing when it comes to system design interviews. We can decouple our services, process events asynchronously, and handle a larger amount of scale. But there's a few more features and topics I'm going to be talking about, especially when it comes to PubSub, which is a popular variation of message queuing. So first of all, there's actually other helpful features that message queues provide. I already talked about how they are durable. So in some ways they are actually similar to databases, but also the way data is transported between the queue and the destination can vary. It can either be polling where the server is actually polling from the queue. It's periodically checking. Does the queue have anything new, any new messages? If it does, I'm going to take some of them. If not, I'm just going to try again, maybe in a few minutes. We can also push messages directly from the queue to the server whenever we get them on demand. And on top of that, in some cases, the application server, if we're pushing data, may not be able to process the data immediately, or maybe it may have missed the message or something may have gone wrong. So there's actually a way for the server to tell the queue, it can acknowledge that it received a particular message. It can act that message. And after that's done, the queue will know that this particular message that I was trying to send has been received and processed by the server. So I I don't need to send that message anymore. If the queue sent that message and it did not receive an acknowledgement from the server, if it didn't receive that, then the queue would try again. It would keep trying to send the message a certain number of times or until the server acknowledged that it received the message and processed it. So this is a sort of way where we do not lose messages. We don't send messages to the server that it can't process. And then those messages just get dropped we never see them again. We do not want that to happen. So there's a lot of features like this that are built into queues to make them durable, to make them reliable, and to add this functionality to them. And so far, we've mainly talked about one-to-one. -one. There's going to be one application going to a queue, and then that application is going to feed into another one. But it actually doesn't necessarily need to be like this. There could be multiple applications feeding into the queue, and there could be multiple applications receiving from the queue. And this brings us 
to PubSub where we get these sort of many to many relationships. So first of all, PubSub stands for publisher subscriber. And so in this case, the app event producers would be the publishers and the event receivers will be the subscribers. So with this model of message queues, we have publishers that produce events, but these events will go to some middle layer. And this is where we get into this message queue. This is part of our message queue. We will get topics and these topics will be the ones that receive and store those messages persistently. And these topics will feed into subscriptions. And there could be multiple subscriptions that a single topic is feeding into. And the purpose behind this is that multiple applications can receive from the same topic. So a single topic may receive, let's say, all payment data, right? This topic will receive all payments information. And maybe another topic down here will be the one that receives all analytics information. And maybe this analytics topic will feed into a single subscription. Now, maybe we have just a single app server that we need to receive all of the analytics events. And then from those analytics events, we write it to some logs database or something like that. But for this payments information, we actually need two services to receive from them. One service is going to process that payment. And then another service is going to do something with it, maybe back it up to a database or back it up to some data warehouse. But what I'm getting at is the entire point of having topics and subscriptions is that from topics, topics will basically receive data and they're a way for us to segregate data. Maybe we want half our data to go to this topic and then the other half of data is completely unrelated. So we want it to go to another topic. It's sort of like having multiple message queues and we break them down into what topic of data does this topic need as the name implies. And and subscriptions are essentially a way for us to fan out these topics. Maybe it's not just a single application that needs this topic of message, but maybe we need multiple applications. So we fan it out to multiple subscriptions. And then that's where our application logic comes in. It will receive messages from this subscription and a single application could receive from multiple subscriptions if we wanted to. The whole idea is that we have all this logic in the message queue so that we decouple our application. Our application is pretty simple. We can mix and match. We get rid of this server. We don't have to change our entire architecture. That's the benefit. We can drop in a completely different API over here that will receive these messages. So that's the big picture here. Message queues can actually come in all shapes and sizes. Some really popular open source ones include RabbitMQ. And nowadays, what's even more popular is Afka, super popular and super powerful powerful. And this was actually developed relatively recently. A popular cloud-based one for Google Cloud is called PubSub, actually just PubSub. And there are definitely some differences between these, but overall they provide this kind of basic message queuing functionality with some caveats between them. There are trade-offs between them, but in terms of system design interviews, message queues are pretty powerful and pretty simple for the use case that we use them when it comes to just designing these systems.